Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure Plus. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto was the anomaly in the fifth Holy Grail War? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. There are many possibilities, parallel worlds in which an event plays out differently with a subtle touch while others drastically change as if dropping a penny started a civil war. Sure there could be a world out there that has that specific event happening right now, and we won't know about it. Parallels don't ever touch. The grail destroys that principle, bringing in heroes of old with varying differences in story or history like King Arthur actually being a girl in the world we'll be looking at soon. A shinobi with the principles of a knight and hero enters the fray as the last servant to enter the grail war. He's from the future, so practically nobody knows of his legend. Which suits his situation fine. It'd be a shame to hide his wonderful Kayaseki with some lame concealing magic to keep his identity secret. In another place, a red-haired boy named Shuru ran for his life. That blue-clad spearman is still chasing after him. Why? Why is he still chasing this average-looking teen all the way to his home? Better yet, why is he still alive? Last thing he remembered, he got stabbed through the heart. The redhead saw the glint of red on the corner of his left eye. On reflex, he dodged, leading the spear to puncture a hole in the wall in front of him. Shuru decided that being in his house, hallways are not safe places to be in with a spearman hellbent in killing him. Actually, no place is safe for him. The blue spearman grabbed the collar of his uniform and chucked him outside of his home. Shuru landed with a thud, and he quickly stood up to run away from the assailant. You just won't die, won't you, Roach? The spearman yelled, no matter. I killed you before, and I'll kill you again. That was Shuru's signal to run even faster now. To have that feeling of death on his back really motivated him to run like never before. Ah the wonders of adrenaline. The future Acher halted his retreat when the spearman cut him off, and slammed the shaft of his spear on the teen's side, and sent the boy sprawling on the shed's floorboards. The teen groaned in pain, and unconsciously activated his magic circuits. He needed to fight back now, he searched for anything he can use as a weapon. Sure he might die, but he already did, technically. Unknowingly, the spearman entered the shed and prepared to stab Shuru once more. Ready to die again? The spearman asked. He waited for only a second before rearing the spear back and trusts it towards Shuru. The teen activated his circuits and suddenly, a blinding, orange light emerged behind him. He dismissed it as nothing but the afterlife ready to claim his soul. What he didn't expect was the sound of metal clashing against metal. Clink's SSSSSSHH. The screeching sound of metal grinding on metal certainly alerted both assassin and victim. A second later, the spearman couldn't react in time, and rocketed out of the shed's doorframe. The man rolled away before crouching and skidding on the ground to stop. He readied his spear for a fight. It irritated him, but he, his victim, is now a master, and being a master means that he has a servant, a powerful one. In the shed, Shuru looked at what he could only describe as an orange knight. He had white armor pauldrons, gauntlets, and greaves, but his main color, the one Shuru could really point out, is that he wears a lot of orange. But who is this mysterious orange knight, savior? He hoped to get an answer when the hooded knight turned around. There, Shuru saw a triangular visor covered the man's eyes, and the hood hid his spiky, blonde hair. The whisker marks on his face was the only defining point after those features. With a smooth and eloquent voice that doesn't match his rough exterior, he asked, I got your call. Are you my master? Shuru nodded dumbly at the knight. He didn't know what to think about the tall and orange-clad warrior who saved him from an early death. Why yes? Shuru answered cautiously. Then the pact is solidified, and yada yada yada, the blonde knight smiled, and said, You look like you were about to die, eh? You want him gone, master? Gone? Shuru repeated. He had an idea, but he wanted to hear what he meant. You know. Eliminate, make him not exist, dead. The knight explained himself, and Shuru looked with wide eyes at the blonde knight as he did not hesitate to ask if he wanted the spearman dead. Shuru whimpered slightly, and the knight simply took it as a yes, okay then. Lancer San. Here I come. He jumped out of the shed with blade in hand. So he really is a knight. Shuru thought in silent awe. 
The spearman, Lancer, looked at the boy's savior. He was shocked to say the least. With that sword in hand, he suspected that the new servant was a saber. But that's not possible, he already fought saber quite the looker by the way and she had very well have killed him already had the onlooker be there at the wrong time. Yo, Lancer San. You think I can try doing what you do? Lancer raised an eyebrow at that, but decided to ignore the rather eccentric knight. The blonde servant sheathed his sword and created a very familiar spear into his hands. The red spear glinted under the moonlight's rays. Lancer did not react a tiny bit, however, on the inside, his mind scrambled around how the new servant has his guy bulb. At a nearby rooftop, Rin Toshaka, teenage girl with brown hair and pigtails and a very discernible red sweater, and her servant, Saber, a woman in a white dress and silver gleaming metal armor, looked in surprise at what the new servant did. He created the lance Lancer held onto. Saber deduced that the servant is not a saber. There cannot be two sabers. He didn't look like a berserker, archer, nor rider. Caster maybe because he created that lance out of magic, but definitely not the previous ones mentioned. So is he caster. But he can be an assassin, yet it defies his knight-like appearance. They needed to find out soon, and the white-clad saber would find the information they needed for her master's future knowledge. She hoisted her blade hidden by wind and jumped from the rooftop to join the fray. The orange spearman noticed Saber and shifted his body so he faced both opponents. He smirked, a standoff, eh, I can deal with that. Bring it on, Saber San, Lancer San. His left hand released the shaft to grab the sword from its sheath at the right hip. Both known servants narrowed their eyes at the act of dual wielding spear and sword. They were thinking of possible identities, yet could not figure out who this orange clad knight is supposed to be. Giving up, Saber asked, who are you? What is your servant class? The orange knight lowered his weapons, but not his guard. Smart move on his part. He stabbed his sword in the ground in unceremonious manner, and said, Now that'd be telling, Saber San. His childish and mocking voice irked Lancer, but not the woman questioning him. He continued, Tell you what. If you can force me to use the characteristic that makes me my servant class, then you know my class. He picked up his sword, so. Shall we dance, King of Knights, and Kulan's savage dog? His foxy grin, plastered on his face, told the other warriors that he was confident that he got his opponent's titles right. Saber and Lancer shivered at their identities revealed so immediately. This was no ordinary servant as all servants in the Grail War should be if he could discern the identities without so much as a need to look at his opponent's noble phantasms. They repeated the question in their head, Who is this servant? Now then, shall we go? Lancer? Saber? smirked the blonde in orange as both servants stood there for a second before going at the same time. The orange servant did not falter from his position, and let his opponents come to him. He smirked at the charging duo, and remembered the times he sparred with these two people. Ah! Dot the days where he'd get beaten up so badly, those were the days. Now, he can stand and fight these two equally in terms of skill between both sword and spear. He readied himself as Lancer thrusts his spear towards the servant, and Saber swinging her invisible sword overhead. And then what Shuru and Rin could see were flashes and sounds of steel clashing as somehow the Orange Knight managed to block the attacks from two servants at the same time. Sword met sword as did spear meeting its copy. W what is he? Rin thought as she saw her Saber going for another slash, only for the Orange Servant to use his sword to block and throw her back as Lancer tried to do a sneak attack with his speed but the orange hero managed to parry Guy Bold with his copy of Guy Bold and deflect the strike in a matter of seconds. But unlike Rin, Shuru was watching the battle between heroes with awe and surprise, never expecting to see such confrontation happen in front of him. So, this is what a battle between warriors of the past is, the redhead thought as he saw his servant use his replicated lance as a pole to jump over a horizontal slash from the girl in white armor and then quickly use his sword to block a thrust attack from the blue man's lance before spinning around behind him and kick him to the ground damn lancer mentally shouted as he stood up from the ground and saw the orange servant avoid all the slashes that saber keep attacking him with and with that goddamn smirk on his face Meanwhile the orange hero was avoiding Saber's slashes and blocking those he couldn't while he saw some differences on the one before him from the one that taught him. This Saber has a white dress unlike the blue that Saber Ney wore. He analyzed calmly. 
Also this one is more feminine. Dot and is that Caliburn? Now the shocked blonde noticed that like the blue saber who had S caliber in a wind coat, this one had Caliburn in one as well. Problem is, Naruto recognizes the magic and automatically disabled it for him to see. He inspected the blade some more before Saber finally managed to cut off his visor with all her strength, sending him flying away a few feet from the impact before he recovered and grinned. How's that? Now want to use your abilities? Saber grinned, until she saw the orange servant smile. Not bad at all Saber-chan, it seems you caught me off guard. The knight laughed like it wasn't a problem at all, and he clapped at Saber's action like he would as if he was patting a baby on the head. Quiet. Stop talking and show me some more action. Saber yelled indignantly towards the orange knight. OWW. That hurts, Saber-chan. Do you want me to thrust my long shaft into your body? The blonde asked in a mix of sincerity and teasing, but the way he said it made it look more like sarcasm and pure mockery to the female knight. Such language, young girls like yourself shouldn't say that, how will you expect to find a husband with such dirty mouth? The respectable looking knight's mischievous disposition degraded what the others thought about the servant from initially looking at his dignified look. It really didn't help that the double meaning of those words made Saber, Rin and Shuru blush while Lancer laughed his own ass off for a moment. After that, the orange servant stabs the copy of Lancer's spear as well as his sword into the ground to snap his fingers. Thunder crackled as it snaked around the dark sky, and struck the ground slightly to the left of the orange knight. The lightning fizzled out to show a gargantuan. What the hell, man? A lion? Lancer cried out. Indeed, as Lancer said, it was a colossal lion wearing black and orange armor around its body. Upon looking at its back, one could see the large curved sheath all katanas have. Lancer cringe. This lion knows how to use a katana made for its size. A lion? Is he rider? Thought Saber while holding herself from petting the beast in front of her even so how he was able to replicate Lancer's weapon. Well then Kuritsugu, you know what to do, grinned the orange servant as the now named Kuritsugu the lion scanned its master's opponents before seeing Lancer, and remembering that the blue man had helped his master, the lion went to lick the servant as thanks for what he did. It would lick the woman later as well since she looked the same as that more conservative looking woman with the same face. Lancer himself, who had a secret phobia of lions after almost being eaten by a female lion cub, saw things differently, and soon the blue servant was running from the happy, trampling lion while screaming like a little girl. The orange knight looked at Lancer with critical eyes. He knew Lancer would be afraid of Kuritsugu. He counted on it, actually. He needed to have a bit of payback for lacing that ramen with the spiciest hot sauce, which made him spit flames like a dragon. Speaking of dragons, he wondered how Kiryuan was doing. No doubt that dragon of his is just blowing off steam in the throne of heroes because his master didn't summon him. But back to Lancer. He had some payback to unleash. He cracked his knuckles, and his relaxed grin turned maliciously evil. His blue eyes sparkled before he disappeared in a burst of speed. Saber was taken aback. No doubt this servant is Castor. Summoning copies of weapons, summoning a lion, and now disappearing in a burst of speed. This is most likely through the means of magic, and it seems he is quite adept at that. She stood and inspected the area. Where could he have gone? In a gust of wind, the orange knight appeared behind Lancer, with his hands intertwined with his middle and index fingers pointing up. Lancer, too scared of the lion to even look behind him, never saw the upcoming attack. The sneaky servant sneered, Fool! You think you can get away from me? The pointed fingers created a small blue sphere of some sort of energy and he thrusted it into Lancer's behind. One thousand years of death. Rasengan style. Lancer felt his behind grind in pain as the sphere dug into his butt and eventually spinning him out of the area as a sparkle in the starry night. Kuritsugu looked at his master with a blank stare. He realized it was one of those moments. Realizing it won't get any action, it settled in front of Shuru and sat there to protect him. Shuru felt bad for the spearman. That attack certainly looked painful enough to actually make him cover his butt to protect its virginity. Rin looked appalled, yet at the same time intrigued. What is this servant's class? Saber, however, lost all respect for the other knight. She realized that the attack was nothing more than a glorified ass poke with a literal spin on the end. She gripped Caliburn tightly because this was not the way a knight should act, and by all means, she will discipline him to the fullest extent. 
Meanwhile, in another area, a priest, Lancer's master, closed his eyes and pinched the bridge of his nose. He too wondered what that mysterious servant's class is. Archer is the only possible answer left, yet he refuses to use a bow. As insult to intelligence, he even constantly uses magic to pose himself as caster, and by God he's making it look successful. That strange sphere certainly was magic of sorts. He just wondered how a buffoon of a knight is able to cast such powerful magic. Ha! Huh. Take that, Lancer. I beat you with a glorified poke in the ass. Ha 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 ha. The knight laughed up a storm, not paying attention to his surroundings. Saber willed her body to not stab this servant in the back, she's the king Erm. Scratch that the princess of knights, she's not going to violate the code of chivalry. She yelled, Hey! The laughing knight turned around to see Saber's furious face, Are you caster? Answer me! Her voice demanded authority and respect from the mischievous knight. Said knight lost his smile, and replaced it with an imperceptible frown. It's all questions with this girl, he threw his sword into the air. It glowed as it twirled majestically before transforming into a futuristic motorcycle. It still had the standard two wheels, one in the front and back, but the front itself is significantly longer than the motorcycles of the present, and is littered with armor plates resembling his armor. It had mounted guns on each side, large exhaust pipes on each side, which spouted flames from it whenever revved, and a large coffin like structure on the back. As the final detail, the motorcycle was in orange as well. Saber did not react externally, but on the inside, she lacked a calm mind. He's caster, but rides a motorcycle that was a sword. Shuru looked confused now. His servant still getting used to that did some form of strange magic and now his sword turned into a motorcycle. He looked odd, yet at the same time bewildered by the fact that a knight holds a sword that can turn into a far more advanced motorcycle than ones the world has today. On the other hand, Rin started to doubt her servant now. This rather strange servant showcased various skills only other servant classes can accomplish, yet neither she nor anyone has figured out what this servant's class is. Just looking at that motorcycle gives her a bit of a strange tingle down her spine. That coffin didn't help the situation. The orange knight revved the motorcycle and charged at Saber. On the right handle, the knight's right thumb pressed a button, which caused the mounted guns to fire. Saber readied her sword. She slashed at the bullets rendering the ranged attack useless. As the vehicle approached Saber, the orange knight opened the coffin-like compartment at the back. A sword, simple and double-edged, launched itself forward and landed into his hand. Out of the coffin, two cannons emerged as well. In a burst of light, the motorcycle and its rider vanished. Saber became irritated. This knight did not follow the swordsman oath. He and his knightly likeliness refused to follow the unwritten law of swordplay. If he isn't a knight, then what is he? The brightly colored knight would be someone noticeable in history, yet she does not recognize him as one of her knights, nor has she ever heard of a magic inclined knight. It irritated her even more that this servant showcased the skills of an assassin now, and with a loud motorcycle, he hid his presence so professionally. Suddenly, she felt a slight breeze originate from her right. Narrowing her eyes at the flaw in the knight's approach, Saber exploited it as she anticipated where the next breeze would come from. Her smooth skin felt the slight tinge of air pass her by, and suddenly, she dashed in the general direction the breeze came from. She slashed at the general area, and immediately she felt the familiar resistance and clang of sword meeting sword. She expected a snarky remark from her opponent, she didn't hear one. All she received were a multitude of slashes she was near ill prepared for. Both swords, woe, men clashed, and despite the orange knight riding on a vehicle, he was forced to dismount his motorcycle due to Saber thrusting her sword right at the servant's breastplate. The mysterious servant rolled on the ground, and the motorcycle reverted to its original form. He disappeared into wind and appeared immediately in front of Saber. He lunged forward, but Saber blocked. He swung the sword diagonally from the right. Saber parried and started a counterattack of her own. She aimed her slash at his open midsection, yet she was far enough that she only slashed cloth. Saber lowered her sword and asked, How do you know the length of my blade? My gosh, Saber san. Enough with the questions. I've had it up to here with my identity. The servant emphasized, Here, with his hand well above his hooded head, look back to the abilities I've shown. Which of the classes did I not show? He didn't let her answer because he started to go on the offensive. He raised his sword for an overhead slash. 
blocked, crouching down, he positioned his blade at his side, and slashed for her legs. The white-clad king stabbed her sword just to her right to stop the attack, but the force of her opponent's slash dislodged the sword from its position. She noticed the orange knight handle the sword in a reverse grip, and then on, she felt her opponent's relentless assault as he twirled his sword with no room of error with each strike she blocked or tried to parry. All of a sudden, he lashed out, arm snapping like a whip, and slammed his sword for her head. Saber instinctively forced her blade to protect against the oncoming sword to block it. What she failed to realize was that the sword transformed into another form. When she blocked the sword, she saw her reflection for a moment. She realized she looked at a mirror. Her opponent's sword shattered into millions of pieces, yet the knight did not seem phased by the occurrence. Her vision was blinded by morning light burning her retinas even with her eyes closed. When the pain and the light disperse, she opened her eyes to see millions of the same orange knight surrounding her with bows and arrows drawn and aimed at her. Surely, you're furious because I do not follow the swordsman oath. The servant stated with confidence, but I assure you, I am not a regular knight, Arthuria, I am but a shadow of other heroes in your former glory. I am capable of being every single class in this grail war, yet I've only shown five of the seven. Saber, Lancer, Rider, Caster, and Assassin. As you can see, I do not have madness enhancement on my person right now, which leaves me to my actual servant class. Saber looked baffled. How is this servant that class? He didn't show any aptitude as archer. So why? You want to know my class, then here is your answer, Saber. Stop. Shuru ordered. He and Rin also saw the multiple archers positioned everywhere in the battlefield. Seeing as there's no possible way to evade all of those shots, Shuru ordered his servant to stop. Archer complied, dispelling the numerous copies of himself, and stepped down from the roof of his master's home. The lion, Kuritsugu, disappeared as soon as Shuru commanded Archer to stop. Any other order? You'd wish to impose on me, master? Archer asked to which he received a shake of the head. Nothing else. Thank you for complying to my order, Archer. The servant bowed in a theatrical manner, his right arm underneath his chest and aimed to his left while the left arm swung upwards and behind him. He answered, all is for my master. Saber definitely looked irritated by the gesture. Whatever this knight learned was certainly not what an actual knight acts like. None none of her knights ever display such theatrics for a bow. The worst would be kneeling with their head making contact on the ground in worship. She had half a mind to strike down this heretic if he continued to make fun of a knight's behavior. Rin herself could feel that growing anger from her servant. As a way to prevent more fighting a wise decision so far Rin ordered her servant to stop fighting as well. This was not a fight they could win without any information regarding this enigmatic heroic spirit in front of them. Hey, Emi Yakun. Tell me, what's your wish? Rin asked her enemy. Wish? I don't have one. The red haired teen answered sincerely. What? I don't have one. Shuru repeated to the girl, Why is that an important thing to ask? Well, actually, before that, Toshaka san began Shuru in a nervous tone as his new ally looked curiously. Can you tell me what's going on about all this? I mean, I don't know what's happening. Rin looked aghast upon hearing that. Are you not kidding me, Emma Yakun? I mean, you summoned your servant, so. Master doesn't seem to know about this war because he subconsciously summoned me in an attempt to survive Lancer's attacks. Interrupted Archer as Saber and Rin were still in shock. H. He summoned such a powerful servant, and didn't even knew about the war, was the thought of both girls before the Toshaka air side in defeat. Truly, both servant and master were giant enigmas in this war, and it'd be a good thing to have. Very well, I'll tell Emiya Kuhn all about the war. I keep hearing war, Emiya stated, is that what's happening here? Indeed, Emiya Kuhn. This event right now is called the Holy Grail War, a war where seven pairs fight to claim the omnipotent chalice able to grant any single wish. Shuru stayed silent, and figured out why Rin asked him the question about the wish, for these seven pairs to fight, they have to be masters, who summon their servants heroic spirits of the past to do battle against their enemy and claim the grand prize. Normally I wouldn't have made an alliance with any other magus for this war, less Emi Yakun since eventually we would have to face off. Rin thought before she remembered Archer's combat capabilities and successfully fended off two servants at the same time, but since his archer is not only very powerful, 
but also quite useful in terms of distraction by being the bigger threat. I guess I can make a temporary alliance. The Tosaka girl decided upon the decision to ally with the red haired Magus by announcing, Emma Yakun. I'd like to propose an alliance. What do you think? The amateurish Magus looked shocked beyond words at what the Tosaka Magus proposed to him. An alliance certainly would help in achieving the Grail faster. Though the problem is what would happen if the two of them are the only ones left. Archer, on the other hand, thought differently. He confidently asked, Era, what's this about an alliance? Can't handle my awesomeness, Tasaka san. Rin ignored the knight's casual tone with her and begrudgingly replied, Yes. Not to stroke your ego, but you and Emma Yakun are better off as allies rather than enemies right now. With your myriad of skills that span classes, you are an enigmatic force of nature at the moment. Archer grinned at the implication of him being the strongest servant in this war, and did a slight happy dance to go with it. Both girls looked at Archer with death emanating from their eyes. They hated this, but it certainly is better than the alternative. The four reached a church, and stopped at its entrance, Archer, Saber, you both must stay here since servants aren't allowed in the building, only masters can come in. Rin explained as both blondes reluctantly nodded before the Magus turned to the uneasy redhead. Now let's go, Emma Yakun. All right. Shuru gulped before they went inside, leaving both servants behind. Archer looked at Saber with a smile before summoning. A bowl of ramen? So want to eat the food of the gods, Saber Chan. Saber just sighed before accepting the bowl. This servant. Might be the death of me. The two servants weighing outside sat patiently as they devoured their bowls of steaming hot ramen noodles. A strange occurrence, one might say, but they are in an alliance. Make a bond of trust and work out the kinks with acts of friendship. That's what Archer seemed to attempt. However, it seemed all he could focus on were his growing stack of ramen bowls. Saber was a bit impressed. There was another man could eat as much as her. She too had a growing stack. So what do you think, Saber Chan? Archer asked with a smile. Saber looked away, embarrassed that she actually liked the food, and because she saw the other servant's persistent smile. Archer seemed to take offense to Saber's averted gaze. Hey, don't ignore me. Yet she continued to do so, if only to make him get the hint that he should not talk to her in a familiar manner. The woman emphasized a huff, and continued to eat the bowl of ramen given to her. This is delicious, Archer. I'll give you that. Saber admitted. Food in Europe during her time was never this. Exquisite, tantalizing, food able to satiate her hunger. Archer, the chef, smiled even more, almost threatening to split his face off. It unnerved Saber in an unknown way. Thanks. The man's eager answer amused Saber slightly. It felt relaxing to just talk like this. Still, there are questions that needed to be answered. Like how did he know her identity right off the bat? Caliburn hid inside invisible air the whole time and he knew the length of her blade. You're thinking again, Saber. Archer drawled with his blue eyes narrowed and aimed at her head as if to burn through her skull. Why do you insist on learning my origins? To beat me? To win this war? You can have the grail, I don't want it. Saber's thoughts came to a screeching halt. Archer doesn't want the grail either. How? If you must know, my dream, my wish, came true during my lifetime. The answer silenced Saber for several minutes as she tried to process Archer's words. What is the knight before her fighting for? Whatever it is, it makes him smile a lot. What do you wish for Saber? Archer asked the princess of knights. I told you mine lack of it. What about yours? Saber debated on whether to tell her ally or not. She could either wait later and answer, or she could tell him. Either way, somehow he'll know. She pondered some more, if only to see the pros and cons of her decisions and the blonde archer sat in silence, eating yet another bowl he conjured up. My wish, ah, uh, finally done. That took quite a while. Sorry if we kept you waiting, Saber, Archer. Rin's voice held detest in her voice when speaking the name Archer. The man in question didn't bother to react. What could she do to him? Vice versa with what he could do to her. Though the latter looked to be winning that particular side if the situation called for him to kill the Tasaka master. He frowned eager to know the woman's wish, but interrupted by their masters. The two master-servant pairs walked together to the general direction of their homes. They walked in relative silence, the nocturnal creatures provided noise. But as they walked, the noises eventually came to an eerie silence. Archer readied himself, 
The air emanated death, and it made the servant unconsciously survey the area. Reinforcing his eyes, his vision showed a gargantuan monstrosity of a human in a Greek armor skirt. His hair was more mane than hair as it flowed backwards like a ferocious lion's mane. The man's torso, buffed to the point other bodybuilders would be ashamed of their own bodies, towered over a little girl with snow white hair. The girl was no doubt the master. She wore winter clothes, a purple winter hat, coat, white skirt, and brown boots. A wonderful night, isn't it so, Oni chan? Shuru took a step back at the voice, he hadn't seen the newcomers yet. Who's there? Shuru yelled. Archer readied his blade as the unknown master servant pair walked underneath a lamppost. She curtsied to the masters. And a good evening to you, Tasaka san. I'm Ilya, or more formally, Ilya Vale von Einsberg. It's nice to meet you, Tasaka san, Oni chan. Shuru relaxed a bit. A little girl in this war? She doesn't look like she can handle that servant behind her. I would love to talk some more, but sadly, we can't do that. Kill them. Berserker. At that moment, the monster behind her jumped forward, his left eye glowing red as the only way to see him coming. In his right hand, a giant club like sword swung in a vertical arc, aimed at Shuru. Archer switched places with his master, took his sword from its sheath, and blocked the attack by positioning the sword parallel to the ground and over his head. The sheer force of the attack buckled the Orange Knight's knees and cracked a road beneath him. Saber took action and took a chance at hitting Berserker. She successfully hit the Greek warrior, who received a deep gash on his left cheek. It didn't flinch at the damage, merely shrugging off and moving his weapon to hit Saber. Released from the massive weight on top of him, Archer switched places with Saber in order to take the blow for her. The result sent the servant rolling away from Berserker. He quickly recovered from the roll and yelled to Saber, Saber, let's work on our teamwork now, EH. He ran in a sudden burst of speed, leaving a crater in his wake. Berserker's reaction time spiked as he noticed the servant over him with bow and arrow in hand. The orange knight shot the arrow at Berserker's face, where the arrow exploded into a combination of explosives and smoke, now, Saber. The white-clad swordswoman charged at the dazed Berserker and attacked his chest. The beastly servant staggered at the attack, much deeper than the gash Saber left on his cheek, and roared in pain. She attacked again, slashing horizontally at Berserker's pectorals before slashing upwards in a crescent motion while holding her blade in a reverse grip. Okay, switch, Archer commanded. Switch, Saber repeated. Pull back and let me have a go, Archer replied in a simpler way. Reluctantly, she relented in her offensive position, jumped back quite a good choice really in time to dodge an angry Berserker's earth-shattering strike. Archer swung his blade at Berserker's left clavicle the collarbone, and rendered the left arm momentarily useless. Berserker. Ilya cried out in worry, hurry and attack. Landing to Berserker's right, Archer spun counterclockwise, his coattails curling with him like an orange tornado, and slammed a single-edged broadsword with a black hilt and a red trigger, and increased the swinging power through the use of several small propulsion engines near the top of the blade. With enough force, Berserker was lifer off the ground through Archer's home run swing. Switch. Archer once again announced. Catching on quickly, Saber ran after the airborne berserker and jumped to deal damage when he's incapable of blocking. She successfully landed all her attacks, and finished her combo with slamming the blade down on berserker's neck with all her strength. Berserker created a crater due to the impact, sending rubble, dust, and the surrounding sidewalk all around the general area. Switch. Saber jumped back, in from of Rin and saw Archer change the broadsword into several golden knives, each firmly placed between fingers. He threw all of the knives, which disappeared the moment the weapons escaped Archer's fingertips. He summoned another set to release the next salvo, and another and another. A never-ending cycle of flashing, golden knives disappearing into thin air. The act of throwing the knives looked like a dance, with each throw meaning Archer took a step and a certain pose. When done with his dance, he returned to his master's side, and snapped his fingers. Berserkers and sides glowed golden as knives rapidly appear inside his body, making the fallen warrior twitch madly at the numerous knives stabbing his lungs and heart. Hmm. Dot for a second, I thought your servant was competent, short stuff. Guess he's just a big ol' softy. Archer taunted Berserker's master. Ilya, offended by the nickname, shouted, 
short stuff. I'm older than I look. So. A tall midget, Archer asked. Shuru stood back, feeling the anger flowing out of Ilya. He took more steps back as he felt Saber and Rin's anger rising. The two were wary of Archer before, but his skills to irritate women were more volatile than nuclear waste or his noble phantasm. Ilya snapped at the accusation, yelling, With this command seal, I order you berserker, regain your lucidity and fight with your strength and endurance tripled. Retain this order until Archer perishes. From the crater, berserker roared, grabbing the knives inside his chest, which ripped open to remove the knives. The skin regenerated quickly, and Berserker crushed the golden daggers into dust floating in the wind. It scattered for several moments, allowing all parties to stand in awe at Berserker still surviving, and allowing the dust to collect into Archer's sheath, where it formed the sword once more. Oh, you're salty, Popsicle. A bit too salty might I add, sea salt flavor. Kill him, Berserker. Ilya ordered in her female fury. The hulking servant roared and charged at Archer, who laughed at his teasing of the girl. He did not worry one bit. The moment Berserker teacher within a meter of Archer, a barrier activated. Swords of light with strange runes appeared in front of Berserker. Moreover, Berserker's weapon halted in midair, never hitting the barrier. Ah! Uh, Archer singsonged with his left index finger twiddling in disapproval at Berserker. Princess Shortcake, nice to meet you, but we are terribly late to go to bed and we have to wake up early to make our masters go to school. You should sleep early too to get taller and less grumpy, he summoned a small ball, and threw in on the ground, bye bye. The ball exploded into black smoke as soon as it struck hard ground. When the barrier disappeared, Berserker swung his club to see the two pairs long gone. Berserker sighed, your orders, master, Ilya, still angered by Archer's teasing, did not think clearly and ignored the fact Berserker could talk. She simply ordered, find him and kill him, after a good night's rest. Berserker answered as he lifted Ilya from the ground to place her on his shoulders, you need your rest, and it would certainly help you get taller. What? Nothing. Five minutes later, twenty blocks away from the last encounter, Archer cheered and raised his hand up high. His trademark smile only grew wider. Why did he smile? Not only did he deliberately piss of a little girl, he also made fun of Berserker, and made the hulking servant waste four lives from the stocked twelve he had. What's more, that servant regained his thoughts and is three times stronger in attack and defense. A definite challenge Archer liked to triumph over. Berserker and Ilya walked in on a cheering Archer and the other three friends. Seconds later, Berserker finally hit the blonde grazed, more like and sent him into a wall, leaving a human-shaped crater as he fell off the wall. Berserker swung his weapon in a downward stroke forcing Archer to cause a deadlock with his sword. The tripled strength of Berserker made the impact affect the ground negatively, collapsing the road even more, with dirt and rubble flying off like rockets. Archer struggled. They needed to get out of here fast, but what's a good way to humiliate them some more? He searched his brain for some alternatives he had a library of it in his head and chose the easiest one available. He removed his right hand from the handle to reach into his right pocket to obtain a critical tool. Pocket sand. Not really, it wasn't the same shade of sand, it was black in color gunpowder. The particles were launched at Berserker's face, where his vision became altered. Archer pulled out something a knight would also never use, he pulled out a white, long-barreled pistol with a red handle. After the gunpowder had hit, he shot at the cloud, making the powder explode once the bullet made contact. Berserker! Ilya shouted. Her servant lost another life. Four of them are gone now. Just what is this archer capable of doing? It annoyed the Einsberg to no end, and that last maneuver was only a distraction to allow the runaways to leave again. She gave up for the night. Berserker lost too many lives in one night. Behind his back, Rin glared daggers at the cheery servant. Why did this servant have to be so irritable? She thought, if he's the least bit chivalrous like an actual knight, he'd be more tolerable, but no. He can ride a motorcycle, a lion use teleporting knives that were initially a sword, disappear like an assassin, and uses guns. What knight from the legends used guns pistols even? The more she thought about the servant, the more it infuriated her that most likely, the idiot in front of her would win from sheer enigma and underestimation by other servants. Shuru slowly backed away from Rin, whose anger leaked out in the form of steam and a red face full of fury. Saber looked at her master in awe. 
Never before had she seen a person actually red in anger. To quell the female master, Shuru gulped and walked next to her to say, Tasaka san, calm down. Calm down? Rin asked in an incredulous whisper, I can't calm down. Your servant is an extremely large threat. He's capable of using another class's skill. He's well versed in multiple weapon styles, a combat pragmatist, and generally likes to piss women off. What heroic spirit in the form of a knight ever did that in legend? What is his name? As the seconds pass, her whispers were more audible, and as each second passed, Shuru slowly walked back from the infuriated girl. Lighten up, Tasaka san. You might as well enjoy your easy trip to the Grail. I'll be wiping the competition with everything I have. Maybe, if you're lucky, you might even be able to make a counter strategy against me. I don't know how, but I'd like to see that happen. Archer's confident and nonchalant statement silenced the rest of the group because of how plausible the statement could be. The four walked in silence once more, hearing the nocturnal creatures buzzing in the darkness. So, Master, anything you want to talk about? asked Archer as he and Shuru stood on the Emiya house after barely escaping from Ilya and Berserker with Rin and Saber in tow before they went to the Toshaka estate to rest. Right now, the red haired Emiya was exhausted from all the events that happened, however, his servant didn't look neither winded nor tired from his battles. The young master wondered how strong his servant was. Not much Archer. Dot but I'm curious. Just how strong are you? Shuru asked, but then before the blonde in orange could answer several stats appeared above him. Strength. C plus agility. B magic resistance. C independent action. A plus plus. Presence concealment. C riding. X madness enhancement. Territory creation. D endurance. A plus plus mana. A plus plus luck. B. Noble phantasm. X personal skills. Unyielding will. A plus plus. Expert of many specializations. A eternal arms mastership. B plus. Obnoxious. B plus eye of the mind. False. B protection from arrows. B. Shuru looked at the stats and wondered what it meant. In his curiosity, he raised his right hand to ask the significance of the letter ranks by asking, what do those letters mean? Archer replied, in most rankings, X is the best rank, while E is the worst. When it comes to my strength and speed, it has been weakened to an extent due to your imperfect summoning. So you're saying, I'm much stronger than what you saw, Archer answered, thankfully, my endurance and noble phantasm haven't weakened at all. Noble phantasm? Shuru asked. A servant's greatest weapon, and it's most likely the weapon they are mostly identified by their noble phantasm. And let me tell you that I have a lot of noble phantasms. Shuru nodded in understanding, so basically, in your initial state, you're average in strength and speed, but when you go all out, you become extremely dangerous. In a sense, yes. Archer admitted, but then Naruto spoke with strong conviction, I don't give a damn about the stats I have. I'm giving a hell of a fight, and I'll use every damn thing I've got in my arsenal to fight. Master, my stats may be not at the optimal condition, but you've seen what my sword can do. You've seen my skill, and you know I am capable of going toe to toe with every servant in this war. Don't count me out. I am Archer, once regarded as the most unpredictable where I come from. Let them underestimate me or surround me. I'll kill them all, and win this war. The red headed master stared in silent surprise before he smiled and nodded at his servant, who just smiled in return. Now, master, said Naruto, catching Shuru's attention, what do we do for you to get the harem ending? Meanwhile, back on the Toshaka estate, Rin was resting while trying to understand just how she, Emiya, and their servants managed to escape from the Einsberg air and that monster, Berserker. And Emiya Kun's servants' stats, Rin thought while shivering upon remembering the archer's mana and stamina being beyond the average, and don't even get her started on his noble phantasm rank. Luckily his strength and agility are on average. If not, now the Toshaka heir shivered at the idea of that, overpowered archer, thinking of WHOR what could face him. In the church, a certain golden douche sneezed. Saber, on the other side, was very confused about the enigma known as archer. That irritating servant, he's not a knight, yet he acts like one. She frowned with her boiling rage igniting like an inferno, which only increased as she thought about his abilities, he can be every class on this war and even uses their abilities, speed equal to lancer, stealth like assassin, swordsmanship equal to mine, 
can summon multiple weapons and use them like arrows, then can use some sort of magic equal to caster, and even summons a lion like a rider. The sheer envy and fury Saber felt could heat an egg if said egg was placed on top of her head. Even so, he's quite modest, she blushed a bit before shaking her head. That smile too. So hypnotizing. Saber swooned in delight, and shook her head again, denying any sort of feminine interest to latch onto that despicable knight. She failed as she remembered the man's face underneath the visor. Bright, dazzling blue eyes like the endless sky or deep blue sea, hair sparkling like the sun, and a smile that beamed confidence. How can he keep smiling like that in the heat of battle? She continued to wonder about Archer and what his identity could be. She fell asleep to the recurring sight of Archer's smiling face, and woke up immediately before she burrowed her head into a pillow as she tried to remove that image all night. Shuru looked at a desolate landscape occupied by several warriors. Among them Archer was there. Archer stared at his colleagues, kneeling like he did. All of them keeled over from their injuries facing either enemy. A woman that looked like the saber he saw just hours ago had royal blue clothing turned ragged from all the scratches, tears, and holes. Her only intact outfit were her magically repairing armor. She stabbed an intricate sword on the ground as support while one knee stabilized her other side. She gasped for breath, yet couldn't do so properly because of the intimidating aura one of the men floating above unleashed. A man in red sported objects, probably swords, on his back, but he wasn't sure of it. The image was fuzzy at best. Like a mildly thick fog, the image kept blurring the more he wants to see. He's still alive despite the multiple weapons impaling his torso. He too was in equally exhausted shape as the saber look alike. His white hair donned blotches of red and his mouth spat a waterfall of blood, but he couldn't identify his face. Lancer, the exact same Lancer he saw today, was no better. To be honest, he thought Lancer died standing. He got the same treatment as the man in red did, but more devastating in appearance. Again with the fuzzy image, Shuru saw what seemed to be Lancer impaled at the heart. Lancer's breaths came at a rapid, irregular rhythm. His left shoulder was useless as a spear-like object tore through the joint. A pirate woman was out of commission. Knocked out and out of mana, her body faced the ground with her back towards the sky. Her injuries were unidentifiable, but Shuru knew she bled heavily. A fox girl seemed the least injured, but merely exhausted. A black knight's armor was dented all over the place. Whole pieces of weapons lodged themselves in the grooves of the knight's armor, but despite that, he was ready for more. A very questionable girl with questionable clothing had only one arm. Still in pain, she lowered herself to knee and tried to drown out the pain in her left side. Despite the damage Archer and his allies faced, it didn't mean that the two men with extremely destructive powers were left unscathed by the assault. A man in white robes, blurred from recognition, floated above the exhausted fighters. Another, also blurred, stood on some intricate contraption. The most discernible thing Shuru could identify was the gold the individual wore. Archer looked angry with himself. Looking over his left hand, he stared at it for quite some time. After that adequate amount of time, Archer spoke, with this command spell. I command my, with a flash of red, a piece of the what Shuru identified as a command spell from the earlier discussion about the peculiarities of the Holy Grail War, disappeared, and the kneeling fighters bathed in majestic green light that healed them completely. All of them now stood up, ready for the fight. The two men stared down at their enemies. They were obviously displeased, frowning or scowling in anger. Both of them seethed in seeing Archer and his friends struggle to stand once more to fight. Naruto looked to his right. A visor was on the ground. He desperately and grabbed it without delicacy. There was no time to waste and one more thing to do. He asked the fox girl for help, make me a, he commanded. What for? She asked. Archer mouthed seriously. Bringing out several wonderfully crafted swords, he stabbed them into different areas as well as placed the visor in another same area. The girl hastily created the, and let Archer start his chanting without interruption. He mouthed what seemed to be names, but who or what for, Shuru didn't know. What he did know was that his servant still getting used to that isn't ready to surrender to those floating opponents of theirs. Naruto reminisced. Upon his death, he was greeted by Elia, the will of mankind to survive. Naruto's servant, Archer, warned him about the counterforce. 
Whether it was a warning to get away from the presence or be wary of it, the Orange Knight forgot. He stepped closer, wondering what the collective consciousness of mankind would want with his dead self. The overbearing silence the entity gave unnerved Naruto. A feat few have done once he became an adult. Barring the slight digression, Naruto was bombarded with images of the past, the Fifth Grail War and its corrupted Grail. He had a few in mind about what he was being tasked to do. Destroy the Grail. Huh, straight to the point. Admirable for the will of mankind to state that without build-up or preparation. He wondered to himself what would his class be if he were to be summoned in the Grail War. Will he be a saber, lancer, archer, berserker, assassin, caster, or rider? He could be any of those things really, and being in any of those classes would limit his battle capabilities exponentially, a great shame. You will be a combat pragmatist, a warrior who will use anything to win. You will keep the skills you've learned in your life and become a counter force to destroy the grail. Interesting, Elia would give him his skills to destroy the corrupted grail. Truly an honor to be given immunity to class restrictions. He bowed slightly in thanks for the gesture given. However, does this mean I'm a counter guardian? No you are merely employed to take this task, you are still gay as beast. Gay as beast, in other words, a heroic spirit. Hmm, so he has a place in the throne of heroes, it seemed. Then what of the other dimension periencing this exact dilemma? He continued to ask. The second magic surely has other parallels that are in need of being saved from the corrupt grail. Moreover, there are an unlimited number of those parallels. How am I supposed to destroy the grail if I'm destroying only one from one branch of the original event? Naruto's questions seem to silence the will of mankind. Either it's thinking of possible answers, or it cannot divulge into those answers. Though he hoped that the former would happen. This particular grail would cause the extinction of all mankind. Angra Mainyu, all the world's evil, will destroy the world if not destroyed in time. Hum, Naruto hummed with a thumb resting under his chin and the other fingers closed in a loosely made fist, while his other hand supported his other elbow. So it seems you are in charge of merely keeping the existence of mankind within the parallels. Do I have that assumption right? Yes. The grail will inevitably be corrupted. I make the necessary preparations to ensure mankind isn't destroyed by the calamity. The grail, should you fail, will cause a major cataclysmic stagnation, then degeneration, and finally extinction. Yikes, Naruto cringed at the responsibility he'd been given to shoulder. Way to lay it on thick, Elia. This is the will of mankind of mankind you're talking to, spirit. I wouldn't even consider you for this job or other exemplary spirits and favor my own agents to this unless it's a drastic event like this. This extinction will not stop at humans, it will wipe out all life in the planet, something Gaia would not want to happen so casually. You, beast of Gaia, must stop this or your world will be the same as the red planet. Red planet? That's not possible. So if I fail, that's what will happen to that branch of the past. He pondered the situation critically. All of his skills would be present, none would be locked away, and he could use all of them, which was perfect considering Archer told him about Berserker, the same one he fought last night. Those A-ranked noble phantasms will help in defeating him. As for the Lesser Grail, Iliasfiel von Einsburn. Her heart would be the key to create the actual Grail, at least the Lesser one. If she isn't used as a sacrifice, then the Lesser Grail can't be made. Then again, there's also the big alternative, which is killing her then burning her heart. As shown by their encounter with the girl, she had an abundant amount of odd in those magic circuits of hers in order to supply Berserker with mad enhancement. So there were two options he could take here, keep Ilya safe, or regrettably kill her. He heard the stories about Ilya from Archer. Apparently, she was his sister, a child left alone by her father, Archer's father, whom adopted him. She grew resentful after she was abandoned, after her father lost the fourth war. The Einsburn family took to teaching her to be a proper magus while growing resentment for the adopted child of Karitsugu Emiya. If he's summoned by anyone, counter guardian archer's master, Rin Tasaka would be compatible with him in terms of the ability of handling him and his deviating tendencies. In terms of personality, Shuru Emiya, archer, would be compatible with him. That is, if Avalon doesn't become the catalyst. Digressing over that, if he's summoned by Ilya herself then it'd be a simple matter of protecting her. Having considered the most likely possibilities, Naruto nods. I'll do it, 
He said with confidence, I'll become your counter agent just this once, Alaya. For the world, I will fight to my last breath. It only seems fair that a spirit of exceptional skill performs the task unlike those inadequate counter guardians, who cause way too much trouble than necessary to do the job. Alaya seemed to ignore the jab aimed at its counter guardians, but Naruto was sure there was a hint of fury inside the will of mankind. While not a pretty sign, it didn't matter. Alaya was duty first before all else. Perfect. Win the war, and destroy the grail. Alaya said those last words as a command. If Naruto didn't learn anything martial from his servants, he did learn how to be chivalrous, a flirt, a horrible one, be a strict mediator, and as he just displayed, snarky. Naruto could just imagine the thumbs up he'd get from Archer and his counter guardian version as he made that snide remark against Alaya, but it was only speculation, nothing more, nothing less. He doubt he'd see either version in the throne of heroes because they are arranged by timeline, meaning he's somewhere in the infinite expanse of time. Once the will of mankind disappeared, Naruto was transported to his throne. An orange throne decorated with lines of gold and blue and his trials and tribulations was displayed before him. To the throne's left, a lion, Kuritsugu, named in memory of Archer's father, sat quietly, almost asleep. To the right, a giant white dragon with giant golden horns on its head and fins covering almost its entire body, Kiryuan stood, er, floated in vigilance. These were his two animals' friends he'd found and raised during his travel. Kuritsugu was a lion much larger than regular ones. As for Kiryuan, his species, Amatsumaguchi, storm dragons that lived in the upper atmosphere, he found it as a meteorite. The memory stings a little. He shook his head, wiping away the memory, and patted both beasts' heads before taking a seat in his throne. Now he had to wait in silence, wondering which master would summon him. It'll be difficult killing the Einsburn in cold blood, Naruto said to himself, I'll take my chances in protecting her. With that decision, he closed his eyes and fell asleep. He'd only wake up to answer the call of his summons. Master. Wake up. Archer ordered. He shook the sleeping body of Shuru Emiya, his master. Shire stirred slightly from his slumber. Archer took note that his master hadn't changed from his bloodied uniform. Archer shook Shuru some more eliciting a groan from the teen. M, Archer. What time is it? Shuru groggily asked while refusing to sit up. Four in the morning. Archer answered. E.H. Shuru opened his eyes and sat up. Really? Why are you waking me up so early, Archer? He questioned his servant's decision to wake him from his wonderful sleep. What's so important that I need to be woken up at this ungodly hour? I want to see if you can summon me properly. What? But I already summoned you, didn't I? Shuru said in confusion. Archer shook his head. That's why I said, properly, Archer emphasized. The reason for my lowered stats is due to the fact that you summoned me out of instinct, and not from a proper incantation. A proper summoning always yields to a better result. Shuru nodded in understanding, at least somewhat. You summoned me without a catalyst, an object tied to a servant. When the Grail summons a servant, if the master has no catalyst, it will choose the servant through compatibility. So you're going to make me do the summoning properly using your catalyst, correct? Indeed. Now, let us go to the site of my summoning and do this quick. The quicker we're done with this, the better the chance nobody notices anything out of the blue. Both men walked to the shed briskly. Though they spoke of one thing that bothered or interested Shuru. He looked at his servant's hair, resembling the unkempt mane of his lion and it stimulated the following observation he came to remember but did not pursue last night. Archer. Shuru called to his servant. Hum, what is it, master? Archer replied with his own query. That lion you summoned last night, Kuritsugu. Shuru started saying. Archer made an ah gesture because he knew where Finn's conversation would head. He listened silently to see what his master would ask of him. It sounds Japanese in origin. And judging from your appearance, you aren't from Japanese descent. Archer looked surprised at his master's observation skills. I found Kuritsugu as a cub. I raised it along with my friends. One of them suggested the name. I liked the suggestion, and so, that's my lion's name. As for your second statement, you could consider me a half-breed or something along the lines. My father has western origins whereas my mother had more of an oriental appearance. Archer explained his origins vaguely though Shuru deemed it adequate enough for now. 
Once they arrived, Archer handed his master one of his pauldrons and told him to place it within the circle that seemed to fade away after its initial use. So what do I do? Shuru asked Archer, who handed him a small note, where he got the paper and pencil to write down the words, the young man didn't know. Read it. Archer said, the summoning will do the rest. Shuru looked at the note with a hint of suspicion. The Grail War seemed like a mess judging from what he saw last night. Scratch mess, the war was more like disaster from the initial battles he witnessed. He had to kill servants to win. Not really him per se, but it would be under his command that Archer would kill enemy servants. Reluctantly, Shuru recited the incantation. Let silver and steel be the essence. Let stone and the Archduke of Contracts be the foundation. Let red be the color I pay tribute to. Let rise a wall against the wind that shall fall. Let the four cardinal gates close. Let the three forked road from the crown reaching unto the kingdom rotate. Let it be filled. Again, 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 again. Let it be filled fivefold for every turn, simply breaking asunder with every filling. Let my will create thy body and thy sword create my fate. If thou dost accede to this will and reason, answer me. I hereby swear, I will be all that is good in the eternal world. I will be the disposer of evil in the eternal world. Thou clad with the great trinity, come forth from the circle of restraint. Guardian of the heavenly scales. The magic circle glowed a heavenly blue, and the light bathed the room in the very same color. Archer thought something was wrong. He wasn't experiencing the sensation of being pulled by an invisible force all summonings tended to do. Archer guessed that the circle ignored his catalyst for another more powerful one. He had only one extremely plausible idea which catalyst the circle used. However, it should be impossible. All seven had been summoned already. Any more, and Shuru would die from the exhaustion. Archer palmed his master's back, and forced his master's circuits to come alive like neon green streaks emerging from his back. To alleviate any extraneous stress from the summoning, the more magic circuits active would allow for a less life threatening experience. Hopefully, the catalyst would heal him quickly. The glow blinded the two men, and once it disappeared, a woman the Shuru saw in his dream last night appeared. Archer guessed right. If he wasn't being summoned, she was the only other reason. I ask of you, are you my master? Servant Saber has answered your summons. The woman asked. Archer looked stunned to see a second Saber be summoned to this Grail War, and be the eighth servant no less. This just screams destabilization. Archer surmised that the corruption is far stronger than he imagined if the Grail allowed a second saber to be summoned as an eighth servant in a battle of seven classes. Said servants of the other classes sensed the disturbance. Something destroyed the rule of seven. One other, servant, in particular recognized the presence as the same servant from ten years ago. Why yes. I am Shuru Emiya. Shuru stammered. Despite this being his second summoning, he still hadn't gotten used to that question. Then the pact is forged. My blade shall hensef servant. Saber poised her blade at Archer. She was ready to strike him down for her master. Saber, I am master's servant as well. Saber stiffened, but did not point the invisible sword away. It may seem impossible, but you are summoned by master. In fact, you should know me. Though it seems the Grail summoned you from a time where you haven't met me. Let me show you. Saber backed away slowly as a form of caution and her invisible blade was gripped a little more tighter. His voice calmed her slightly, however, her guard, which slowly deteriorated, stayed. Something in her mind told her that the servant before her could be trusted. It also helped that the servant before her donned the look of a knight. Archer cautiously placed his hands on Saber's forehead. Mind helping me out? He asked something inside his head. Saber's eyes widened as Archer's memories implanted themselves inside Saber's mind. The most prominent event, her fight with Archer replayed several times. Now do you recognize me, Sabernay? Saber lowered her blade, and smirked. Quite the happenings, Archer. She placed a hand on her hip, so I'm the eighth servant, it seems. You certainly get yourself into quite the trouble, don't you? Her smile reassures Archer that what he did was successful. So did you reactivate his dormant circuits? Archer nodded. And Saber returned the gesture. Good. It'd be terrible if our master perished as soon as he summoned me. He doesn't have the same amount of circuits as you do. If you hadn't done that, then he really would suffer an unwanted death. 
Shuru stared with mouth agape. He would have died. What's even worse, they're talking about such a serious thing like death as if it was nothing. If they're his servants, then shouldn't they be worried about his well being? Era, Saber Nay, are you learning the ways of snark? Archer mockingly asked. Did he teach you how to snark? Archer leaned forward in anticipation at finally seeing the King of Knights actually being something else than honorable. He did say that I needed to get with the times. Saber retorted. She sighed, honestly, I still favor how I usually act. A knight is never one to snark or make snide comments about a person. Saber stated with finality. She turned to Shuru and kneeled like her knights would to her, as I was saying, Master, henceforward, my sword shall be your fate. I shall protect you with all my might. No doubt Archer will do the same, isn't that so, Archer? Archer kneeled beside her, and followed Saber's example. Indeed, I too will do all I can to protect you. Archer answered with a steel conviction, however, with you obtaining two servants, you only have the supply to maintain one constantly. Even so, your low amount of prana won't be able to properly sustain one of us. Your amount of prana is also quite low that Saber won't be able to receive the supply, at least at a constant flow. And with your inadequate skill as a magus, Saber's stats have declined considerably, or at least as stats unbecoming of a Saber class servant. Shuru stared at Archer silently while he took in every bit of information given. Also in your case, Saber cannot disappear like I can. Therefore, she'll take up most of your supply of prana, and will need a set of clothes. The boy blushed at the image he created in his mind. Saber was without a doubt mesmerizing. Flawless skin, glossy, golden hair, and a petite body that make her a dangerous teddy bear in his eyes. Unknowingly, he let out a small smile, which both servants noticed. Archer glanced over at Saber, who smiled at their master's reaction. But then, Shuru realized something. If I can only supply one servant, then how will you survive, Archer? An excellent question, Master. Archer said, I will use my independent action skill to survive. Shuru raised an eyebrow at that. What did independent action mean? Archer continued, It means I can reject the supply, which you can't even give, and live off without the need for those things for an indefinite amount of time. In layman's terms, I can stay here as long as I want, even if you're dead. I won't let that happen to you, though. Archer added the last part quickly in order to reassure his master that everything would be fine. Besides that, the only time I'll need a constant supply of prana is if I want to be able to use my noble phantasms. So, so it means that you'll supply Saber most of the time, and I will be a free bird. I see. So in a way, this is the most logical and safest way I'll stay alive with two servants, is it? Shuru asked as a means to see if he comprehended the information. Both servants nodded. Okay, then we'll need an alibi for Saber. An alibi? Archer asked. Wow, you're right. We do need a proper alibi for Saber. You aren't the only one living in this house of yours, right? Technically, I live alone, but I do have frequent visitors in the morning and afternoons. Shuru answered. One of them is my Kohai, the other, a freeloading sensei. Archer snorted at his master's depiction of the latter's sensei. They'll be sure to notice a foreigner in my house. Yeah, no kidding. Archer said sarcastically while rolling his eyes at the obviousness. Saber slapped his shoulder, eliciting a recoiled reaction from the orange knight, who caressed the spot affected. Saber gave Archer a look of fury that terrified him. He reeled back as if to say, Okay, I get it. Then there's also you. Shuru added, Being my servant means that we'll have to interact in public at some point. So we'll need to think of an alibi just for you. But what could be some believable scenarios that could get both of you off the hook? He rested a hand on his chin and adopted a thinking pose. There has to be some credulous alibi that has to work. Huh? A tutor? One Taiga Fujimura, freeloader extraordinaire, asked while inspecting the man before her. Next to him, a woman sat silently. Her piercing gaze tries to instill fear into both, but failed. Both were foreigners, had blonde hair and fair skin. The man looked quite rigid and mature, as if he was a sculpture, and looked to be around his late twenties. Though the whisker marks on his face degraded the idea. The man, Shuru's supposed tutor, smiled at her in that exotic, and blissful smile. Her heart thumped a bit. She looked back at the woman, who resembled a delicate flower with that petite body of hers and looked to be no older than sixteen. Yes. 
Fujimura-san. Archer, under the guise of the name, Eric Gunther, replied, Young Shuru here asked me to tutor him into the more complex intricacies of the English language. I was unaware of the fact that you were one, and I understand that you are an English teacher of remarkable skill. Please excuse my transgressions. I feel terrible to intrude on your job. He bowed to the energetic woman, shocking her because of the action, and because he spoke in fluent eloquent Japanese. Taiga displayed a blank face that neither Shuru of his kohai, Sakura, could identify. The kendo practitioner shuddered slightly. Sakura Madu brushed her shoulder length, straight, purple hair, and cautiously grabbed her teacher's shuddering shoulder. Completely unexpected, Taiga puts her hands to her cheeks and swayed left and right while trying to hide her embarrassment. AAAWWW. I'm not furious, Mr. Gunter. I'm totally no extremely fine with you tutoring Shuru. I admit I can be a handful at times, and some of the material goes over my students' heads because of the energy I just release. It's one of the biggest flaws I have as a teacher, and I, she kept on blabbering non stop, and, Eric, had learned to tune it out. He realized this woman was weak to too much praise or respect. Either that or his dashing good looks or fluency in Japanese charmed her. Shuru had his mouth comically wide open. Never, never had he seen his elder sister figure act this way. He had to be dreaming. He just had to. Never in his life did he ever think that the tiger would become domesticated by a man, a foreigner no less. How cruel of you, Eric. Saber, under the name of Clarice Gunther, whispered to her younger brother. She had yet to reveal herself as the older on out of the two of them. Though, in the back of her mind, she could falsify her age to properly safeguard Shuru from the enemy masters and servants in school. Toying with a woman's heart like so. It's unbecoming for a man like you to do such a thing to her. Eric turned to his sister, and gave her a narrow stare. I understand your reason for being her, but what about her? Taiga pointed to Clarice with a shaky index finger and arm trying to stay stiff while pointing at its target. The woman in question leaned back as if trying to stay away from the offending finger. As Shuru's guardian, I cannot allow a woman to get close to Shuru. I cannot allow your younger sister to be here. Shuru raised an eyebrow at that, then instantly blushed. Sakura stood flabbergasted at her teacher's implication. Ah! Eric monotonously said, Clarice is my older sister, Fujimura-san. He stated as a matter of fact. I'm younger than her. She's twin. Before he could finish, he received a punch from his sister. The fist that dealt the damage shook and bathed in fury. She stood menacingly with her fist in the air. What did I tell you about revealing a woman's age? She growled out. Eric stared impassively, and returned to the conversation at hand. He did not want to start a childish argument such as something as simple as discussing her age. The action irked Clarice, but did not choose to pursue conflict by pressing on with the childish interrogation. As you can see, she's the older one he said with the subtle hint of sarcasm that he'd been taught to recognize and utilize. Saber scowled uncharacteristically, and fumed at Archer's words, if you still don't want her to be here, spar with her in kendo. She practiced fencing, and dabbled for a couple of years in kendo. I heard from Shuru here that you are an excellent practitioner of the art of swordplay, and that there's a dojo you can use to practice. It should prove to quite interesting, no? Shuru wanted to say, how does a fight justify her stay? but then realized by pointing out this little fact might prevent him from seeing Saber's skill in action. That and the fact that this little fact would be effectively ignored. Your older sister? Taiga asked, she practices kendo? Somewhere in the back of her mind, her inner desire to fight peaked at an all-time high. The woman in front of her, a foreigner, practiced kendo. Her inner tiger despite all she might try to deny it bared her claws and fangs at the thought of wielding her Torishinai against this, dangerous, woman. In more simple thinking, she thought Sakura was a better woman that would catch Shuru's eyes than the foreigner in front of her. Oh look at her, jumping on the SS Sakura Emiya. With a huff, she agreed, and both left the dining room to go to the dojo. Saber stood ready with a shinai in her hand, and her stance perfected. Taiga praised her for such attention to detail and form. She stared at her opponent, calm, collected, and fierce. Saber gripped the shinai firmly as a signal to show she's prepared. However, are you seriously not going to wear any armor? Taiga asked. Saber wore the same outfit she'd been given the first time she'd been summoned as Shuru's servant, which was a knee length skirt, a white, long sleeved blouse, 
and a black pantyhose. She turned to Archer. Mr. Eric, please show your sister reason. She could get hurt. Archer waved it off as nothing, and told her she could handle herself. She'll be fine, Fujimura-san. Her teacher told her that her skill fit with the capacity of knights of the European medieval era. She'll be fine. Trust me. Taiga looked worried as Archer's dismissal, and reluctantly turned to Saber. First to a victory point wins. Okay. Saber nodded and narrowed her eyes in focus. Her rigid form stood atop the loose balls of her feet, ready to spring at any time like a jack in the box. Like her, Taiga took her stance. With Shuru as the referee, he signaled the start of the fight. Saber sprung forwards, her shinai right above her to strike Taiga's head. The tiger blocks it, and slides her shinai to force Sabers to move away from her head. She pushed Saber off, and returned the favor by aiming a slash at her sides. Saber swung to her right, and parried the attack, pinning the Torshinai's point to the ground. She quickly raised her sword to once again aim it at Taiga's head. The kendo practitioner aimed her slash at the same spot, and both bamboo swords meet in a deadlock. Wow, Clarize San is quite talented in kendo to be able to force Fujimura sensei on the defensive. Sakura said in awe. Archer didn't say anything as he already knew this is what would happen. Besides, the girl next to him was more important. The purple hair reminded him of Mel. He inwardly sighed. Second magic is a pain to accept, but he's here, and staring at him right in the face. He missed them, his servants. They were his loyal subjects, but family first and foremost. Though some of them were his lovers. He smiled at the memory of his girls hugging him so tight he thought he'd die the best way, in the bosom of his lovers. His reminiscent thoughts were broken by Saber's mighty yell. She'd slashed at Taiga's side, however, the woman blocked and retaliated. The fight favored neither side, and Saber saw the woman's skill shine far more brighter here than the first time they'd sparred. The sound of bamboo meeting echoed hollowly with each clash. Their slashes seemed wild, however, to the trained eye, these were precise, expertly executed strikes meant to incapacitate. Saber's skill as a knight prevented any incoming attacks from hitting her. The same can be said for Taiga. Both women strived for a victory, and the spectators could clearly see it in both their faces. Saber stepped back, allowing Taiga's swing to narrowly miss her side. As she missed, Saber lunged forward once again aiming to hit the woman's head. As if following some program, Taiga reacted quickly, blocking the attack. Saber raised her sword and repeated the action again, and again, and again. Taiga blocked all of them, and at the fifth time, Saber held the Shinai in a reverse grip. The force of the attack visibly bent Torashinai more than it could possibly take, yet it still kept its form. Saber slid the sword down, and returned her grip to its original position. She kept her sword to her right, leading Taiga to defend her left. When Saber raised her sword, Taiga instinctively blocked overhead. Saber swung downwards, but aimed left, confusing Taiga for that single moment. Saber stepped forward, and twisted her body to the right, her sword following its flight plan accordingly. Mere inches away from Taiga's unguarded side, Saber's shinai stopped. Shuru raised his hand, winner, saw Claire eyes Gunther, Archer gave a knowing smirk towards Taiga, who frowned at her loss but blushed under Archer's unknowingly effective smiles. It has to be his foreign looks, Taiga concluded, it's the only reason why I'm reacting to his, gorgeous and innocent and dashing looks. She shook her head. No, I must not fall to corruption. Archer did not see Taiga's various and entertaining facial expressions unlike Shuru, still gawking at Taiga's out-of-character reactions. The English teacher turned to Saber, for someone who's dabbled into kendo, you sure know how to fight in the style. Saber bowed, I thank you for the compliment. Kuritsugu san taught me during one of his trips abroad. Eh? You know Kuritsugu san? Taiga questioned, how? Archer butted in, our mother is good friends with the man. He'd give us souvenirs from Japan when we were little while he'd go on about his business in banking or whatever it was they talked about. We wondered why he never visited us for ten years. I moved on and became a teacher tutor of English and it seems my sister here wanted to delve into what happened with Kuritsugu-san. He turned to Saber, seriously, I did not expect you to go to Japan just for a reason like this. Saber, catching on to the alibi, retorted, I'm a grown woman, Eric. I can choose to go where I want to go. 
She cemented the idea by placing her hands on her hips, the opposite of what she tried to convey. Archer snickered while leaning his back on the wall, not with your height you aren't. Without even opening his eyes, he knew Saber fumed at his words. If one were to compare her height, Saber looked to be approximately a head shorter than their master. He then sensed Saber hammering her shanai at his head. Years of being taught to counter a blade, Archer grabbed a shanai in the rack conveniently next to him. Archer parried the blow, and kept doing it as Saber kept on slashing at him. Geez, calm down, Claire. So what if you're on the short side? You look fabulous enough to charm any guy you want. Though with your actual age, in his mutterings, he earned a mighty thwack to the head. Ow, okay, I deserve that, but did you have to do it so hard? He cradled his head to ease the pain away. HMPH, Saber turned away from the injured archer, the action was her only sign as an answer. Their master stared at how much the two were in sync when it came to this alibi. They acted like siblings so much you'd never question it, though they could try and act a bit more mature. Actually, how did they know who Karitsugu was? Shuru will have to inquire about that little known fact. They returned to the dining room to finish their discussion. Eric had returned to the topic of being Shuru's tutor. Taiga adopted a thinking pose, and left the others waiting for five minutes with bated breath. All the suspense seemed to burn away when Taiga slammed her hands on the table. I got it. She yelled ecstatically, how about you become my assistant teacher? That got Archer's brain thinking, sure Homurahara Academy will need to see your credentials and such, but seeing as you're a bona fide Englishman, I'm sure you'll be hired quickly. If you get hired, but won't be an assistant, you'll be just as great a teacher because you are fluent in the English language to teach alongside me and then came the rest of the babble that would further explain why this would work. To Archer, it means he can keep an eye on the school and his master, he'll just need forged diplomas and documents, and he'll be set. He could probably do it in less than a day. That is a better alternative than tutoring, Archer replied. Just don't swoon your female students and staff, Eric. We already had that problem while we were in high school and college. We don't want repeats, got it? Taiga and Sakura had fun imagining whatever scenario they concocted in their heads when they tried to decipher what Saber meant by that. Taiga surmised a flood of women chasing after him. Sakura thought the X-rated version of what Taiga imagined, she successfully hid her furious blush from prying eyes. Okay, okay, Claire. He set his focus back to Taiga, I'd like to take up on your offer. Just give me a day or two to gather my documents. It has been a while since I've actually shown them and no doubt they had gathered dust after all these years inside mother's house. You left your documents in England? Taiga asked, somewhat suspicious now that Archer said he left the vital documents that allowed a person to teach. Well to be fair, I wanted to take a vacation before settling in Fuyuki City. I didn't expect myself to offer myself to teach Shuru had I not found the Emiya residence during one of my morning strolls, nor did I expect to be in this present situation. Archer defended himself, quickly making excuses left and right to keep up the alibi he'd forged to seamlessly. Inwardly, he knew to be wary of Shuru's guardian. She had a lot of insight despite acting like a goof. Something he'd know for he was once a troublesome individual as a child. Taiga seemed to accept that answer and returned to her seat. Ah, Fujimura-sensei, we must go, early club practice will start soon. Sakura stated, completely putting the previous topic negligible for the moment. Archer mentally sighed. He didn't know how he could come up with believable excuses in such short notice. He hypothesized it having to do with his previous occupation, and it seemed to be the best candidate. Other than that, it could be attributed to how well he can pull anything out of his ass. Seriously, how convenient was it that a lot of his enemies were defeated by one well-placed Rasengan with an equally unique and convenient power boost of some sort? Be rank luck. Thank goodness Shuru was incompetent not really appropriate to say. If he were a better master, Archer was sure that his luck would rise to a plus 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 and almost everything would become a deus ex machina. The Shania rack next to him was just a small sign of his luck rank. I gotta go as well. You two can. Must. Stay here. Shuru said in a way that seemed like a command to his servants. Within minutes, Shuru left the Emiya residence, and the Gunther siblings were left alone to do whatever they wish. Archer laid down on his back while Saber remembered that this happened before, left alone in the house because she couldn't dematerialize. So, Naruto, what will you do? Saber queried, 
First of all, make forged documents, then scout the city, and then keep an eye out for our master. I meant about Taiga. She seems infatuated with you. What'll you do about that? She can't be involved. You know that right? She received a nod. I'll keep her safe if she is involved, though it doesn't mean I'll romance her. Knowing those girls, they'll kill me if they found out I got extra members. He bitterly said those words. She is a gem of a woman, I will admit. Whoever can handle her will be quite the guy. Saber ignored the last sentence, seeing as she won't get any more informations from him, you seem to have your agenda taken care of, but it seems there's something more you're leaving out, tell me. In school, Shinji Matu, Sakura's brother, strolled in a hallway back and forth, and panicked the whole time. He started his messy purple hair in frustration. If he felt that, then everyone else surely felt that. His hands balled up a pair of fists. Who summoned that eighth servant? That occupied his mind at the moment. If one of the seven somehow summoned an eighth servant, then that master has the biggest advantage at the moment. He bit his thumb. How can Ryder manage a second of any of the classes? She looked weak. Why was she a heroic spirit? Why was Sakura the master? If anything, he's the true master. Sakura wouldn't hurt a fly. And he went on a tangent. If Ryder will get a fighting chance, he'll need to activate the blood fort soon. And with Tasaka as a master attending the school, he knows he has to do it very soon to balance the scales enough that Ryder has a 50 50 chance of winning against Tasaka's servant. Even worse, he knew Tasaka had been meddling in his magic circles by dismantling them. It's surprising Edelfelt hadn't done anything about his magic circles despite him knowing her being a magus. This is the worst possible thing that could happen right now, Ryder. He called to his servant, who appeared in a purple haze. Beautiful, silky purple hair that ran the length of her body was the biggest and most defining detail about the woman. She wore a black tube dress with a dark purple trim at the top. Conforming to the color scheme, she also wore a pair of detached sleeves with purple straps at the top and wristbands, while for the bottom, she wore a pair of black thigh high boots with a purple trim and armor at theta of her feet. On her face, a purple blindfold covered her eyes, and above it, a strange design was etched. Yes, Shinji? She asked. We might need to activate the Bloodford Andromeda today, Shinji said while scowling. I wanted to do it later to show it off, but we might need to do it today just to keep you in the game. Ryder stood there listening to Shinji's every word. He wanted her to be strong enough to combat the mysterious eighth servant summoned just this morning. She'd already tried to investigate the area surrounding the summoning, but she couldn't penetrate the powerful bounded field meant to keep a servant away. She knew the caster of the field wanted to know his, her presence to be known, before those, she breached three, nearly undetectable fields crafted with expert skill, warning her to stay away. At the last field, she wondered what those warnings were for because nothing happened to her neither physically or mentally. It either meant that if she continued to break through, the caster would retaliate, or lightning ambush. It was a futile attempt, so she left. Understood, Shinji, she said before disappearing into her spirit form. In the distance, a servant shrouded in the darkness of the forest fizzled away into nothingness to report his findings to his master. All the mysterious servant said before disappearing was, Archer. Rin sat at the rooftop, and scanned the placid blue sky and halcyon clouds. In contrast, her mind held dark thoughts regarding Shuru. He didn't deserve Archer as his servant. Compatible, maybe, but his poor skills as a magus and master will lead his servant to ruin. She had to know if he was worthy if he could handle a servant of Archer's caliber. Lily wouldn't respond to her when she told the knight her idea in the morning. It seemed that her pride as a knight was far more important. Then there's the strange summoning. An eighth servant, she pondered if it was possible at all. The servant system only allowed for one of each class to appear. If so, what happened in order to bend the rules? If it isn't a servant from the seven classes, then could the mysterious servant be from the lost classes of the third war? During her internal ramblings, she felt a presence stalk her, and she knew who it was. I know you're there, Archer. Rin spoke out loud. Reveal yourself. Why stalk your ally? You bear ill will against my master, and had half a mind to act on that impure will. You speak about being allies while thinking about those things. You've quite a strange definition for an ally, Tasaka san. Archer said nonchalantly, I have to keep an eye on you. It's not that difficult to keep you both in check. Rin frowned. 
She knew that Archer meant that he's using his duplication ability to keep tabs on both of them. Try all she might, Archer seemed to have a knack for placing priority over things at appropriate times. He wasn't a total fool of a servant. You're absolutely right. Archer shifted his stance from a relaxed one to a prepared one. The Tasaka admired that despite the annoying servant's actions, he prioritized the safety of his master. I wish to test him. I want to know how skilled the master of Archer is for myself. I want to know if he's worthy of being your master. Now ride along, Dragon Rider. Dragon Rider? Archer asked. He smirked. The girl was good. She already figured out why he has X ranked riding skill. Amazing. That's one out of, I lost count of NPs I have. Good luck figuring out who I am. He smiled at her, you know. I wonder what would happen should you have summoned me, Tasaka. It'd be a strange partnership, that much I can tell. But other than that, I give you approval to do this. Just don't kill him, or I will kill you. If he dies, then he wasn't meant to be a master, Archer. Seriously, if he can't handle me in a fight, then how will he handle any other servant? I'll do it after school so that no innocent bystanders and potential victims witness this. Rin answered without any hesitation. Okay then. Just to warn you, I have a gut feeling that an outside force will interrupt your battle. Who or what, I don't know. What I can vouch for is that besides you and Master, there are three other Masters here. And one is a poor excuse to be one. Ah, you must be talking about Shinji. Not to worry, he won't be a major problem. Rin dismissed the Madu as if he was an insignificant bug. The way she talked about him, belittling the arrogant Magus, she clearly despised the Madu. Though unlike the Madu, she took the other masters seriously, as for the other masters, I have a feeling the foreigner transfer student is a Magus. I have no idea who the last one could be. So you've identified at least five of the seven masters. Good, if I may. He bowed and asked to leave. Rin found it odd that she couldn't place a proper personality on the servant. It frustrated her a bit. Aloof at one point, then serious the next. Bipolar perhaps? She never heard of a servant with a multi-personality disorder. You may leave, Archer. No doubt, you've some scouting to do, am I right in assuming so? She received a wordless nod. And so, the servant dispersed into golden flames, its embers flickering in the air like fireflies before they too disappeared. With the conversation over, she walked to the fence and scanned the area. Because of the strange occurrences in the city, students would be forced to go home as soon as the school day is over. This is the perfect time to test Shuru, who'll undoubtedly stay. Saber, she called. Next to her, a kneeling saber acknowledged her call, Yes, master. I want you to investigate the magic circles of blood and dispel them. Rin ordered. Maybe your magic resistance can properly destroy them. Saber stood and conceded to the order. The Tasaka master made one more comment, I haven't had the chance to say this, but Saber, your attire fits you quite beautifully. To be the king of knights and a woman at the same time, you don't seem to adhere to either dragons or lions because of your armor. You almost seem delicate like a lily. Thank you for the compliment, master. Saber smiled, then bowed to her master, now if I may? I wish to complete the order given to me with haste. You are dismissed, Saber. Rin answered, Be careful, okay? The knight dematerialized, not answering her master's worry, she couldn't answer for her master's sake. The summoning of the eighth servant served as a bad omen to her. No doubt those other servants are taking caution. She would have to investigate the matter soon. Master. I come bearing news of Ryder and her master. A voice said, the master, a blonde woman with curls going down the length of her bosom and a pair of blue ribbons turned to the voice. She straightened her Homurahara uniform and saw the cloaked owner of the voice. Assassin. She started, what news do you bear about Ryder and her master? Shinji Matu, Ryder's master, spoke of attempting to activate a blood fort Andromeda. The woman gasped slightly because she recognized the name. The reason for such action is because the Madu wants Ryder strong enough to combat the mysterious Eighth Servant. The Master understood Shinji's actions, but as a participant, she wouldn't allow the activation of the noble phantasm. What would you have me do, Master? I hope it isn't scouting again. Rozu has a scratch it wants to itch against a servant, preferably Archer. Assassin, you will scout for now. So stay your blade, and stick to the shadows, understood? Shuru ran for his life a second time this week. 
This time it wasn't a servant chasing after him, it was Rin, shooting at him with gander curses. With the smoldering craters meant to hit him, Rin obviously wanted to kill him. Completely unreasonable because, to Sokka, aren't we allies? The moment wasted to speak allowed Rin to almost hit him. The dark red orbs cutting through the air whizzed around Shuru. Unfortunately, he couldn't avoid all of them. Some of those gander curses tore his clothing, and even cut his sides. I'm sorry, but with you leaving your servants at home, this is the only possible way I can win against Archer. Shuru noted that Rin wanted to beat Archer, not him. The two were still running through empty hallways. Shuru struggled in trying Yo evade those curses. He went as far as jumping down a flight of stairs to gain some great distance away from Rin's assault. Your archer is the biggest threat here. Berserker is next in that list. As such, my priority is to eliminate the problem that will hurt my chances to win the most, Archer. Shuru turned left and entered an empty classroom, and locked both door to the room. He looked for something to use as a weapon. Rin tried entering, but the handle wouldn't allow for an intrusion from the outside. She rattled the door some more in hopes of dislodging the lock. No such luck. What am I going to do? Shuru wondered. The rattling of the door stopped, and Shuru hear Rin step back. Das Schließen Vogelkafig echo. The wall Shuru stared at created a mystical red magic circle. Shuru knew to back away quickly, and ran to the windows. The circle emitted a red shockwave of power and sparks of electricity danced along the room's walls. Shuru crossed his arms and tried to build up enough speed to break through the windows. When he bounced back from the window, he knew he was trapped in a bounded field. So that's her game, he took a table and positioned it on its side to create a makeshift shield. The Emiya master took a deep breath, and said, Trace on, magic circuits ran wild across the table's surface almost resembling a circuit board as Shuru braced for the next attack. Fix your own, I'll solve it. The classroom wall turned into a giant rapid gander launcher, shooting countless orbs inside the room in hopes of killing Shuru. The young man braced as he felt the gander curses strike his table multiple times. With his lack of experience in strengthening, his shield deteriorated with every curse hitting it. He saw the cracks growing deeper and deeper, and almost saw it utterly destroyed. Thankfully. Rin's barrage stopped, and Shuru saw the devastation of the classroom. Upturned desks or chairs, broken metal pieces, and other debris made the room look like a bomb had exploded in the room. Out of mana? He breathlessly asked himself. That couldn't be it. Anyways, I need a weapon. Fast, he checked through the debris, and saw a metal table leg just next to him. He instantly grabbed it and reinforced it. Now he needed to. A blue gem struck the glass above the classroom doors. It glowed an intense blue. He couldn't stay in there. He had to run. He burst through the door, and evaded the explosion meant to kill him. He didn't pursue the luxury of talking to his assailant, and retreated from the explosion. Hold it right there. He heard Rin shout. In an instant, he skidded to a stop, and turned around. In shot a gander at the team. Shuru knew that needed to focus. He swung his table leg and hit the gander with enough force to throw it back at Rin's face. Is this how allies supposed to be? To stab each other in the back when given the chance? Shuru asked in anger. What kind of ally are you? He didn't want an answer as shown by him running away from the scene of battle once more. H hey. When Shuru reached ground level, he searched for an exit, unknowingly looking for his death. Ryder stalked Shuru after hearing the explosions made by Rin's gander. She reported to Shinji that Shuru was a master, and she was keeping track of him. Shiji hadn't known Shuru was a master, so for him to find out about it was a welcome news. He ordered Ryder to eliminate Shuru from this war and to do it in such a way that the others would be wary of his servant. Ryder grabbed her daggers, and prepared herself to assassinate the boy. May you rest in peace, young man. Shuru emerged from the school's side entrance with gander curses whizzing by him. Now. Chains rattled as it zoomed towards Shuru in blinding speeds. The Emiya master stopped in his tracks after hearing the chains flying through the air. He gripped his weapon tightly and tried to anticipate the incoming projectile targeting him. Archer sighed. So this is how foolish his master was before becoming a servant. It seems he's in trouble, Saber Ney. Do you want to reveal yourself? It's a risky move, but I might be able to cover it up. Saber had to make a decision, and she didn't like either choice. She could save Shuru, but it'll ruin the element of surprise. As a knight, 
she had to abide to chivalry and reveal herself in honorable battle because she doesn't need to hide. Your decision? You don't have much time, Saber Nay. She leapt off the roof and positioned her sword in a stabbing manner. Dropping like an anvil, she intercepted the chain and stabbed it into the ground. The dust picked up, and Saber's landing pushed Shuru back and into the school building. Behind him, Rin covered her eyes with her arm to prevent the dust from entering her eyes. Master, are you all right? Rin perked up at Saber's voice. Was she referring to her or to Shuru? As soon as the dust cleared, she saw Saber in a different outfit. I'm fine, Saber. Shuru answered. No way, Saber. Rin couldn't hide her shock. Shuru was responding to Saber. Just what is going on? There can't be two Sabers, right? Then there shouldn't be a carbon copy of Saber in front of her. So why was there a copy of Saber in front of her? She heard metal clanking on the floor of the school, and she turned to see her Saber kneeling towards her. You called, Master? Saber asked in the same voice the Saber in blue used. She noticed her master's distress, and desired to discover what ailed her master. What is your plight? May I be able to aid you? Her concern, visible to Rin, did not ease her master one bit. Whatever confused her, Rin insisted on looking at Saber to whatever the thing was over in the distance. Ha! Huh? Rin intelligently said, W what? If why your Saber, then, then who's she? She freaked out and pointed to the Saber in blue. Saber became petrified at the sight. That hair fashioned exactly like hers, those jade eyes that reflect like glass, who was she? Who was this imposter standing before her? What type of magecraft is this? What caused this blasphemy to happen in the Grail War? Hello, enemy master. I am Servant Saber, the Saber of Blue stated. Servant, Saber, Rin repeated. Impossible. Saber of White growled. Imposter, caster dispel your trickery and face me properly show me your true face dishonorable servant her rage boiled at the sight of her doppelganger it can only be caster's work that can create replicas of a master it has to be there's no other possible reason assassin hid in the shadows taking note of what was happening two sabers it seemed the mysterious eighth servant was saber and the copy of the saber in white or was it the other way around he gripped his sword rozu tightly Saber, he stayed there, taking in every detail in order to give a complete report to her master. Archer palmed his face, mentally, he laughed hysterically. Oh fate, you love screwing people over, don't shaw? Ah perfect, just perfect, on the outside, he was disappointed. A perfect surprise wasted on the same day it occurred. She could have appeared later, and tipped the scales towards Shuru, but as of at that moment, other masters will now be able to create countermeasures against her. Well, as they say, Archer breathed deeply, let the games begin. He jumped down, and started to pursue his master's assailant. Archer could feel the breeze framing his face as he descended upon Ryder. Archer reached for his sword, and then willed it to turn into its bow form. The blade splits at the middle, peeling back like one would see from a multi-purpose weapon like Archer possessed. One of the split blades was removed and placed on the other end of the handle, locking the piece in place. Once done so, several metal pieces moved around, lengthening the ends and lessening the curvature, forming the bow's frame, a longbow. To finish the transformation, a thin string of prana connected from one point to the other. He opened his right hand, and three standard arrows appeared between his fingers. He placed those arrows on the bow, and drew the string. Underneath his now equipped visor, he reinforced his eyes, and aimed when he saw a blindfolded woman holding the chains that meant to kill her master. I am the bone of my sword. The arrows merged together in a twisting fashion, making ridges like a helix. Lightning surged around the modified arrow bolt, and wind twisted as if the bolt controlled the very essence of a storm. Tear her apart, Barashi. He released the bolt, and it sped past mock speeds, where it shook the school building quite considerably, and broke all the windows in its proximity while making a tornado of cataclysmic proportions as it headed for Ryder. The woman heard Archer's words, and dodged in time, completely avoiding the sphere of storm once the arrow make impact with the ground. Red lightning surged outwards like a shockwave, and it almost reached Ryder's chains. Archer? She thought, it has to be if the attack came in the form of an arrow. Archer landed into the storm, dispersing like nothing happened. She inspected her assailant, an orange archer with an appearance akin to a knight. How peculiar. She mused. 
And what do I owe the pleasure, Archer? She sultrily asked to Archer. Archer propped his longbow on his shoulder. In his right hand, a Chinese Tao with the color scheme of Yang, twirled around through his motions. Nice to meet you, Gorgon. Ryder stiffened at Archer's words. She had been identified already? He gave her a smirk, slightly irking her, as for your question, you attempted to kill my master. As such, I'm here to deal your punishment. But first, do you fancy a dance? He bowed to Ryder casually, and it effectively confused her. Archer's voice held malice, yet his question held mischief as if he's mocking her. What a strange personality this Archer has. A dance, you say? Ryder said neutrally, it's not my choice to accept your request, servant of the bow. My master must order me so. She explained all she needed without a rise of emotion. As shown from the initial strike, Archer had dominance over all ranges. If he wasn't bluffing with that sword, then she would be under unfavorable conditions. I see. You do mean Sakuramatu when you speak of master, right? Ryder gritted her teeth. How did this archer know these things? Just who was this servant? She held her daggers in a reverse grip, ready to strike on Shinji's signal. I know about these things because of your stats, your current master weakened you. Ryder sighed at how true the comment was, incompetent, unreliable, insignificant, and arrogant little Shinji Madu is holding you back, Ryder. Your true master's command spells were taken away, am I right in assuming so? He received a wordless affirmative, I'd like to assist you in returning you to your proper master, Gorgon, I really do. However, your actions can't be forgiven, and so I must act accordingly. He lowered his bow, and twirled the sword in greater speeds. Ryder, still taking her battle stance, spoke once more, before we commence the battle, let me ask this one question. The one who stopped my dagger, is she the eighth servant? Archer sighed, and had a mental chat with Saber of Blue, Saber Nay, there is still a chance that I can salvage this, and keep your identity as the eighth servant a secret. Will you let me do it? He asked her. When he received a yes, he shifted himself to the left, allowing Ryder to see what went on with Shuru, Rin, and both sabers. The saber of blue, dispersed into a cloud of smoke, and inside it, Archer covered his mouth in futile attempt to conceal his laughter. The wind picked up, carrying the smoke away to reveal Archer's clone snickering at first, the laughing uncontrollably, Ha! I got ya! Tasaka-san! Saber-chan! You should have seen the look on your faces, priceless. Oh man, if only I had a camera to remember it by. He laughed some more, confusing Shuru, Shinji and Ryder, and embarrassing Assassin with the use of parlor tricks. The clone continued laughing until he was forced to dispel after being punched by Rin. As you can see, it's nothing more than trick of mine. Archer explained as he took a battle stance, now, is your curiosity sated, Gorgon? Because my patience has dwindled significantly as of right now. He threw the sword at Ryder, and she chucked her dagger at it, throwing it off course, but ultimately returning to its master's hand. Archer strapped his bow onto his back, and created another identical sword, the yin to the other's yang. Once again he threw the swords, forcing Ryder to dodge. He created another set, which astounded Ryder, and threw them at Ryder. The four swords twirled around Ryder like snakes striking at opportune moments. Ryder struggled dodging the swords. They had their own magnetic fields, and they revolved around her like she was the sun. She didn't expect Archer's advance come so soon when the servant of the bow retrieved one of his swords and used it to slash at her while she focused on evading the other flying blades. He went ahead and took another and positioned himself on the offensive because of the pressure he unleashed on Ryder. The woman, in an attempt to lose the homing swords, used her chains to smack the weapons away from her, allowing herself room to breathe. The flying set disappeared into the void, while the ones in Archer's hands were used in expert conjunction, slashing at any openings Ryder created while dodging. She threw one of her daggers to skewer Archer. Unfortunately, she marginally missed, and Archer grabbed the dagger for a return trip to Ryder's abdomen. She tilted her body away, and made the dagger impale the ground instead. She used her other dagger in hopes of getting a different outcome, but no such luck. Weaponless. Ryder used her chain to restrain Archer. She pulled out the dagger from the ground by whipping the chain at Archer. The orange servant raised his left arm to block it, but the weapon wrapped around it. Only then did Ryder realize her mistake. Archer tugged at the chain Ryder still held. 
her tight grip on the chain pulled her along, and allowed for Archer to reach her in close quarters combat. He stepped forward with his right foot and lowered his body into a squat. His right arm whipped forward, elbowing Ryder at her gut. The air around the impact surged outward like an explosion. Ryder's mouth gaped open as the air evacuated from her lungs. Archer pivoted his right arm up, making his fist hit her face. His left hand erupted in red lightning, crackling like a thousand birds. He thrust his left arm, the lightning would surely kill Ryder. The woman still held her chains, and the dagger around his left arm still wrapped around it tightly. In one last act of desperation, she pulled the chain to her left, effectively making Archer's aim redirect away from Ryder's abdomen. Archer stumbled whereas Ryder, whose chain restrains Archer's arm, recovered. My, my. How scary, Archer. Ryder said stoically, if I didn't know any better, you were trying to kill me. That's the point, Ryder. Archer snapped at Ryder, though I must say, I'm intrigued by your choice of armament. Daggers connected by chains, he mused slightly, lowering his guard. Hesitantly, Ryder lowered her guard as well, but only in appearance. She knew it would be foolish to follow her opponent's actions, but in the back of her mind, she knew Archer didn't entirely rendered himself defenseless. It's quite versatile. Daggers for offense, chains for defense or trapping, ingenious. You're quite the master with those weapons. I appreciate the compliment, but are you not satisfied with your weapons? Oh I'm satisfied. I just appreciate new weapons when I see it. Blame my lover for getting me into weapons. At least I'm restrained when it comes to seeing new weapons. She can't maintain her composure if she sees new toys to kill people. Archer seemed to look shocked at his words, not that she's a psycho or anything, but she is a weapons nut. He waved of his misunderstanding like an embarrassed teen. Ryder almost had a migraine trying to adjust to Archer's mood changes more potent than a pregnant woman. Ryder. What are you doing having a nice chat with Archer? Shinji's voice rang loud and clear inside Ryder's head. You are supposed to be killing him right now. Can you be any more of a disappointment of a servant? He berated the woman harshly. Hurry and kill him already. His guard is down. Do it. I'll say it just once, Ryder. Do not follow that, master, of yours. I've had my fun wasting time, you can leave, and continue this next time. If you choose to pursue this fight to the end, Shinji Matou. Your life will be forfeit, Archer called out to the Matu in hysteric fury. Shuru, who had his own problem to deal with, Tasaka and Saber, looked towards the direction of Archer's voice. He'd heard the initial explosion, but could not attend to the sound of battle because of a livid Tasaka. Anyways, said Matu fell on his butt at the threat and volume Archer used. Inwardly, he seethed. This is why he ordered Ryder to finish him off, and what's this about not following his orders? He's the real master of Ryder, not that schmuck sister of hers. Archer returned his attention to Ryder, so will you at least listen to my advice? I've met your true master lovely girl. I don't see why you have to follow his orders. Shinji holds the command spells. Therefore I follow his orders. Ryder answered. She started to follow Archer's advice, she completely ignored Shinji's berating as she said those words. Listen to me, Ryder. You will. Shinji would have finished his order, but Archer appeared next to him, and punched him with enough force to knock him down. When Shinji saw who punched him, he saw death personified. Archer's towering figure petrified him. He stared at Archer's visor, imagining his eyes that held nothing but disdain for him. You are not worthy, Matu. If you can't appreciate her skills as a servant, then you aren't worthy of being her, master, little Matu. He stepped on Shinji's chest with enough force to make the teen have difficulty breathing, I can't wait to see your death, fake master. Archer leaned forward, and gave the Matu his best angry look he could make. His foot pressed deeper into Shinji's chest, almost choking the teen. He clawed at Archer's legs as he tried gulping air. The servant frowned at the Matu master's incompetence, and stepped off Shinji, and kicked him away like a puppy. He rolled on the dirt several times before stopping on his back, you're not worth my time, so scram. Shinji followed Archer's order and scampered away. He crawled first, forgetting how to stand up, then sprinted away. Ryder had followed soon after. Archer. Rin shouted from behind. The servant recognized this type of voice, female wrath. Preparing for the worst, he returned his bow to its default form the sword, and returned it to its scabbard. 
His Dao swords disappeared into thin air, seconds before. However, Shuru couldn't help but gain interest over the blades. Rin's voice came to the attention of the men, what was that all about? Making an imposter saber like that, are you trying to kill your master? Archer sighed, it seemed whatever he did for fun would always end in this outcome. He wondered if there was a servant that was a famous ear doctor because he's sure that his hearing has declined from this. How he survived his years next to Sakura's powerful voice without his hearing diminishing was beyond his understanding. Seriously, I could have killed Shuru here had you not transformed in time. A second saber, how outrageous and impossible. I bet that there isn't even an eighth servant, and whoever did it only did it to put everyone on edge. She glared at Archer, not even giving the Emiya master a passing glance, and pinning the blame all on the servant. I did say some external force would interfere, didn't I? I just didn't say who or what would interfere specifically. Shuru perked up at the message, wait, you allowed for this to happen, Archer? How could you? Archer pointed to Rin, and answered, the same reason she attacked you, to see if you're at least capable in combat. Shuru had a face of shock, he didn't believe in his skills as a master then? Archer could see the doubt growing in his master's eyes, as a master, you need to be able to fight with magecraft. For you to hold on against her assault with only strengthening magic says a lot about your potential through the use of only mundane skills. I actually half expected myself to interfere earlier. If it wasn't for Ryder's assassination attempt, then I would have waited longer to intervene on Rin's test. Rin scowled. So there was a reason for Archer's interference. In other news, congratulations on surviving, Master. Shuru was too appalled by Archer's actions to properly respond. How could Archer let that happen? Archer said that he'd protect his master, him, that he wouldn't let anyone kill him. So why? That stupid reason wasn't enough for him. He wanted a proper answer. Why? He asked his servant. Shire revealed his thoughts, and as such, his emotions flowed out as well. Why would you go through with this? His frustrations and anger got the best of Shuru, and it was quite loud. However, Archer did not flinch. Because I believed that you could live, Archer answered casually, I'm only here until the end of the war. I won't be here forever. I can't spoil you because once I'm gone, you'll be weak without any form of combat magecraft to keep you safe. So to see where you're currently at in skill allows me to teach you in a specialized form of magecraft. Tracing. He opened his right palm, and created the same Yang Dao sword. Shuru noted that the name of Archer's magecraft resembled his style of reinforcement magic. Specialized? Rin asked, I've never heard of such a thing before. That's because one of my friends taught it to me, it's a valuable offensive skill. Archer grinned devilishly. He made the weapon disappear from his hands, and traced a sword only Saber would be able to recognize. The ornate gold and blue on the ceremonial sword tipped Saber to the true extent of Archer's capabilities. She dispelled invisible air, revealing her sword to Archer and everyone else. She raised the point to Archer's chin and he eyes told the whole story. Archer casually moved the blade away, I understand, Saber. Both stepped away from each other, and Rin did so too. Shuru looked dumbfounded. What did Archer understand? The breeze that came from clashing swords answered Shuru's question perfectly. Sparks flew as both servants made their blades clash with superhuman strength behind the slashes they make. Metal ground against metal, scraping as each went on to do another clash. Shuru noticed that neither servant deviated from the slash pattern. There were no feints, parries, or such. They were testing the durability of Archer's sword. If Saber's sword is her noble phantasm, and Archer has a copy, then it's only common sense to check its authenticity with a durability test against the original. Saber swung as hard as she could to reciprocate the exact amount of force Archer used, or was it the other way around? Either way, their final clash ended the spar in a deadlock. Does that answer your question Saber? Archer asked. H how? Saber stammered. How do you have an authentic Caliburn, Archer? What sorcery is this? That, Saber Chan, is a secret you have to discover on your own. Archer answered calmly. He turned to his master. It's best we leave now, master. The commotion has surely brought the attention of Assassin and Caster. Shuru raised his eyebrows. His servant already knows other servants are watching him. I apologizing making you raise your blade against me, Saber. If anyone had suspicions about your identity, I just revealed it. 
I needed to show you why this skill is invaluable. He bowed slightly. I don't get it, Archer. Shuru said out loud, What's so invaluable about your magecraft? He scratched his head, wondering why it's so special. Archer can copy not only regular swords, but noble phantasms, it seems. Saber answered angrily, How despicable of you, Archer. You ignore the principles of chivalry, and copy your opponent's weapon using its image against its owner. She raised her sword once more, You have no right to hold Caliburn. Archer imperceptibly glanced at the rooftop, where the saber is known during his life stood quietly. You have no true qualities of a leader. Saber accused. You're more attuned to a court jester than honorable knight. Her words don't faze the towering archer at all. Are you quite done, Saber? Archer asked. If so, then riddle me this. If Caliburn only allows those capable to lead to wield it, then what does that make me? He silenced himself to hear an answer, yet there were none to be heard of. No answer? Then it seems I've been promoted to king, Saber. Enough, Archer. I cannot accept you as a fellow wielder of Caliburn. So you wish to engage me in combat? Archer asked incredulously. I may be a jester, Saber, but I am an able fighter and capable leader. I am capable of discussing tactics, and have made difficult decisions all leaders eventually face. Those decisions paved the way to allow me to use Caliburn. Archer's voice steadily increased in volume and anger. You depreciating my abilities to wield this holy sword is an insult to my skills. So once again, do you wish to engage me in combat? Ye, you won't, Saber. We're allies, we won't fight each other, Rin answered, yet. Shuru stepped in between, putting his hands on the servant's breastplates and kept the two away from the other. He had to admit today would be the strangest one he'd ever experience. He saw Fujine act like a high school girl, he was chased after by Rin, and now this, he wanted to go home already to process the whole thing from the night before. Too much happened too quick, and it went in the same pace as Archer's mood swings. Okay, okay, we don't need more violence right now. Shuru said to the group, just look at the place, it's ransacked. Just how will this get covered up? He looked to Archer, who rubbed his head sheepishly for causing most of the destruction. Who could blame him? A servant battle is always intense. Rarely will there ever be a lack of environmental carnage on a battlefield occupied by servants. A plane would be filled with craters or torched, a mountain would most likely lose a huge chunk of its side, a city would no doubt lose a building or two or maybe the whole city if it came to that point. Shire trained his eyes on Rin, Tasaka, is there any way we can clean this up? I can call Kire. Rin answered, it's the church's job to cover these things up so that the war is kept out of the public's knowledge. Shuru didn't like the answer, but it was sufficient for the moment. He wouldn't like to admit it but something felt off about the clergyman. Archer noticed his master's change in expression at that moment, but chose to not sat his curiosity. That's good enough for now, Shuru answered, now, if we're going to be allies, we can't be at each other's throats. Saber lowered her gaze, ashamed because of how she lashed out. The Emiya master turned to his servant, Archer, you have to be more mindful about how you act around women. The man clutched his chest as if he was in pain. You really know how to push their buttons, and I don't want you to perish because you incurred their wrath upon you. He set his eyes on Saber, as for you, Saber, you must learn to be respectful and not impose your beliefs on someone. Saber was about to retort when Shuru continued, Archer may look like a knight, but the things he carried are something far more advanced than what we currently have. And judging by the fact that he has a bunch of skills to use means that he's only donned the look of a knight. Absolutely. Archer answered. The only reason I look like a knight is because I first learned how to use a sword from a knight. I wanted to follow in her footsteps, so I abandoned my previous way of life to live a life of a knight. Saber noted what Archer said about a female knight teaching him, and let him continue his spiel, if Shuru had summoned a version of me where I was dedicated to the code of chivalry, we would possibly get along better, Saber. But alas, as of now, that won't happen. Now why am I acting like a disgraceful knight? Well. My friend had knocked some sense into me and told me that I shouldn't borrow ideals. He told me to live my own life my own way. In conclusion, I adopted aspects of chivalry in my life, and returned to my life as a warrior of my village as one of the many swords under my village leader's command. So, but enough about me, Archer said, King of Knights, to answer your question about why I have your sword. I'll give a hint. Second magic. 
I'll leave it to Tasaka san to interpret whatever that means. He grabbed his master by the collar of his shirt, let's go, master. I've lots to teach you, and we can't afford to waste a minute. He jumped away with his master in tow. I'll see you tomorrow, you too. He said his farewell, and the two blurred away in the horizon. Atop the roof of the school, Saber left as stealthily as she could. She left in time before Rin's Saber took the time to look at the spot where she stood. What is it, Saber? Nothing, Master. That's so. Rin wondered what Saber noticed, but didn't pursue the conversation. If that is all, let's go home. We shall do research and try to identify this night wannabe. Saber nodded. Archer was a disgrace, a stain on the history of all knights. She will find his heretic identity and strike him down without any hesitation at all. The two left the battlefield and headed for the main entrance. The Tasaka immediately stopped when she heard footsteps behind her. She turned around as she heard an accented voice speak to her. Tasaka san? What brings you out here so late? I could say the same to you, Edelfelt san. Rin retorted, I wasted my time studying in the library. Oh, I thought I heard Emiya san nearby. Did he leave? Her voice had a hint of worry. Why Rin was bothered by this, she didn't know. I was told to give his writing portfolio to him for reflection. Writing portfolio? Yes. Fujimura san requested me to give it to him because she had misplaced his portfolio. Edelfeld explained. So is he nearby? Rin shook her head, making the blonde transfer student frown. Can you at least tell me where he lives? I don't know. Rin answered. Shouldn't you have asked for that when she gave you the request? A logical question for a logical woman. Sadly, Fujimura isn't like that. Far too energetic, she wouldn't be able to stay in one place for too long. The thought must have passed over the woman when handing out the request to the student before her. Hours later, at the Emiya residence, Archer received a hefty scolding from Saber. The blue clad king of knights had him sit on his legs, place his hands on his lap, and stare at the wall behind her. They were discussing about Archer's decision to reveal his origins, or at least a fractional portion of it. Obviously, Saber wasn't too fond of the idea. Shire found the scene laughable because the giant archer was being scolded that the relatively petite Saber in dojo clothing like a master would. She even stabbed a shanai the same way Taiga would when in lecture mode. What do you have to say for yourself, Archer? Saber growled. It isn't enough. Archer answered. They won't figure out my name from that vague of an anecdote. All they know is that in one aspect of my life, I was a knight at one point. And while they may look at the famous knights of both history and literature, they won't find my name there. His voice didn't waver. He knew what he was talking about, and Saber knew this as well. There isn't enough information. They will never find out my name from that at all. Then what will give away your identity? Archer, Shuru asked. Your occupation? Possibly. Yes. Archer admitted, you wouldn't think a shinobi could become a knight, right? Shuru's eyes widened. His servant was an assassin in the feudal era? Could that actually be possible? He read that medieval Europe hadn't advanced in naval technology to even reach Japanese shores. By the time Europeans actually reached the Far East, the medieval era died. Archer saw the calculating look in Shuru's eyes as the latter tried deciphering his origins. A laughable attempt, but, as I said, master, you won't find any information about me. Then what land's hero are you? Shuru insisted on finding out what he could. Now, now, shouldn't you ask me on a date first before getting to know my more personal story? Archer joked lamely. Saber sighed and lowered her head in shame. Shuru blushed at the word, date, and had images of women he thought were attractive invade his mind. Sadly, his blush was seen by his servants. To Archer in particular, this meant extra ammunition, oh, don't tell me you actually play for the other team, master? It seems I must stay vigilant about where you place your hands on me. His mischievous sneer terrified Shuru, but the fact that he was being implied as gay was another thing, he won't take that insult. I like girls, Archer. Sue so or you do, I don't have to take your immaturity, Archer. Shuru yelled, how are we compatible if you're this childish? Saber had to agree. How did they become compatible? They act nothing alike, nor are they in the same mindset. The only thing remotely close to similar is the fact that their magecraft is the same, and their ideals will be something they cherish. Hmm, that actually could be the answer to that. Ideals are something Shuru clung to in her reality. 
I don't know the answer, but something between us has to be similar. Archer replied, not even insulted by Shuru's words. But anyways, back to the point. Shuru dreaded this. He could feel it. Archer was concocting some rather strange way to humiliate him. He just hoped it wasn't too humiliating. Prove your masculinity and uality. How about you ask the next girl that knocks on your door to a date? What? I can't do that. Shuru stammered nervously. There's a procedure to this. You can just force th. Be quiet, virgin. Archer commented. If you actually want to get a girl, take the initiative. He emphasized his point by slamming his fist on the floor. That Matu Kohai of yours has taken a liking to you, master. And it's a very big amount of liking, she's just afraid of overstepping her boundaries. Why not ask her? Archer suggested. Sakura? No 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 no. Not Sakura. Sakura wouldn't be caught dead being next to him in public at all. He doesn't deserve her. And what's this about her liking him? Shuru smelled BS of the nth degree. Archer's just playing another game with him. She's soft spoken, easy to talk to, she's familiar, and she won't physically abuse you. Oh? So he has experiencing a woman's fury? No surprise there, he just loves pissing women off. No, come on. If you don't do this, I will be inclined to take measures to protect my posterior, master. RGH, I told you I'm not gay, Shire shouted. If you were gay, that'd be okay. Archer said soothingly, cuz hey, I like you anyway. Shuru hoped it wasn't in the gay way, because you see, if it were me, I would feel free to say that I was gay, but I'm not gay, did he just? Did you just quote a song? And immediately translate it into Japanese? A nod, this really isn't helping your case, Archer? Hey, either you die alone, or in the hands of your lover, SSS. Oh don't you start with that harem end you keep talking about. Saber looked at Archer. He was hooking her up. With another reality of Shuru to boot. And with a harem end. Really? Clearly, Archer was having way too much fun with this. He needed to be stopped. I don't need the, nice boat, flag to trigger, Archer. But it's fun. Archer cheered. Shuru scowled. Saber slammed her head on a wall. Archer really was better off as a knight. This version of Archer isn't just meant for any master to handle without blowing a gasket in their heads. Lighten up, master. Shuru clearly didn't, no, I won't do it. He turned his back on him and crossed his arms like a spoiled kid. Or a disappointed father. Either way, he doesn't want to do Archer's suggestion. Chicken. Oh no, not this. Did he really just go there? He actually stooped that low. My goodness he did. Shuru palmed his face with both hands, unable to fathom Archer's immaturity. Where did that seriousness all go? Shuru asked himself. He actually looked cool in his fights and when debating against Rin's saber. Why does he become like thieves? Archer did clucking noises behind him, followed by Saber's head slamming on the wall repeatedly. It seems Saber's lecture was a moot point. How did they even get to this point? Archer's clucking became louder, and louder, and more obnoxious. Rank B obnoxiousness is working its magic. Why was that even a personal skill? All right, I'll do it. He finally said in order to shut Archer's mouth, in rather extremely coincidental timing, the doorbell rung. Archer gave a knowing look that Shuru detested. Reluctantly, Shuru headed for the door to seal his fate. When he reached and opened his door, he saw Sakura in front of him. Silently thanking any god for it not being another guy, a random girl, or worse, Fujine, he gulped and said, Good evening, Sakura. Good evening, Senpei. Sakura greeted back, Um, Sakura? Shuru was getting quite uncomfortable with this. In the back of his mind, he knew Archer was keeping his eyes glued to this, so he won't get out of this situation at all. Just his luck that he has to do this. Shuru scratched the back of his neck as he asked, W would you like to go on a, 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 a date with me this s Sunday? Archer slapped his face. Shuru totally butchered it, but this girl likes him, so it won't actually affect the outcome at all, which is. I'd be happy to, senpei. Shuru looked stunned. Archer was actually right. Sakura wasn't pulling his leg at all. She's glad to be asked out on a date. The Emiya master took quite a while to process this. Good evening, Shuru. Fuji Nei shouted seconds before reaching the door. Oh God. Fuji Nei. 
Shuru shuddered at the idea of him asking out Fujine. Oh, Shuru, I can't do that we're teacher and student. Besides, we're like siblings, it's almost criminal to do this? Wait, where he get that idea? He shouldn't be thinking about this at all. But if you insist, we can always keep this a secret. Fujine's voice seemed extremely aruno. He should not be thinking about this at all. What's making him visualize these? Oh, sure, not there. Okay, that is way past fine. Behind him, Archer worked his magic, imposing less than moral images into Shuru's mind, corrupting him, making him a harem master. In the background, we see Saber Choke slamming Archer into the dojo. Choke hold Archer, German suplex Archer, back break Archer, and all other sorts of wrestling moves a knight like her shouldn't even know how to do. If one were to listen, he or she would hear bones cracking under strenuous pressure. None of it sounded like the general knuckle popping but it did sound like dislocation and intolerable suffering. Archer's screams of pain and Tortius' distress helped that idea stick. Oh! Saber with the full Nelson and she joins it with a wrist lock. Bones strain under the pressure and pop like bubble wrap. Ah! Saber nay! Stop! WHO taught you these moves A N Y W A H A H A A Y? He'll be fine. Hopefully. Oh god, that's not supposed to bend that way. Hopefully. Dinner was an awkward experience for Shuru and Sakura. They averted their gaze whenever they made eye contact with each other. Saber held Archer at chopstick point, never heard of that eh? While Archer himself soothed his shoulders and neck to lessen the discomfort of eating. At least he survived Saber's grapples, that's all that mattered. Where did she even learn those moves? Meanwhile, Saber silently thanked her slight interest in wrestling to subdue Archer. She remembered the time when she saw a match after the war in her reality and during Carnival Phantasm. With some difficulty using the computer, she somehow reached a point where she saw grappling techniques and emulated them from the pictures shown in underscore pedia. She never thought she'd see the day where she would actually use those techniques to the full extent on her surrogate brother of all people. Taiga had fun teasing the already embarrassed Shuru when she found out he just asked Sakura on a date. She would nudge him every chance she could just to make him flustered even more. Just then, the doorbell rang. In order to eliminate himself from more embarrassment, Shuru ran for the door. He didn't expect to see who would be ringing his doorbell at all. Archer sensed Rin's saber outside the residence as well as another servant, possibly assassin, lurking somewhere in the shadows. He discreetly told the saber in the house to hide. Saber gave a quick excuse to use the bathroom and left the table. Eh. T Tasaka San. Edelfelt San. What are you two doing here? Ah, the stress of managing a harem, always a struggle. Do you know how long we've been trying to find your house? Rin asked. Too long, that's what. I've wasted my time and effort to help Edelfelt San get you your writing portfolio back to you for your reflection work. She and the blonde transfer student looked exhausted to say the least. With the effort they've done to look for his house, he should at least offer them dinner. Do you two want some dinner for your troubles? Shuru offered nervously. Only then he saw the ratio of man to woman slowly rise to the opposite gender's side. Both women nodded exasperatedly. We better get some compensation for doing you a favor, Emiya. The boy cringed at Rin's harsh tone. Really now? She crossed her arms. Not satisfied by wasting her time with this. She promised Saber to help figure out Archer's identity but she somehow got wrangled up in this mundane task of finding Shuru's house. I apologize for Tasaka-san's attitude, Shuro-san. Luviegali to Edelfelt, the transfer student, answered while bowing to ask for forgiveness, it has been a taxing day searching for your residence. Shuru waved it off, completely understanding the circumstances of Rin's attitude. Inevitably, two new additions came inside the house. Taiga and Sakura looked shocked to see the newcomers. Shuru explained the situation, and Taiga repeatedly apologized to Lovia. Lovia bowed first, thank you for your hospitality, Shuro-san. She expressed her glee with a glorious smile. Rin followed suit, but with reluctance. Right then and there, the Tasaka master noticed Archer sitting from across the table. She was surprised to see him not being obnoxious at all. She thought it had to be one of his tricks. She heard Taiga speak, hey, hey, Tasaka-san. You're friends with Sakura-san, right? She nodded, well guess what? 
Shuru here asked her to go out with him on Sunday. Rin was happy Sakura got the guy she liked, Lovia frowned at that. It seems she had competition. She stared at Sakura's gleeful face, which underneath of it all, her mind jumped for joy, and the darker parts of her mind wanted Shuru all for herself. Taiga jumped to another topic as she introduced Archer, oh, to Sokka-san, Edelfelt-san, this is Mr. Gunther, an Englishman who's trying to be a teacher at Homurahara. Rin stared at the so-called Mr. Gunther as he lowered his cup of tea. He gave a smile that somehow affected both women. Rin scanned Archer over some more and saw something rather peculiar. Hidden skill charisma. B+, plus. he has charisma? Rin questioned, unable to believe her eyes. This moron has charisma? Just what hero was he? Archer saw Rin's expression of confusion, and he was mildly amused by it all. Stealing her emotions, Rin greeted Archer's persona, Nice to meet you, Mr. Gunther. Her English was perfect. Archer could see that, but it still had that slight accent in there. How long have you been here in Fuyuki City? Not long, Tasaka-san. Eric answered. I've been here for about a week or so for vacation until I met Emma Yakun and tutored him in English. Fujimura-san wasn't happy about me taking her job initially, but instead, she suggested the idea that I become a teacher in your academy. Rin questioned whether that was actually true or not, but for the sake of keeping Fujimura alive, she would have to play along to Archer's alibi. While not favorable, the risk was too high if a non-Magus found out about the war. Oh really? Lovia stepped into the conversation. That's an interesting story you have there, Mr. Gunther. When will you be taking your job interview? Oh, that hasn't been decided yet. I have to receive my credentials from my mother's house. I was on vacation, and I wasn't really planning on teaching until my vacation was over. Give or take a month, I might be able to get a job interview within two weeks. I see, oh, Mr. Gunther, is your sister okay? Taiga questioned. Now that she mentioned it, she had gone and stayed in the bathroom for too long. He needed an alibi quick. She's been in the restroom for quite a while. Eric stood up and bowed while asking to be excused to check up on his sister. He has a sister? Oh yes. Taiga answered. She the older one to boot, but she's so short compared to Mr. Gunther. She's even a kendo practitioner with skills equal to mine. Rin leaned forward. A sister of Archer can beat Fujimura in kendo? Most interesting indeed. And if this sister is related to Archer, then it just means that there's an actual eighth servant, and it had to be that blue saber she saw today. However, she can't come to conclusions quickly. This might be one of his tricks again, and he cloned himself and somehow changed his appearance to portray a sister. That had to be the other logical reason for Archer to have a sister. Moments later, Archer turned to the room. Emma Yakun. May I request that you make some porridge? It seems Clarice has caught a fever. Shuru scrambled from his seat. The young master actually thought his servant was sick until he saw Archer give an unnoticeable wink to the boy. He recomposed himself and nodded to his servant. He took to the kitchen and retrieved the necessary ingredients to make porridge. Sakura came to his aid, if only to speed up the process. Will your sister be fine? Lovia asked the man. He nodded, she'll be fine. She always comes back full force when the illness is gone, but I'm only doing this to give her a little push. Every little bit help after all. The blonde woman couldn't agree more. She stood up and bowed to Emiya, once again, I appreciate your hospitality, Shuro-kun. I have overstayed my welcome as has Tasaka-san. We shall take our leave now. I bid your sister a good recovery, Mr. Gunther. She grabbed Rin's arm, who gave much protest, and dragged her away. Bye, bye. Tasaka san Edel felt san Taiga waved the two as they exited the room, and eventually the house. Archer stared at Lovia's right, there was nothing to see. However, he felt the presence of a servant. Someone infiltrated the house? No doubt about it, assassin. Only a shinobi, barring those I allow, will gain access through the bounded fields protecting the Emiya residence. So is this servant summoned from my time? He released a pulse of chakra so faint only he would notice. He made his chakra react to another servant, allowing a certain point in his circle of chakra to bounce back to him like a radar. The servant was right next to Edelfelt. He had to thank Pervy Sage for keeping him on chakra control exercises because his control had been refined to be as sharp as a paper's edge. While not an easy task, it was rewarding as shown right now. 
I must move my plans up, he decided. My interference has hastened the pace of this war. If it's like that, then I'll just have to be faster. 10 at night, Archer left the Emiya residence of his own volition. He ordered Saber to keep an eye out for Shuru, he explained to her that his plans need to move forward. And to do so, he had to meet the Einsburn master. His clones had scouted the whole of Fuyuki city within the hour, yet there was no sign of the Einsburn's home. If she isn't in the city, she had to be secluded elsewhere. The clone that searched the forest encountered resistance, his clone was impaled. He thought it was Lancer, but it couldn't be it. It was a woman, and no one else but Shuru summoned another servant. He pulled out his sword and let it change into its motorcycle form. He revved it a few times before driving into the night. He sped past other cars on the road, ignored all the rules of the road, almost made pedestrians roadkill while driving to the forest. He was almost caught by the police. When he reached the forest's edge, he expertly dodged the trees blocking his way. His reflexes honed by countless sessions of dodge this while riding your bike certainly helped in this case as well. He seamlessly turned when needed, hitting the apex of each turn. His bumpy ride to his destination did not stop him from enjoying the breeze running around him. He drove some more until he saw a lake clearing meters away. Revving his bike even more, Archer rode his vehicle over the water's surface like it was another patch of road. When he crossed the lake's boundary, he hit a boundary field's border and passed through. He popped open the coffin in the back, and took out the sword inside it. He felt it, he'll be under attack soon. He wondered if it will be that woman that killed his clone or his target. Once he saw the hulking mass that is Ilya's servant swing his weapon at him while inside the forest, he knew he answer. He leaned forward to be as lateral as possible to dodge Berserker's strike. His sword slashed at Berserker's side, cutting a visible, but not so deep gash. Archer proceeded to search for Ilya to talk things out. Sadly, Berserker kept getting in the way. Archer's constant maneuvers weren't enough to escape the servant's pursuit. Berserker jumped in the air and was about to slam his sword on top of Archer's head. Not enough time to dodge, he changed the bike into its broadsword form. He grabbed its handle with one hand and gripped a gap in the metal to pull the handle out, allowing the edge of his weapon to reveal a set of teeth found only in chainsaws. He pressed the trigger on the handle, and the sword revved as it met Berserker's weapon. Sparks flew as Archer's weapon tried to cut through his enemies. Metal screeched an unholy sound as both servants battled for dominance. Archer briefly won, and used it to push Berserker off him. He backed away, landing a few meters away from Berserker. You would come to take my master's life in her domain? How foolish are you to think you would be able to succeed in doing such a thing, Archer? Berserker's lucid words do not shock Archer one bit. And he could hardly care less if his plans seemed foolish. Many people had called him that already. And in turn, he did the impossible. I am my master's shield and sword, her sentry. You shall not pass, despicable Archer. Oh, and what's so despicable about me in your eyes? Archer asked while stabbing his weapon into the ground. I already heard from Saber about how I don't necessarily follow the code of chivalry. Now what about you? You would kill a master to win. Berserker simply answered. And that's where you're sadly mistaken, demigod. Archer said to the towering servant. I'm here to propose an idea. Berserker took a fighting stance, his sword just beside him ready to slash at Archer at a moment's notice. Archer himself took a prepared stance if anything went wrong. You would come here to propose an idea with sword drawn, Archer? Well either I die, or I defend myself. Archer shrugged his shoulders. Besides, shouldn't you be worrying about assassin? Assassin? What does he have to do with this? He followed me. Am I right in assuming that? Counter Guardian Teme. He looked to the sky with his voice spreading out to the trees. Hidden in the leaves, assassin perched himself on a branch. Archer knew his position, but Berserker could not. Hey. A fellow shinobi can only found by a fellow shinobi. Aliyah put you up to the task too? Why should I tell you? Archer took that as a yes, you seem to have the situation under control, heroic spirit user Tonkachi. Assassin's voice echoed among the trees, and Berserker couldn't identify his position anywhere. It angered the servant because presence concealment was a taxing thing to defuse. Archer snickered at his derogatory name. It brought out memories of a naive past. Assassin continued to speak, 
My master has gone and told me to retreat because I've been found out. Don't get rusty now. I've got a rematch to settle with you. His presence disappeared from battle, letting the two servants return to their original conversation. A friend of yours, Archer, rival, Archer answered. We had a major falling out. Darn nearly killed me several times. I see. Berserker relaxed. If I were to allow you to meet with my master, would you lower your weapon? Archer nodded and took his broadsword into its default saber form, returning it to its sheath. He raised his hands to show his willingness. Berserker deemed Archer as less of a threat and beckoned the servant to follow him. Minutes later, why didn't you kill him, Berserker? Ilya's voice boomed in contrast to her tiny body. The homunculus Einsburn ordered, strike him down now. Archer raised his hands to interrupt the girl. Hey, hey I just came to tell you that the lesser grail is corrupted. What blasphemy are you talking about, Archer? I'm the lesser grail's vessel, I'm sure I would know if I was corrupted or not. Angra mine you, all the world's evil, resides in the lesser grail's true form. I cannot allow you to turn into the grail at all. Iliasville von Einsburn. Elia, the will of mankind, designated me with the mission to destroy the corrupt grail inside the lesser grail. Which means I would have to kill you. Berserker took a swing at Archer, who easily sidestepped out of the weapon's way. I don't want to kill you. Fortunately, there's a loophole. You won't turn into the grail unless you're defeated and when all servants but one are remaining, right? So until then, I want to help protect you. He kneeled to the girl like a knight to his king. That is my proposition, Einsburn. Will you accept or not? Ilya did not answer for quite some time. This servant wanted to protect her? It's as believable as Gilgamesh actually being generous. The fact that an enemy servant would also lend her a helping hand disgusted her to no end. She wouldn't accept his offer, and said, I'll accept your offer, when you die. Kill him berserker. Her servant charged, swinging his weapon at Archer. He didn't dodge but grasped the blade with both hands. He should have at least budged a meter or so, yet he stood still, holding on to Berserker's sword. It seems negotiations have failed. Archer said solemnly, before the night ends, let me at least entertain you with the loss of several lives Berserker still has in stock. Illy scoffed, not taking Archer's threat seriously. She heard a piece of metal clank on the floor. Upon closer inspection, it was Archer's visor. The servant of the bow looked up, and both Berserker and Ilya saw the piercing blood-colored eyes Archer bore. And even more, Ilya saw a skill activated as well. Are you ready, demigod, Einzaburn? Archer asked with a slight distortion in his voice. It sounded demonic, yet clear enough to understand. The prana Archer released looked like blue flames either seeping in or exploding out of Archer. Soon, the color changed into a warmer color. First it turned yellow, then a fiery orange then ultimately changed to a hellish red. Archer's coat changed color to imitate the scheme of his prana. The blood-red coat and the mild battle-lusting face of Archer almost made him look like a blood knight. He madly grinned from ear to ear. I am the bone of my sword, Berserker raised his weapon, blocking the punch aimed for his face. He looked to see the grinning face of Archer took a malicious version, as his punch created an explosion powerful enough to push Berserker away and drag his feet across the floor. The massive servant retaliated by meeting Archer's charge. Archer saw the swing and lowered his left fist while his body learned forward to keep him low to the ground as well. At the right time, he rocketed his fist up, parrying Berserker's blade upwards with enough power to disrupt Berserker's posture. Archer sprinted forwards with his forearms covering his torso like a boxer. Berserker recovered rather quickly and brought his weapon down, forcing Archer to spin clockwise while moving to the right. The blade totally missed its mark, making a small trench on the floor of the Einsburn mansion. Archer dragged his right foot back and leaned on it. He sprung from his right foot, and twisted his torso to redirect that energy towards the back muscles. His right arm moves outwards to punch, the energy moving up from the body to the arm. Steel is my body and fire is my blood, Archer reinforced his arm, gathered prana at his fist, and added chakra into the mix. The arm reached closer and closer to Berserker's unguarded side, and made contact. The punch itself made Berserker wince at the attack, but like the first punch, it had that second function to explode. The area Archer punched created a magic circle, and all the energies he used became infused inside the circle of power. 
Like a cannon shooting its ammunition, Archer's arm recoiled back as the explosion erupts, tearing Berserker's side as if a cannon actually shot the servant. Archer returned to his boxing stance, his right gauntlet slightly steaming before cooling down. He jumped towards Berserker's head and this time used his left arm to do the same thing, effectively decimating the servant's head. He used Berserker's chest as a platform to jump up, then punch Berserker's already dead body. The explosion incinerated any skin or launched chunks of Berserker's body. I am tempered steel forged in fire archer made a set of hand signs, and the air around him twisted around. Wind and water revolved around him, turning into a dome of turbulent storms. Red lightning arched past the dome, electrifying anything it touches, even the recovering remains of Berserker's body. Archer created a vortex in which objects gravitate towards him. Ilya was forced to cling to a handrail to keep herself standing. After half a minute, Archer released the technique, and blasted everything away with a wall of wind. And blessed by water, Berserker's recovery looked disgusting. His chunks rolled towards the torso with a gaping hole. Blood came to life and snaked its way to its body. A black fog covered the gruesome recovery, but it did not mute the squelching that came about. Archer changed his gauntlets into a lance, its onyx shaded blade, shaped like a kite, took almost three fourths of the length. The rest of the length was for the black leather wrapped handle. On the blade itself, a Roman numeral three glowed gold underneath a crimson omega symbol. The omega symbol grew larger, ending at the points, where the lance's kite shape tapers towards the handle, and sprouted a sort of guard in the shape of the omega symbol. Berserker's body squirmed as he formed his face. Archer could see the eyeball slowly form as well at the blood vessels behind it and on his cheeks. Skin covered that layer, finally completely recovering from Archer's attack. Quite the fearsome blow, Archer. Berserker commented. Archer slightly nodded, accepting his compliment. Berserker continued. Will you finish the invocation of your aria, Archer? The Red Knight agreed, and resumed it. Unknown to the chaos of battle, both servants closed in on each other. Archer twirling his weapon whereas Berserker dragged his weapon across the floor, breaking apart under the sword's serrated edge. Archer twirled his lance down. In contrast, Berserker swung up. Both of the large weapons met in a resounding clash. Sparks flew off the clashing metal, and both struggled for dominance. Archer let go by raising his lance while turning right. He gripped the handle like he would a sword, and nearly bisected Berserker's gut. However, Berserker expected it, and backed away. Nor to the placidity of peace, Archer stabbed his lance into the ground. His eyes closed as he focused on his aria. Berserker took no chance in letting the enemy finished, and charge. He swung his sword horizontally in order to attempt bisecting Archer as payback. I stand here as the unprovoked vanguard to protect. Archer lifted his lance off the ground, and twirled it up, raising Berserker's weapon as well. With one hand, Archer thrust a berserker multiple times to impale the large servant. The skilled demigod blocked the attacks, and was surprised to see Archer's attacks pushed him inches backwards. Berserker parried, making Archer improvise the next strike as a diagonal slash that only struck ground. He pulled the lance back, only to thrust it back at berserker once again. To safeguard those precious to me, the lance's Roman numeral three glowed brighter and moved above the omega symbol. The lance split into a trident like lance, cutting through the air. Berserker's sword met the lance at the one of the gaps. Berserker twisted his blade at the handle, forcing Archer's grip on his weapon to loosen. Archer grabbed the shaft once Berserker stopped twisting his weapon. The knight pulled back, twirling the trident behind him. In that moment, he let the weapon revert to its default form, hiding itself from Berserker's eyes. He also used invisible air to conceal the blade as he went to stab Berserker's gut. The squelching sound of a body being pierced by a sword came with Archer's shout, Strike Air. Invisible air contorted like a storm, turbulent winds unveiled Archer's sword, and blasted out like a tornado, tearing Berserker's torso off by the waist. Berserker's body lay in two on the polished and also demolished marble floor of the mansion. Archer returned to a relaxed state sheathed his sword and calmly retrieved his visor. Berserker's recovering body filled the silence between Archer and Ilya. Oju-san. Archer called, stopping his aria before the end, his back facing the homunculus while refitting his visor on, I really do wish to help you. 
If you bear hatred towards my master, let go of it. Kuritsugu Emiya loved you so much, wanted to take you with him, but your grandfather wouldn't let him take you away from the Einsburn home. Your status as the lesser grail was something he cherished unlike your father, who wanted his daughter. Your baseless revenge will only hurt the only true family you have left. If my Arya hasn't said it, I vow to protect those precious. My master by contract and by companionship is someone precious, and seeing as you're his elder half-sister, that extends to you as well. I will protect you unconditionally, Oju-san. And I never go back on my word, believe it. He disappeared into flames, and left the battle-torn mansion. Only then did Berserker finish recovering. The humongous servant went closer and kneeled to his master. Shall I pursue, master? No you've lost several more lives to Archer. We have to let you recover. Five lives means if each of these servants has an erranked noble phantasm and strikes you down with it, you will die. Ilya answered, stating truth, we must let you recover. As you wish, master. Berserker relented. He then started on another related topic, do you believe what he's saying, master? Those employed by Elia are said to protect humanity from calamity and extinction of the human race. However, in an earlier conversation, Assassin identified Archer as a heroic spirit. A situation most interesting since Elia only employs its guardians rather than ask for the help of a heroic spirit. If the grail is indeed corrupted, then you have to keep yourself safe at all times. Ilya nodded in understanding, yet could not feel the taint she's supposed to feel, though her mind focused on the word, family, Shuru Emiya was indeed family, but also a scapegoat to her suffering. This archer knew far more than the usual servants are supposed to know. He knew so much it terrified her. Just who are you, archer? She kept in the back of her mind the abilities he displayed so far. That damnable transforming sword wasn't something found in recorded history. If so, then who could archer be? That weapon is surely no doubt a noble phantasm capable of killing berserker. But how many forms does it take? She saw five, and since his class is archer, it must turn into a bow. Six so far. She wondered how much more forms it has while heading to her mansion's library to research Archer's identity. Did you have fun wrecking Berserker, Archer? Assassin asked. Both Archer and Assassin were taking a drink of sake on top of the bridge connecting Fuyuki City to the next town over. They admired the horizon the moon reflected. Night life looked quite calm, far more so than their timeline. I could feel the prana you unleashed almost reach the city, and you were in the middle of the forest. First, yes. Second, I wanted to protect the vessel. Archer replied. The answer stupefied Assassin. While Elia said to destroy the Grail, I can protect her at least until the end. And suffer the wrath of disobeying Elia's will? I'm a heroic spirit first and foremost. Elia simply asked me to destroy the Grail. I'm no counter guardian, nor am I allowing myself to just follow its orders like a dog. Archer replied seriously. It didn't say how or when or even if I can just destroy the location where the Greater Grail will be summoned. Just destroy. Frankly, I can hardly justify myself in killing an innocent that'll be the trigger of the apocalypse. It also doesn't make sense. If she doesn't feel the corruption, then who holds its taint? Who made another lesser Grail that holds the corruption? Assassin sighed, fully knowing Archer's habits and behavior. He placed his cup of sake on the metal girder they sat on and remembered how good-natured the man next to him was. The selfless idiot that would save his precious ones, even his own flawed rival to the point of death. I see the flaw in Elia's words. Assassin remarked, all Elia ordered me to do was to eliminate major threats that pop. Even then, Elia didn't say who to eliminate. Archer leaned back, placing a hand on the girder to support himself. The blonde had an idea who the threats Elia might be speaking of but the reality his servant Archer had came from wasn't like this new one. His existence rewrites things, most likely, however, he can attempt to make the perceived reality stay on the rails for a while longer before the whole war's events change. I can't help you there, assassin, Archer said sadly. But if Elia is ordering you to kill masterminds, it might not be so bad. We are assassins by occupation. Assassin snorted. While Archer had the skills to be an assassin, he could hardly identify Archer as an assassin. Due to the teachings Archer's servants gave, he was only a warrior with a myriad of skills at his beck and call. A combat pragmatist, a fighter that will use anything to win. 
Even if he were to use his skills to kill discreetly, Archer will always favor the direct approach rather than the devious route assassins eventually take. Though I will give a hunch that Kirei Kodamine might be a potential threat. As a mediator and lone spectator of the war, he shouldn't be able to have the presence of a master, nor should I be able to sense Lancer's presence nearby the church. A Lancer is always direct, and we know this summoned Lancer. For him to stay back when a potential battle is ripe for the taking is unlike him at all. Assassin agreed. Definitely unlike Lancer to stay back. He stood up, patting away dust that may have accumulated during their near midnight break. The cloak Assassin wore fluttered in the wind, revealing his black kimono and onyx spalders lined with gold. He wore a deep blue obi with red roses stitched to appear like a garden of roses. His navy blue pants were fashioned to fit black greaves with gold designs on it. He wore no metal boots, opting for his regular sandals for silence rather than clanking footsteps. He turned to Archer, I'll look into it. Thanks for the extra info. Archer waved it off as if it was nothing of particular importance to talk about possible threats to their mission. Now then, shall we have that rematch? Assassin revealed his sword, Rozu, and poised it beside him. The point of the red longsword with a serrated edge lightly stabbed the girder. Better question is, Archer stood up as well, which one is the real one? Assassin turned around to see a small battalion's amount of archers standing on top of the bridge as well. The servant of the bow cheekily smiled, if you can find the real me in one minute, we'll fight. If not, there's always next time. Archer dispelled, letting Assassin figure out which one out of the fakes is real. Clock is ticking one of the archers told the assassin. They fumbled about the area, while assassin slashed at them to verify their existence as the original or another clone. At the half a minute mark, he charged his sword in electricity, then stabbing it on the bridge, reaching the clones near the bridge, and eliminating them. The simultaneous poofs wasted 10 seconds off his time, allowing move clones to stay away from assassin's area of effect attack. Using his speed, assassin cut through the fakes in one fell swoop, allowing only two to be left on the bridge. Time's up. Archer stated from behind Assassin. Later, Counter Guardian Sasuke Uchiha. The servant disappeared once more, leaving his enemy alone. HMPH, same to you, heroic spirit Naruto Uzumaki. He fizzled into shadow, and returned to his master's side. Shuru heard the cries of a baby. An elderly woman held a bloody child, recently out of the womb, and expertly cleaned it while the other nurses cut the umbilical cord. Out of the blood, and other secretions, a little boy with a small tuft of blonde hair cried louder. A man resembling Archer held the boy in a careful manner, the father. Look, it's our son, he went closer to his wife, and allowed the woman who birthed the child, a red-haired woman, cradle her newborn. She cupped her son's tiny, supple cheek, the whisker marks were there, signifying this was Archer's birth. The husband gently took the child away and gave it to one of the nurses. You can cuddle with him a bit later, but now, we have to suppress it before it can get out. Shuru looked confused. What was, it, he didn't get a chance to know because there there the distinct sounds of two bodies hitting the ground. The husband and wife turned to the sound to see a man in a black, hooded cloak and spiral mask, hold the child calmly. Lord Forth, step away from the Jinchuriki, or else this child will die after its first minute. The dark voice the masked man held had some weight in tone alone, but Shuru, as well as the parents knew that it was only half of it, and what in the heck was a Jinchuriki? W who are you? questioned the man. Beside him, his wife squirmed, in pain like something else was about to emerge from inside her. Concern filled the man's eyes, wordlessly telling his wife to hang on. Hurry up and move away from the Jinchuriki, Lord Forth, ordered the masked man. Don't you care what happens to your little brat? Wait. Stay calm. Speak for yourself. I'm supremely calm. He chucked the baby up in the air, revealing a kanai in his left hand by doing so. The woman called her son's name, yet Shuru couldn't hear Archer's name. The husband glowed in a golden flash, teleporting himself to the baby's position. Shuru looked surprised to see a man teleport. Impressive. However, the father caught the baby in time but the cloth looked to be laced in paper tags that sizzled. A bomb. The father teleported away just in time, and landed on a clearing. He inspected his son, unscathed at all. He teleported away again, and reached a dimly lit room. 
he placed his son in another small blanket and placed him on a bed. Don't you worry, I'll go get mom. He teleported away to get his wife, leaving the child to his crying marathon. The young master looked around, he was in a dimly lit room occupied by the woman with red hair and her child. It seemed several minutes skipped, since the woman wasn't here before. He guessed that the man must have saved her, and was fighting the masked man. The ground shook, and the baby's cries increased in volume. The woman cradled her child with care, yet Shuru could see the exhaustion in her eyes. Another earthquake resembling the average strength of Japan's earthquakes shook the building, eliciting more eardrum-piercing shrieks from the newborn. It'll be all right. Shuru strained to hear the name the woman uttered, but the shaking cut the away the words. Mommy's here for you. Daddy will be back soon, and we'll be one big happy family. Daddy, couldn't wait to meet you. He bought a toy even though you were still inside mommy. Her exhaustion hasn't reached her peak, but Shuru knew the woman couldn't last much longer. Suddenly, the father appeared out of nowhere. He wore a headband with a metal plate with the carving of some stylized leaf. He wore a white cloak with flames, a green flak jacket, and a set of blue long-sleeved shirt and blue pants wrapped at the heel with wrappings, and his footwear consisted of sandals. He walked closer to them, asking what he already predicted, Are you okay? How are you and little? Again. Shuru was denied the reveal of the child's name. He's fine, dear. What's going on? I need to take him with me, he said calmly. I need to finish this. W what do you mean? The woman asked, didn't you take care of it? I severed the contract binding it. I haven't defeated it at all. I'm planning on sealing it. Into what? She received only a subtle glance directed at their son. Into our child. The woman looked absolutely shocked but what about it's fine kashina i'm ready to do this his smile looked serene it looked much more calm compared to archer's overbearing smile i'm ready to die for our son i'm ready to use the reaper death seal what he'll need a mother in his life to keep him in line you have to stay here i can't let you die he expertly snatched archer's baby form but kashina wrestled control take me with you i can restrain it at least for a little while longer Restrain what exactly? Was there some great calamity during Archer's birth? Please, at least look at your child properly before doing this. Look at the son you'll leave behind, the young man you'll never see, grow up. She met her husband's embrace, and Shuru saw tears flow out of the man's eyes. He kneeled to her, looking defeated as he did so. That is exactly the reason I want to get this over with. So I won't die of regret. What I'll do to our son is unforgivable, inexcusable. I won't be able to see him grow, protect him from the others, teach him, all those things a parent yearns to experience with his or her child. I don't want this resolve I have to waver. I want to live to keep our family together, Kashina. His sobs reached Shuru's heart. This sound of a man crying made him remember the fire, the only day he heard Kuritsugu, his adopted father, cry. Kashina returned her husband's hug, you forget that it is a parent's role to do all they can for his or her child. I fully understand what you have to do. But please, look at your son once more, and, let me stand by you until the end. Her request surprised Shuru. What a woman. She had so much willpower. So this is Archer's mother. The man nodded. He looked at the son that he will never see grow, never see his strength, never see what their son would do, nor would see him find proper love. Tears flowed outward. All the things he couldn't teach his child, couldn't experience together, couldn't tell his child, and they, as a family, would never eat ramen together. All of his childhood will be lonely, and Minato could see it. He hugged the child tenderly, his tears nearly soaking his son's blanket. Kashina gave the two a hug, and the parents visibly cried. This will be their first and first and last time they meet as a whole family. Baby Archer cried as well, louder than both his parents combined. After a minute of the waterworks, Minato, still hugging his child and wife, teleported them to a forest clearing. In front of Shuru now stood a titanic Kayubi, a Japanese mythical beast. The beast saw the husband and wife, and the man yelled, Now! Kashina created golden chains that emerged from her back. Shuru thought it was magecraft, but underneath, he knew it was vastly different. He couldn't explain it into words, but he just knew. The chains wrapped around the nine-tailed fox, and restrained it. Do your part, Minato-kun. Minato nodded, making several hand signs that did absolutely nothing, 
yet visibly affected and exhausted the beast. Hang on just a bit longer, Kashina, Minato yelled. Just one more minute, and it'll be over. The man walked over to his son and implanted something. He continued making another set of hand signs right when Kayubi roared as Kashina's grip slacked and allowed the beast to lunge with its giant claw. Minato. Kashina ran to her husband's side, impaling herself along with Minato to prevent the claw from skewering their child as well. Blood erupted from their mouths as they struggled in this strange version of tug of war that was absolutely heartbreaking for the team spectating it all. They fended off the sharp claw of the fox for the moment. While they did so, they said their parting words, words of advice so trivial compared to the situation at hand. Kashina worded out his name once more, denying Shuru Archer's name, don't be a picky eater, eat a lot, and grow big and strong. Her pained words hit Shuru in the heart, did he have a mother like this? Did he have a family that took care of him like the parents he's seeing or doing now? Make sure to, bathe every day, and stay warm, don't stay up late, get plenty of sleep. He remembered how Kuritsugu attempted to be a father, telling him some of these things Kashina was saying. While the man wasn't there most of the time, he cherished their bond. Unlike Archer, his bonds with his parents were cut short. Plus, make friends, you don't need a lot, okay? You only need a few, that you can really trust. Shuru took a moment to imagine Shinji, then erased the image away, leaving Fujine, Sakura, Issei and probably Rin and maybe Luiva as well. He smiled a bit. These were his friends, those he could trust. And, your mom was bad at this, but, study hard, and learn your ninjutsu. Everyone has their strengths and weaknesses, so even if things don't go well, don't get depressed, okay? At the academy, respect your teachers, and those senior to you, Shuru started to have tears well up inside him. He could actually feel the mother's bond with her child. Oh and regarding the three prohibitions, b, careful about loaning and borrowing money, make sure you save money, from your mission pay, don't start drinking until you're 21, too much is bad for the body, so, do it in moderation, what's with these advice, they were dying, just spend the last moments admiring your child, just then, Kashina continued, and the most problematic, girls, Shuru stopped, how true was that statement, I'm a girl, so I don't really know much about this, but, at some point, you'll notice girls, and that's normal. Just don't fall for the first one you see, find, someone like me. Shuru felt hollow, seeing this death somehow connected him to his lost parents, the ones he forgot, did he have a sibling? A little brother or sister? Also, going along with that last one, be wary of Jiraiya sensei, he'll hook you up, with simpleton skanks, so choose only the one that's right, for you. She balled up her fists, there'll be plenty of hard, painful, times ahead, take care of yourself, make sure, you have dreams, and the confidence to, make them come true. Her arms slack, and she huffed. She wasted her breath, giving advice Archer would never hear. There's so, much, so, so, much, she sobbed, clearing away a tiny bit of her and her husband's blood off Kayubi's claw. There really, there really is, so much more that I, that I want to tell you, I want to be with you longer. I love you. She strained to say. I'm sorry, dear. You don't have much time, to say much. T that's all right, Minato answered. My words to you as your father, is ditto to what your loquacious mother said, he gave his boy a pained, yet toothy grin. The baby archer cried, seemingly understanding the dying words his parents gave. We love you forever and always, the words were silent, yet Shuru knew by instinct that this was what archer's parents said. They were already dead people standing. Blood leaked through their punctured guts. They won't last long at all. He crumbled his fists. This is what the feeling of family was like. T then what happened? Did they die? Or did they survive, but give up on him? The Kayubi roars, trying its last ditch effort to kill the child. Both parents place their palm on their child's stomach and yell, Seal. The boy's stomach glows with a glaring blue pillar of light. Kayubi is drawn into it. Shuru understood what was happening, they were imprisoning the Kayubi inside the boy, a vessel to contain the beast of mass destruction. The parents fell on their side, the mother fell on the left of the basket the baby laid on, while the father fell on the opposite side. Their eyes were glazed, gone. Life lost in the battlefield, and an ultimate parent's sacrifice to ensure their child's safety. 
What a cruel fate for such loving parents to perish on the day their child was born. Archer's wailing echoed in the forest as if mourning the loss of his parents. Gah! Shuru woke up with a startle. That was Archer's birth, right? Quite the vivid image. It almost made him feel like their son. Kashina's hair made him think about whether his mom or dad had red hair. Right then and there, a pain shot up in his brain. A memory of some sort popped up. Oni chan, play with me, he heard a little girl say. She laughed while tackling him. Come on, let's play. I'm bored. Shuru braced his head. The tiny memory seeped in, hurting his brain, yet he wanted more. He had a sister, a little sister with short black hair and wore blue sundress, clung to him tightly. Plia see? The memory ended, causing the boy pain. He wanted more, he wanted to know who his sister was. He slammed his fist on the floor before standing up. Getting frustrated won't do him any good. He left his room, and noticed that he was exhausted more than when he would usually trace late at night. He stumbled a bit, but not enough to fall over. He walked to the kitchen when he heard, Good morning, master. Shuru had woken up to see Archer cooking in the kitchen. Yet despite that, Shuru rubbed his eyes to see if he was dreaming this up. Archer, the heroic spirit knew how to cook. Was this the same archer that could take down Berserker if he was stronger? The eyes didn't lie when Shuru saw Archer still cooking. What's wrong? Never saw a guy cook before. Strange, you cook, yet you never get that type of reaction when you're cooking. Archer gave a calculating stare as he tried to figure out the source of his master's confusion. Must be the pink apron, he mumbled to himself as he cooked. Shuru had to admit part of his reaction came from the apron, but it was hardly the source of it all. The man didn't make fun of him yet, usually that's the first thing he does in the morning. Granted he only met his servant two days ago, Archer had made a habit of making fun of him, and while not being insults in the least, it was slightly demoralizing. Even worse than the mocking, his super awesome servant was cooking in a frilly pink apron like it was nothing to gawk at. He could see Archer's manliness level drop a few levels. It wasn't near the level of revoking Archer's man card but it was certainly less than average because of what he wore. Plus there's that dream he had last night, he didn't know how to approach the topic of his dream. Feeling like he should just ignore Archer's comments and ask about the dream later, Shuru greeted his servant with a slightly exhausted greeting of, Morning. Hum. Archer paid attention to his master's state of tiredness, What's wrong, master? Did you not have enough sleep? Shuru shook his head, and noted his servant's worry. Nothing of the sort. I just feel drained, somehow. Drained, huh? Archer lowered his head to focus on his cooking, I may have an answer to that. Shuru looked up at Archer after he took a seat at the table. Silencing himself to hear the answer, the Emiya master waited for it. Do you remember a skill called Mad Enhancement? A nod? Mad Enhancement is a skill that takes a large amount of prana from the master. While you cannot supply a servants with your prana, Mad enhancement forces a connection to fuel the servant, me, with the enhancement. And I must say, I used it to the limit. I used it with X ranking. You would certainly have died had I not used my own resources to only leave you with a minimal amount of participation. Again, Shuru looked astounded and shocked. What's with Archer taking these risks that would most likely get his master killed? Furthermore, you say mad enhancement, does it take away your sanity? Normally, yes. Berserkers usually hold on to this skill as they are the ones who gain power from mad enhancement. Usually, masters would use a modified summoning chant to impose mad enhancement on a servant capable of going mad, but can be summoned normally. Shuru knew to expect an exception when Archer said, normally. I myself was born with the capability to go mad from power. I had a power I couldn't control based on my anger. What? So he was some kind of green, steroid-induced hero. Obvious reference and joking aside, Shuru guessed that it might have something to do with the Kyubi he saw. I learned to control its power, making me able to keep my sanity despite the madness and the power boost that came along with it. It translated into me being unable to lose my sanity. Shuru nodded understanding what Archer disclosed, further implying that the dream was an actually true event. But enough about that, are you hungry for some tuna? Shuru nodded, but what about the others? Saber is doing warm ups to polish her skills. She won't be revealing herself for a while, in turn, making her an inactive participant. She has to keep her skills sharp. 
Archer replied in a tactician-like manner, in other words, as a matter of factly. As for soccer or Taiga, they've yet to arrive, though they should be here right about, now. Right on the mark, the door opened, meaning Taiga barged in again with Sakura following behind. Archer greeted the newcomers with a gleeful smile as the two women entered the dining room. Sakura bowed, while Taiga looked like she was struck in the heart. Archer had to wonder what happened during his life to make him both the enemy and desire of women. Oh, and how he managed to live life despite being an orphan. Good morning, Mr. Gunther. Both women said. Though Sakura came up with the question plaguing both women's brains, why are you cooking? Is it so weird for me to cook? Archer asked irritatingly. I may be a man, but I was raised to be responsible for myself. The the tuna in the pan caught fire, almost seemingly reacting to Archer's rage. Did his anger also affect things around him? Shuru hoped not. He didn't want his house to burn down. He didn't even know what Archer was capable of when he's insane. He could destroy the city if the large Kyubi he saw was a beast of mass destruction. As for Clarice, that's another story, the fire extinguished itself, and he mumbled, that glutton. Saber entered the room, and walked over to hit Archer in the head. I dare you to say that again, Eric. Archer landed on the floor. Saber huffed, and hastily took her seat. Moments later, Archer recovered, finishing his cooking, and served the tuna along with sunny side ups and bacon. The Japanese people looked unimpressed by the menu Archer cooked up because of his, looks like, Western origins. Which totally contradicted Shuru's dreams. Eat up, folks. Food's still warm. He took his seat next to Saber and clapped his hands together. Itadakimasu. The others followed his lead and ate. Though Saber noticed something vastly different about this. Eric, Saber said demonically, Why is my plate a tea plate? Nothing much happened during school. Shinji stayed away from Shuru for some strange reason, and he even didn't so much as belittle him. Despite that, he actually worried about what he saw in his dream. Archer was right when he said his father looked western whereas his mother looked oriental in contrast to her western red hair. Wait, did that mean he was half Japanese? Hey, hey, Master Omin. What's bugging you? Archer asked, while taking some practice with his bow on a poor straw dummy. Archer consecutively shot the dummy right where a person's sternum should be, and the dummy's head. It looked like a porcupine with all the arrows Archer impaled it with. Nothing much. Shuru answered. He wasn't ready to disclose what he learned in his dream. He opted to openly question about his true family. Do you think one of my parents had red hair? Yeah. Genetics and all that science stuff dictates your parent or at least a relative of yours had red hair. He knocked another arrow and released it on the dummy's head again. If it's about your parents, you must have seen something to make you ask that question. What did you see? Shuru stiffened. Well you don't get to be a hero without being observant. Aye aye, I think I saw your birth, Archer. Right then and there, Archer stood petrified while drawing his bow. I saw a woman with long red hair taking care of you while there was a battle taking place outside. Then I saw a look-alike of you that was your dad taking you to seal a gigantic Kyubi into you. What else did you see? Archer asked monotonously. Despite that, Shuru knew that Archer had a bit of anger in his voice. What did you see in the dream sequence? I saw a masked man that used you as a bargaining chip, and your parents' final words. Archer remembered his mother's explanation, what actually happened in the past. While his birth was set at an unfortunate time, he didn't regret it. Archer closed his eyes, and relaxed. His master hadn't seen the effects when using Kyubi's power. I see, Archer wondered why his master saw given the vision of his birth, then you shouldn't worry about the memory. It's unfortunate that I didn't get to see my parents, I lived life as best as I could. It's not so bad. I met Saber later on in my life. With that said, Shuru understood that Archer and Saber weren't true siblings just like he and Taiga. You were adopted after the fire, right? There may be a chance that your parents are alive, or not. Actually, I think I also have a sister. Something like a memory sparked out this morning after the dream sequence of your birth, Archer. The servant wasn't surprised. Second magic always has something different for something so similar. Though he wondered, what did his master's sister look like? He suspected another red haired girl, though he may be wrong, he didn't get his mom's red hair, so there's a chance that the sister has a different colored hair. She looked like. Dot she had black hair. And it looked and felt so. Strange. 
I never had a little sister before. I must have concocted that appearance. Maybe you really do have a sister. You did lose your memories, so there's a chance she's alive. Shuru accepted the speculation, yet there was something bugging him slightly. How do you really know my dad? How did you even know I was adopted after the fire? Archer held a professional poker face. The servant already expected this round of questions to happen sooner or later. What's with Saber calling Shuru of the past, dense, but moving on, he had a lie to explain. The throne of heroes gives a servant relevant knowledge. Culture, technology, history, and other important details like legends of other servants or our master's life story so far is given to us. So when I came to your call, I learned all about your life, at least after the fire. The one before it, the grail refused to disclose for some odd reason. He saw his master's downcast eyes, and continued to talk, though don't let it get ya down, master. You're a-ok -okay in my book. He gave the young master a thumbs up, yet the young man couldn't reciprocate the same attitude. To Shuru, there was so many things to ask about his past and archers as well as sabers. Archer felt a presence knock at the border of his boundary field. He drew his swords, startling Shuru, who backed away from Archer's blades. The yin and yang swords gleamed against the sunset. Shuru kept to memory the appearance of the swords because of its entrancing effect on him. Is something wrong, Archer? Archer had already suited up, his knightly appearance screaming for battle. Why are you in your battle attire? Lancer is knocking on our door. Archer calmly stated with a small smile on his face. Shuru looked quite surprised that Archer wasn't tense about the new situation that arose from Lancer's arrival. He could pass it off as Archer already used to battle, or that he knows Lancer in an unknown way. That smile Archer gave off just had to be a smile when seeing an old friend not that Shuru has won. It seems he wants to fight. I'm letting him in. W what? You'll let Lancer in? Shuru asked. Why? He had the decency to knock. Archer nonchalantly answered. He raised his left index and pointed itself to his chest, where I come from, you usually get impaled in the back with a kanai sticking out your sternum. When it comes to servant fights, you almost get the same effect, but only with an assassin. Though a servant can get the jump on another in there fast enough. After all, a win is a win, right? Cheap shot or not, it works. To have Lancer knock is a blessing I would only expect from Saber herself or any other chivalrous servant. Shuru gulped. He realized how true the situation was. Why waste energy when you can kill your enemy before they realize you're there in the first place? Granted, Lancer is direct. He's never one to shy away from one-on-one -on -one combat. To use underhanded tactics like assassination is beyond his beliefs of a proper fight. Archer saw Lancer jumping the rooftops, then land in front of the blue-clad man twirled his lance, resting it on his shoulders. Evening, Archer, Emiya. Lancer greeted. I've come to settle the fight we had two days ago. Archer stepped back towards his master in a protective manner. Are you sure it's only that? Did your master order you to fight? He received a nod with a frown upon his face. Lancer raised his weapon, making it vertical before he stabbed the point of his lance on the ground to say his tirade. Hit the nail right on the head, E.H. Archer, Lancer said sarcastically, my master wants me to eliminate the competition. In other words, he wants to eliminate you from this war. He said I could win in two ways, the logical one, then the dishonorable one. You know which I'm leaning on, right Archer? He received a nod, and Lancer kept on talking, anyways. He prefers I use the latter method because he believes I should keep my skills hidden what a load of BS. You know my identity, so you know my noble phantasm. Shuru was getting close to figuring out what Lancer meant about the dishonorable way to win at the same time Lancer was about to finish, enough chit chat, I want to fight you, not kill the roach. Just don't lean into some guy's lap, then we'll be fine, dog of Kulin. Wouldn't want to loose your bite and be all bark now do we? Lancer grit his teeth. Archer always has an insult to use, doesn't he? He wanted to beat him just to shut that overactive mouth, oh, and don't call my master a roach again. You won't be getting any Scooby snacks anytime soon if you keep saying that. Funny. I got a comedian as an opponent. Lancer deadpanned. He grabbed his spear, and readied himself for battle. Archer did the same, keeping his position in between Lancer and his master. Shuru himself stepped back at least by the hallway. He needed to see this fight, if only for a moment. Let's see your true skills emerge, 
Saber wannabe. He charged at him in a blue blur. The glinting red spear also making a blur effect on the weapon as he got closer to his opponent. Right back at you, unlucky Irish, Archer charged too, his weapons met the other in a clash of orange sparks of determination. Outside Shuru's door, Rin was getting irritated. Why wasn't the boy answering the door? She arrived a minute ago, yet there still wasn't an answer. They were supposed to meet up to discuss their stratagem for the war. With potentially five out of the seven masters revealed, they had to strike quickly. Yet he blew her off like nothing, so here she was trying to meet up with him to talk about this. Oh where in the hell is Emiya? Saber revealed herself from her spirit form beside Rin, it's unwise to stay here in the open, master. We should return home as soon as possible. Preferably, I'd like soon to be now. Her bluntness surprised Rin. The master hadn't seen Saber this irritated or visibly hostile about something so trivial. But I have to talk to talk to Emiya, Rin answered. She insisted on it. We have to discuss our strategy if we want to win effectively. I understand you detest Archer with a passion right now, but you must learn to be passive about this. He knows the code of chivalry. Hopefully, he knows the basics of tactics, and how to discuss it. Properly. Saber looked at her master's firm stance on the idea, and relented. Her master could be as stubborn as a mule. Just then they heard the familiar sound of clashing metal. Understanding this to be a servant battle, they rushed into the home. At another nearby area, a blonde haired man in a black blazer, a white, buttoned, long sleeved shirt, and slacks stood atop an utility pole. He stared at archers and lancers battle with a keen eye. While he shouldn't get too interested, he can't help but get a slight bit amused at archers' ability. Copying weapons are noble phantasms, while weaker than the originals, was an essential skill the man had to admit. Though compared to his noble phantasm, Archer's crude ability will never be as refined as his. He had enough of the angle from the view he had, and jumped in closer on the action. I've broken 27 of those things, but you still pump out more. What the hell is that noble phantasm? Lancer angrily asked. That ain't normal. Archer chuckled, aren't we abnormal phenomena as well? People, legendary people that should be dead my legends facts, are alive and fighting for the fictitious holy grail. Sounds like something that came from an anime or visual novel. Shuru was about to ask why Archer knew about anime when he realized they just talked about this minutes ago. So he promptly shut his mouth, and to humor you, the act of creating these swords is not a noble phantasm. To reiterate, I make them. From my own prana. A projection make real. A projection strengthened, reinforced to be a blade of exceptional craft, but a copy that will unable to attain the perfection of the original. Did I answer your question, Lancer? Shuru noted this skill because projection and reinforcement were his only skills he knew of and practiced constantly. Whatever Archer did yesterday certainly helped him with his ability to trace. Lancer lowered his stance and answered, Yeah, what a nasty ability, Archer. Most interesting, mongrel. Shuru turned to the source of the voice, the man who stood atop the utility pole. Lancer looked surprised to see the newcomer, but didn't say anything. Archer himself didn't spare a passing glance. Hello to you too, King of Heroes. Archer greeted calmly, if you don't mind, this, mongrel, wants to finish his fight with the dog. Hey, don't call me a, dog, Lancer barked. I said it earlier, and you didn't say anything, Lancer. Lancer didn't have an excuse, so he clammed up, amusing both Archer and the man dubbed as the, King of Heroes. Shuru tried figuring out his name by title alone, but wasn't able to find a name right off the bat. The only clue to the title was the inference that the mysterious man was the first hero. If so, he'd have to be an epic hero of the Anglo-Saxon period. Shuru was quite happy to know his lessons in Fujine's class had some application to today's battle. The idea of figuring out the identity, not so much. Even so, you shouldn't belittle your enemies, like that guy. Archer pointed his thumb at the king of heroes, who had a smug smile at being pointed out for such a not so admirable trait among warriors. Sorry, but I've been known to piss people off. Shuru prevented the urge to say, yeah, no kidding, but managed to seal his mouth before words came out. Yeah. I guess it's been a part of me. Both my enemies and wives experience me my constant insults or teasing. For the former, it comes off as a natural thing. The latter however, Archer cringe. Though not enough to say that he was terrified. What? 
Wait, 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 wait. You have wives, not a wife. Yeah? Archer answered with the hint of a question in there. I came from a time where being the last of your noble bloodline allows you to have multiple wives. And they're the best thing that happened to me. He smiled. It was so much different compared to his mischievous smile or just a regular smile. It was a smile filled with love. Despite how cheesy that sounded, that's all Shuru could explain about it. Saber and Rin came around that time, enough to hear that Archer practiced polygamy. That irked Saber even more. She found it crucial that a marriage should be between one man and woman connected in holy matrimony. She didn't find that during her rule. Many greedy suitors came after revealing her gender, effectively preventing Saber from pursuing a husband. There were times she felt her heart tingle for Gawain, but she didn't seek that desire. Digression aside, the point was, Saber did not like the idea of polygamy. Most glorious, Archer. You have been given a fine opportunity. To have wives rather than concubines is something most notable. I haven't gotten the luxury as you have. Archer raised an eyebrow. The king of heroes had concubines, but not actual wives in his harem? That's a surprise. Hum. You're still here, king of heroes? Saber and Rin looked shocked at that. The king of heroes was here? So he's the eighth? They racked up possible masters who could summon him, but came up with none. Who summoned him? I'd have thought that I bored you because of this mongrel's gabfest. Something like this shouldn't be of importance to you. Ha! Huh. You should be honored that I grace you mongrels with my presence. Yeah, no I fought you before. Can't really honor a man who hides behind his glowing portals of death. Even as an archer, I value those who face me face to face in close combat. Where's the fun in picking your opponent from kilometers away when they don't know that I'm there to end them? The man narrowed his crimson eyes his anger slightly showing at the obvious rudeness. He couldn't blame Archer. He too had a knack to do so to his enemies, but for him to have fought this Archer, most interesting. He couldn't remember when he fought this servant, but it might have been quite the interesting one. Archer continued his sentence, and if I didn't say it earlier, I'm fighting the dog over here. That got another, hey, from Lancer, so once again, if you don't mind, King of Heroes, I'd like to fight Lancer. Say what you will, Archer but you cannot deny that you wish to bask in my glory. Nope. Too bright. Archer deadpanned. We've got the sun for that. If that thing blew up, then maybe then I'll bask in your glory. Lancer still stunned by the King of Heroes' entrance, gawked even wider at finally registering the fact that Archer was back talking and dismissing the man as no threat. Haha. <laughs> you are the most interesting mongrel I've witnessed in both my living and spiritual life. Consider yourself worthy of a battle next we meet, Archer. I shall allow this battle to continue. Make haste, Archer. My gate of Babylon itches to use your treasure. The man jumped away, leaving all spectators but Archer himself shocked. Archer badmouthed the terrifying servant and lived. Now that annoyance is out of the way, Archer made his swords disappear and pulled out his sword. Let's get to the real battle. Lancer shuffled back slightly. Archer was drawing out the multi-purpose weapon, a threat he had yet to decipher. No doubt it is Archer's noble phantasm, but what secrets does it hold? He had yet to figure out his title, and there was this stinging sensation in his mind. Information kept trickling in his head. He got one clue, a vital one that depicted Archer's identity. The Shadow of Heroes. Archer turned his sword into the spear. However, this time, he willfully altered the blade's size, making it a normal shaped spear. The omega symbol glowed, revealing the extrusions of metal forming the same symbol once more. Lancer readied his guy bold to counter his lance. So it's a battle between spears now, E.H. Archer? You got that right, Lancer. You may be the swiftest Lancer class servant, but I'll catch up to ya in no time. Archer took off his breastplate, revealing a black, cloth like armor that had white lines shaping the basic shapes of the muscles on his torso. His pauldrons disappeared, displaying broad shoulders and detached sleeves tied to his biceps by three black straps on each arm. His clothes altered, making the cloth at the center, between his legs, go away to show black pants with straps holding scrolls, but the silver greaves still stayed the jacket itself shrunk, the bottom of it just ended by his ribs while the tassels drooped a bit lower. His metal boots changed to steel-tipped shoes. Fool. You would discard your armor for speed? You're not the first to call me a fool, Lancer. 
I know what I'm doing. Archer barked. Now strike with all of your strength, Lancer. Archer swiftly charged, his lance, cutting air, almost grazing the ground, glowed an unholy red hue. The spearman lowered his lance, making its point meet with the other. When it did, he twirled his lance to the other side, effectively misdirecting Archer's lance without effort. Both lances struck ground, but almost immediately, Lancer felt no resistance from Archer's weapon. A golden glow enveloped Archer's gauntlets. Lancer couldn't stop his attack, the rotation of the lance was meant to misdirect, then attack at Archer's defenseless front. Archer simply redirected the spear, and punched the man with enough force to launch him to the walls of the Emiya residence. So this is what you mean by controlling space, Archer, Lancer grunted as he pulled himself out of the crater. Long, mid, short, you are by definition the embodiment of an archer then. More so than the king of heroes can be. He saw Archer revert his gauntlets into the lance. The servant of the bow smirked. But I guess that's what it means when you're the shadow of heroes, doesn't it, Archer? The throne finally gave you some pointers. Yeah, and I could hardly care less. Lancer straightened himself, and rushed at Archer, who readied his lance to face the spearman. Lances met at the edge, scraping the other in a line of sparks. It was the extrusion in Archer's lance that prevented Lancer's weapon from inching nearer to Archer's face. The blonde smirked at his opponent, who returned the gesture. They both reared their spears, and created a rapid set of clashes from thrusting their weapons at the other. At one such point, Lancer misdirected Archer's lance, and twirled his weapon in the same maneuver before, cutting the ground as it twirled to create a deep gash to Archer's torso. Yet, Archer knew this, and gracefully evaded the attack with a simple sidestep. Archer used the opportunity, and aimed at Lancer's exposed side. If it were any ordinary warrior, Archer would have dealt the killing blow, however, Lancer expected this. A parry meant you knew your opponent's mindset. A parry meant that you can exploit their mind, their mistake. And this servant knew his tactics before he could execute them. He thought it might be clairvoyance, but his body dictated something else. The information that trickled only increased in volume. His body was getting accustomed to fighting the servant of the bow blow for blow. Memories unfamiliar seeped in. A blonde boy summoned him along with eight others. An assassin born and bred, a failure, summoned him along others, to teach him. It hurts, faces come and go. Places blur beyond recognition. Events burn away like nothing, yet he couldn't forget this one thing. Why are you so carefree, Lancer? The boy asked. You always enjoy battle, and turn lax after. I was destined to live a short life. I fought with all I had while enjoying it while it lasted. Do you think I'll live a short life? No you're too stubborn like I am to die lying down, knowing you, you'll die standing up because you don't know the meaning of surrender. Surrender? What's that mean? Ha! Huh? Got a comedian in the works here, E.H.? Huh, Lancer said in amazement. His mind was split yet he had enough focus to keep a constant offense and defense. He regained that split focus, the pulled back his spear, pulling it along with his spinning body. He cut the ground with the point of his weapon, creating tiny trenches along its path of destruction. Archer halted its advance with the impelment of his own spear, then used his weapon as a platform to lift himself. He pulled it back, twirling as he did so, and aimed it threateningly. Long time no see, Anfa. Almost immediately, Archer's aim dwindled. Metal grazed Lancer's left cheek, the blade embedding itself into the ground. Hey, hey, I thought you forgot about me ya stupid hound. Archer said monotonously. What happened to the, I won't forget you, kid? Lancer hollowly chuckled. He did say that. For the failure of an assassin to remember his words, nothing short of amazing. That was sarcasm by the way. He picked it up after hanging next to Archer. That red clad man could snark any time of the day depending on his mood. Thankfully, it wasn't too bad. Heha, <laughs> my bad, Anfa. Shuru stared questionably at the change of Lancer's demeanor and tone. The man gave a smile that the teen knew was that of familiarity. So did it mean, Lancer knew Archer? Are we calling this a draw, then? Archer asked. Yeah, I'll leave for now. We'll settle this next time. Lancer retrieved his spear and turn his back on Archer. Don't get too rusty on your spearmanship, Anfa. I saw how sluggish your swipes and thrusts. Fix it. You've been relying on those fists of yours don't cha? 
Not really. Archer answered while Lancer casually strolled away, but you have to admit it is effective. Lancer snorted. My way is cleaner. That way just leaves chunks of burning flesh all over the place. For an assassin like you, you shouldn't do things like that. Or did the Nightcrawler not tell you that? She did. It just feels so satisfying to see my opponent cave in after feeling the impact of my punch. I just enjoy the feeling of seeing the effectiveness of a punch. Lancer waved Archer's explanation off. He clearly didn't want his brand of fighting to be badmouthed by the lax Archer. The blue clad man bent his knees, ready to leap away from sight. It was nice to remember the throne of heroes to give him his memories of his contract with Archer. Teaching the boy was fun. To battle his student in the arts of the spear was an honor. He was about to spring off his feet, however. With this command spell, I order you, Lancer, to use your noble phantasm to kill Archer's master. Keep using it until Archer's master perishes. Lancer stopped. His movements became restrained. Archer, Shuru, Saber, and Rin noted this. It seemed that Lancer was trying to resist a command spell through sheer willpower. Anfa, stop me. I'm going to kill your master. He took his stance, a red aura coated his spear. Air shuddered as the causality shifting noble phantasm illuminated the surrounding area. Hurry! Lancer turned and thrust his noble phantasm while yelling his noble phantasm's name, Guy. Bold. A crimson line of unpredictable lethality zigzagged its way to Shuru. It completely ignored Archer, who was in front of Lancer. The snake like motion of the spear's point inched closer to Shuru's inevitable death. Anfa. Stop me. I'm going to kill your master. He took his stance, a red aura coated his spear. Air shuddered as the causality shifting noble phantasm illuminated the surrounding area. Hurry! Lancer turned and thrust his noble phantasm while yelling his noble phantasm's name, Guy. Bold. A crimson line of unpredictable lethality zigzagged its way to Shuru. It completely ignored Archer, who was in front of Lancer. The snake like motion of the spear's point inched closer to Shuru's inevitable death. Archer reformed his lance into its bow form hastily. In his right hand were three arrows, he took aim and knocked the string. Using his prana, he projected more arrows, seemingly floating above or below the string. His fingers release, and the arrows fly from the bow at blinding speeds. The bolts pierce the air in order to get close to the spear. However, its unpredictable path allowed it to dart and weave around its attackers, completely missing the spear's point. No, Archer yelled. He repeated the action in hopes of changing the outcome. He shot another salvo at the rushing spear, and once again missed. The knight grit his teeth, and ran to his master's side. Had he left a kanai by Shuru's side, he would have been there immediately. Sadly, he didn't have one to substitute with. He ran as fast as his legs could carry. Using all he could to get faster, Archer outran the spear by only a marginal second. Rin ordered her saber, help him. The woman obliged and stepped into the battlefield. Her white clothing and silver armor reflected the noble phantasm's glistening red glow. In her right hand, her caliburn sheathed in invisible air, contorted in preparation to counter the blow. The snake-like movements of the lance inched closer and closer into Saber's range. She slid her right foot back and twisted her body to the right. She leapt off her right foot and swung her blade, unveiling its true, golden blade as she did so vertically. The lance could not avoid Saber's strike, misdirecting its course into a total miss. She smirked at her victory, but it wasn't meant to be. Stay your guard, Saber, she heard both Archer and Lancer's voices. True to their statement, she saw causality shift back to before the impact. In that small time frame, she adjusted her body, making it turn left and shifting her body to the right to completely avoid the blade while also parrying it. The lance hummed dangerously, the electric sparks coursing through its point. Her sword ground against the attack for only one second before it skewered her left side. Saber, Archer yelled, his worry outmatching his obnoxiousness. Blood erupted on both sides and coated her armor and clothing. It only leaked more as soon as the lance pushed itself deeper into Saber's body. The injured Saber lurched forward, then landed on one knee to stabilize her weakening body. She pointed Caliburn towards Shuru, and unleashed invisible air to push the master out of Guy Bolg's range. Not finished yet, Lancer declared. Anfa, you have to stop me now. 
the spear slithered in the air, repeating its homing action to strike true to its target. Shuru stumbled backwards in fear of the attack. Get up, master, Archer drew Kanshu and Bakuya, throwing both of the swords at the most probable path it would take. The twirling blades intercepted the attack, and sent it flying for that instance. At that exact instance, Archer substituted with Bakuya, the sword that did not meet the lance's point. The sword switched positions with him, and he deflected the attack once more. The spear struck ground, and exploded the surface like an bomb drop. Time reversed once more, and Archer noticed it would take another path through Saber to kill his master. Archer gathered Prana to his hands in order to project his shield. Red glowed over his palms. Lancer breathed a sigh of relief. Archer would use the one thing that could block Guy Bold. Because of this, Lancer was forced to retract his spear, making uncomfortable squelching sounds of flesh as it pulled out of Saber's body. Lancer used Guy Bold as per his master's orders to kill Shuru once more, but in order to do that, he pushed forward to make his target reach the effective range. A hey Archer, what are you doing there standing in the way? Saber asked through the pain. He's my master, Saber Chan. He simply answered. The projection finished just in time to stop Guy Bold's advance. Stretching his left arm out, he bellowed, Ro Ayas. A seven petaled flower erupted from his palm. The defensive projection said to equal the defenses of seven fortresses took the lance's point without so much as a scratch on its surface. Saber stared in awe. Archer did not flinch at the attack, he knew this could stop the noble phantasm. She inspected the man before her. His broad back showed no tension in his muscles. He was without a doubt comfortable blocking this attack. It almost reminded her of Gawain in the way he takes a finishing blow for her if she couldn't recover to block an attack. See? Only I can protect my master. Lancer retracted his weapon, and prepared to strike once more as dictated by the command spell. The most peculiar thing about the shield was the fact that the spear focused on the shield rather than its intended target. Huh. I forgot the vixen rigged that shield of yours to override Guy Bulb's curse. Lancer said happily. That fox knew what to do huh? How is she by the way? Well, I suppose. Crafty she may be, but she is a woman. To redirect any attacks to hit this shield and override upon contact any curse is a wonderful thing to make. Even better, the shield's new abilities activate upon your eye contact with it. Archer smirked as he said those words. I'm surprised you forgot about one thing that could counter your spear without the aid of luck. Now let's see you try to launch that again. Archer dispersed the seven petaled shield, and charged with the intent of not allowing Lancer to launch one more activation of Lancer's noble phantasm. When the spearman did attack, Archer positioned himself in such a way that wherever the point would go, Archer would be there to intercept. As such, Lancer would not be able to unleash Guy Bold, and had to resort to normal attack. He slashed one time, making it miss. Archer redirects another attempt, and advances. He repeated this dance until Archer missed his mark. The attack slipped through Archer's guard, and he couldn't chase after it in time. Lancer moved out of Archer's range of close combat that not even a substitution would save Shuru from death. Master. Defend yourself. Shuru was ahead in thinking and started to think of ways to defend himself. He had nothing he could reinforce. All he had were his bare hands that would no doubt tear off from blocking it. All he hoped to do was to follow Archer's hint. A projection made real. A projection strengthened, reinforced. Shuru commenced the tracing process with haste, judging the concept of creation. Hypothesizing the basic structure duplicating composition material. Imitating the skill of its making sympathizing with the experience of its growth. Reproducing the accumulated years excelling every manufacturing process. I need a weapon, he declared and demanded to himself. His mind forged the image of Archer's twin swords. Powerful weapons like Archer has. His magic circuits burned at the new, foreign strain exerted to it. Trace, on. Shuru roared. Prana surged forth from his palms and encompassed them like the source of a lightning storm. The prana morphed into a set of familiar blades, a pair of yin and yang Chinese Dao swords. Shuru reinforced the pair of weapons in his hand, and swung at the spear's point. Sparks flew off, and Guy Bulb started to shred the created weapons. All right, master. Hold him off for a little while longer. 
Archer leapt forward at a speed that almost matched Lancer's and thrust his open palms onto his opponent's abdomen. The double palm strike destroyed Lancer's stance, and reared his right hand. A blue spiraling sphere of energy not resembling prana emerged. The sphere grew in size to the size of a basketball, and the knight thrust it at Lancer. But before anyone could see the attack, both warriors disappeared from battle in a yellow flash. Saber, Shuru, and Rin looked dumbstruck at the disappearance of the two servants. Rin most of all looked gobsmacked and stepped forth to stand beside her servant. He can teleport too, she screamed, piercing Shuru's and Saber's eardrums. Udama Rasengan, Archer yelled as he ground the technique into Lancer's gut. The grinding sensation churned Lancer's insides, and began to tear away at his armor. The contained storm exploded outward, and launched him into a line of trees in the forest. Yes. Archer teleported Lancer and himself to the Einsburn forest. The trees Lancer landed towards had toppled like a line of dominoes. The bark tore apart, and its splinters and other various sized shards flew into the air, and the sound of the thunderous descent of the trees scared off the nearby wildlife from nearing the battlefield. Lancer picked himself off from the debris of fallen foliage with a tiny hint of difficulty. His arms were placed on a trunk of a fallen tree, and he used it as support to spring off from his restraints. He leaned on one of the laid trunks and wiped a sweat off his brow. He popped the joints in his body, making an ensemble of popping sounds from his neck to ankles. My, my, Anfa, you certainly know when to just amp up the fight. He gave the knight a thumbs up, good job getting me out of range. I don't know how long or how many times I would keep using it in rapid succession. He, with his spear firmly grasped in his right hand, took his battle stance. Plus this way, we can finally fight properly. The sunset shone on the edge of the blade on the spear, making it glint. He would have charged at Archer, but. That is enough, Lancer. Return to my side. Lancer sucked his teeth, and deviated from his fighting stance. Well. It seems my master wants me to return after a fruitless battle. It's nice seeing you again, Anfa. He turned his back on Archer, then poised his lance on his shoulders. And I you, Lancer. Archer replied as he saluted the spearmen retreating from the battle. You best be going lest you incur your master's wrath, he left the scene in relative silence, effectively leaving Archer in enemy territory. Guess I'll head back too. He turned away from Lancer, and started to walk through the forest when, why am I walking? I just teleported here, so why am I walking? He shook his head at his idiocy before teleporting back to the Emiya household. Berserker arrived shortly after to investigate the destruction, moreover, he didn't find the creator of the destroyed area of the forest. He'd guess Archer, but there weren't adequate amounts of evidence linking him to the carnage done to the forest. What else have you been hiding from me, Emiya Kung? shouted an enraged Rin, who held Shuru by the collar of his shirt. His pants were almost revealing most of his boxers as well. And Rin was on top with her face dangerously close to Shuru's. Rin herself discarded her red jacket, and hung it on the top of a chair, and her hair looked like a mess just like her uniform. Such a sight would be quite awkward if someone else noticed it. So it would be no surprise that anyone can get the wrong idea at first glance. Archer himself took time to stand in silence to try, and process what was happening for the past three minutes he'd been gone. Either that, or he was actually was in the forest longer than he expected. Archer decided to speak up to show his presence just outside the room Shuru, Saber, and Rin occupied at the moment. He cleared his throat and did his best monotonous voice possible. If I didn't know any better, I honestly thought you'd teach my hopeless master about UAL relations and actions. And by UAL relations, I mean to teach him how to use his ponos and point it into the vagu, then jam it in. Shuru didn't understand Archer's words unlike Rin. She heavily blushed, her face fit the appearance of her red jacket. Saber banged her head on the wall to add extra injury to her body. Rin hastily released her clutches on Shuru, and stood up to make herself prim and proper to give Archer a stern talking to. First of all, we were not doing that. Rin shouted at the tall knight, second of all, you still have skills that you chose to hide from us. And finally, you knew Lancer intimately. She spitfire attitude did not phase Archer one bit. In fact, he chose to express Lancer's offhand demeanor to the girl before him. What do you want me to say? Archer asked, you looked like you were in the mood, emphasis on you especially. 
Next, I'd like to have trump cards, and lastly, so what if I knew him intimately? He was one of my teachers for crying out loud. He would stem to the topic some more, however, his master beckoned him. Yes, I don't get it, Archer, Shuru said as he still lied on the floor in his disheveled state. Ponos, Vagu, what? You lost me. Archer slapped his face with his palm. He pinched the bridge of his nose and sighed deeply. It seems that his master needed to be educated properly about it at another time. Maybe he could use the dolphin or dragon demo to enlighten his master, but how exactly would he show the dragon or dolphin demo? It's not like he can use illusions to show what it means. However, both Rin and Saber seemed delighted at Shuru's cluelessness on the opposite gender as well as his crotch's function to reproduce. Rin mentally decided she would not allow Archer to corrupt Shuru's innocent and naive soul in order to inadvertently keep Sakura's chastity intact. It means nothing of importance, Shuru. Ho, Shuru, eh. You sly dog, master. When did you get promoted to first name basis? Archer's smile embarrassed Rin to no end. We might have taken the next step in achieving your harem it seems. You're still on that? Shuru asked incredulously. Why do you have to mention it whenever the topic is about girls? Um, if you haven't noticed, Sakura is maddeningly in love with you. The archery club captain has a minor crush on you. The foreigner Edelfeld was it is taking interest on you, and now it seems to Sokka-chan is giving you the benefit of the doubt. Archer's bluntness on the matter took the boy by surprise, and left the young master in an odd, flabbergasted state that rendered him immobile and unresponsive to outside influence. Archer waved his hand in front of his master's face, and saw that his master's eyes did not follow the movements of his hand. I must have broken him, he calmly stated. I am not taking interest in him, Rin boldly stated. Archer ignored her words to say something sage-like. I know how a woman acts, to Sokka chan I've met various women with their exotic quirks and personalities. To Sokka chan some of them acted like you do now. I know you're denying what little spark of affection you have for my master. He turned to the guests of the household, but that's my opinion or insight on the matter. You may evaluate it whichever or however you want. However I will also take a guess that you're hesitating to let Sakura-san have him, he said in a chipper tone. He didn't mean it seriously at all, yet somehow Rin had the feeling that Archer really knew how she felt. Well, ladies, do you wish to have dinner right now? If it'll get you to fess up about how Lancer was your teacher. Rin haughtily stated while still scowling at the servant who thought he knew her from the inside out, then yes. Sure, sure. Archer dismissed the info-gathering motive of the Tasaka master. Now are there any requests before I head to the kitchen? He waited a minute before he received no answer. Okay. It's a surprise then. Saber, I'll leave a clone to tend to your wounds. Please don't hurt it, it's quite the fragile thing. I make, no promises, a archer. Saber stammered through the pain. Archer left the room, and created a clone to heal or at least make her comfortable enough to stand properly. Archer's clone held a pack of gauze and alcohol wipes in his hands, but first inspected the wound. He requested that Saber discard her armor and to raise her corset to allow him to see the puncture wound caused by Lancer's noble phantasm. For the sake of reaching peak condition, Saber reluctantly bared her smooth, firm abdomen tainted by the injury she sustained. Archer wordlessly cleaned the wound first with a few alcohol wipes before wrapping around with gauze. Then suddenly, Archer placed both his palms on the puncture wound. Green light bathed his hands. Saber looked astounded by this scenario. Archer was slowly healing her, she could feel her flesh mend together in a rapid pace, closing the hole entirely in a matter of minutes. Archer removed his palms from the area and reassuringly said, that should do it. It's not perfect, but it will have to do at the moment. Take a rest, it'll be good for you. The clone poofed into smoke, and left Saber to her thoughts. You've taken a liking to the other me, Naruto, Saber of Blue smirked. I know, Archer replied, and it's quite awkward to say the least. Awkward, you say? Do enlighten me on the subject matter, she requested with a hostile smile. Archer thought nothing of it, and continued to talk with Saber. Archer answered the question with a tiny bit of sass. Well you are my big sister figure, so it's quite confusing to get properly acquainted to your other self without the thought of you barging into my head. Saber looked amused to say the least. If I didn't know any better, you admitted you have feelings for the other me, which in turn also means you like me. 
Well, Archer hesitated. There was that one time in my life as a child where I was attracted to you. Turns out it was just another tiny crush that I got over once I saw you as my older sister. However, it seems that Tiny Spark is still alive and it's aimed at your other you. Archer chuckled embarrassingly as he let the truth out. Saber tried to recollect the moments when she took the man in front of her under her tutelage, and searched for those moments when the boy idolized her. She guessed that those times were when his admiration for her peaked. It's best to not mull over it for the sake of not being confused, he said to her. It's strange, but technically, she isn't the same as you, Arthuria nay. Second magic and all, plus you're the woman who disguised herself as a man to be king whereas she revealed her gender and was able to rule despite her gender. He began to walk away, yet stopped mid-step to ask one more question, any particular requests? Not in particular no you free reign over my meal. All right. Later Saber nay. He walked to the kitchen, leaving Saber alone to hide away in her room that Archer had rigged to keep her presence relatively hidden. As of right now, Rin and her servant don't know she's here and don't think any other servant besides Archer is here. She quietly left and headed for the dojo, her room, to train once more. Her skills will be soon needed, she could feel it. Good evening, Lancer. One Kire Kodamine spoke ominously, it seems my order has not been fruitful. Am I right in assuming so? Lancer wordlessly nodded to his, master, and kneeled to him reluctantly. Care to explain why you failed to eliminate Shuru Emiya? His voice did not rise along with the sense of anger rising in the clergyman. Was I not specific in my command, Lancer? Oh you were quite specific, Kotamine. You were dreadfully specific in the drive you have to kill the boy. Lancer drawled. To answer your question about how I failed, Archer teleported the both of us out of my effective range. He made us land all the way to the forest where the Einsburn homunculus resides. To be honest, I was surprised to see more rabbits come out of his hat. He snickered lowly as he kept explaining the situation. Really now, that archer is just too much. It's surprising how much he's grown from the incompetent boy he was. Lancer's eyes widened as he realized he made the biggest mistake he could do at the moment. Kire perked at Lancer's statement, Hmm, perhaps you'd be willing to share your discovery to your master, Lancer. After all, the phrase, knowledge is power, couldn't fit any better for this war. E.H. No, Lancer promptly replied. He stood up from his kneeling position and chose to sit at one of the benches provided in the church. With one foot on the top of one bench and another crossing over the former, he pulled his head back and spoke, that's for me to know, and for you to never find out. Kire did not flinch at his servant's refusal. He had expected this and had one countermeasure left to use. To Kire, Archer proved to be too deadly of a servant to allow him to live any longer. He thought using a command spell to wipe out Shuru Emiya would be enough but the plan failed. Frustrated on the inside, Kire clenched his fists and readied himself to use his final command spell. I wouldn't be too hasty, Kire. The clergyman looked behind him. Gilgamesh, the king of heroes, sneered, is it wise to do that? Certainly the urge to sat that curiosity is nagging away at your temples, but do keep in mind that Lancer will not hesitate to kill you. The clergyman silenced himself because he knew the outcome, yet chose to pursue the thought. The servant is interesting, fascinating. Those eyes of his say much about our interaction in the past. Gilgamesh sat on top of one of the benches, then continued, strangely enough, I can't remember who he is. My lord. Kire. I will find out his identity through battle. Do not impose your will on Lancer with such an imprudent action. The blonde servant ordered. Lancer looked to the king of heroes. Never in his life did he think that the arrogant epic hero would save his skin. He lowered his legs from the perch, and sat properly. Kire bowed to acknowledge Gilgamesh's insight, and left the room. Gilgamesh turned to the lancer, and spoke his mind, you're in luck, lancer. While a foreign concept due to your ineptitude of obtaining luck, you have some, and I sprinkle it lightly. Don't waste this opportunity, Irish child of light. I'm indebted to you, Gilgamesh. Though when it comes the time to do battle, I'm unsure where my fealty lies. Once you remember Archer's identity, you will learn to hate no loathe him once you do. You will hate me as well, but if it's any consolation, I won't forget this simple act of kindness. Lancer stood from his seat and walked over to the man to shake his hand as a symbol of his thanks. If you speak the truth, 
then I will shake your hand as a sign of my thanks for giving me your honesty of what may come. He did as he said, and firmly shook the blue clad spearman's hand. Lancer smiled at the reciprocating action. Suddenly, Gilgamesh activated his gate of Babylon. Lancer jumped back and readied his spear. What surprised him was what the king of heroes pulled out of his gate. A vase full of wine. Easy now. Care to have a bottle of the finest wine in my treasury? E.H. Dinner was an uneventful time. Archer's menu, while extravagantly delicious due to the various spices he used on the tuna, the perfect texture of the noodles for the miso ramen, the crisp flavor of the stew and the expert crafting of the rice balls and other such foods that rendered all the eaters at the table speechless. Rin and her saber stayed after for a bit to discuss about their next move. Archer spoke of the ever-elusive caster, who had yet to show her presence in the war. The Tasaka and her servant agreed that they hadn't seen the magecraft-inclined servant. In the words of Archer, a caster stays away from the front lines, but they are the most cunning when it comes to unexpected tactics. For all we know, we are already underneath her palm. While I extremely doubt that, it isn't impossible. He didn't say more because it's his master's decision whether or not Archer would act. The servant left the room to allow his master full reign over his decision to take action. He didn't hear any of the laid plans, and merely waited for his orders by patrolling the residence's perimeter using his clones. Night quickly fell, and Rin and her servant were about to leave. The woman Knight was the last to leave the residence, but not without a few choice words she gave to the servant of the bow. T thank you for tending to my wounds, Archer. I sincerely apologize for my uncouth behavior during my outburst. It's unbecoming of a knight to insult another's honor and right. She bowed customarily to the tall archer. To be accepted by Caliburn is no small feat, and for you to wield it means you've great strength to lead and the ability to fight. Archer resisted the urge to be sarcastic at the woman. As such, he let the woman continue with her speech. Once our alliance is done, I wish to battle you for the true owner of Caliburn. She straightened her posture and the jade eyes stared into Archer's azure orbs. Her determination was translated by her gaze, and Archer smirked. Agreed. Do make it entertaining when our battle does happen, Saber Chan. But before I leave, will you disclose to me how you obtained my sword? Saber inquired to the servant of the bow. Archer adopted a thinking pose with his left arm supported by this right as his hand supported his chin. When he had his answer, he leaned in close to Saber's ear because of his height being approximately two heads above Saber's own height. That's a secret, Archer replied in sing-song fashion. He straightened himself to see a saber with a betrayed look carved on her attractive face. It was such a cute sight that Archer wanted a camera to capture it to keep as a memory. If you want to know so badly, then how about one date? Huh? Saber eloquently uttered from her mouth, a date? Preposterous. Her gentle gaze hardened at Archer's suggestion. Why should I interact with your mangy mug? Archer feigned hurt and Saber actually thought she damaged Archer's ego. I may respect you as a warrior, but I do not believe I am at the threshold of fatal attraction to be smitten by you. She crossed her arms and turned away. She felt a blush emerge, however, it wasn't prominent on her face, therefore insignificant to her current situation. Archer smirked mischievously, that's not a no, Saber Chan, he drawled. While your words sting me so, they do not deter me. Dear, mesmerizing Lily. He said lovingly as he stepped closer, and raised a hand to caress her right cheek. Strangely, she did not slap his hand away. Even stranger, she seemed to be content and nuzzled into his hand like a cat purring to a human's touch. Archer glided his hands over Saber's soft, supple skin, and saw that she was thoroughly enjoying this. I am bewitched by thy porcelain beauty. With thy eyes deep verdant like a forest, hair as fluid as water and shine like the sun, and a heart of an unyielding lion. My heart desires thee. His words, while absolutely cheesy in his mind, did give the woman a tiny blush. Oh, won't you reconsider? He pleaded with his face close to hers, his lips nearing hers. The archer you see before you is far more different than the archer who raises his blade for the innocent or for the love of battle. His smile reached Saber's fortified heart. He knelt to her like a man proposing to his future wife to be, and handled her left hand with a warm and delicate touch. He gave the hand a chaste kiss like a gentleman of the past, and the action wasn't overlooked by the masters. Saber, stunned by the course of action, stammered, Ah, reconsider, she shook her head wildly. No, absolutely not. I won't fall to your charms, 
she stepped back with her blush increased. She almost stumbled, but easily recovered. Ho! Oh, but it seems I already snagged it. Archer smoothly replied. He stood up with his hand still firmly grasping Saber's dainty hand. If I've flustered you this much, then I've done something right. Staring up at the courting giant, she blushed heavily after seeing Archer's tender smile. Impossible. You're merely making false assumptions. Saber retorted quickly without room for debate. You have no evidence that pertains to the condition of my heart. She tugged her left hand away from Archer's grasp and clutched it tightly. Her vehement refusal on the matter amused Archer to no end. Saber's blush only grew in size and intensity with each refusal she spoke. Mark my words, I shall strike you down with all of my hate. She removed Archer's right arm from her face and pointed an index finger at him. Count on it, Archer. The height difference along with her brave declaration made the claim seen as an outrageous boast, but admirable nonetheless. If you strike me down with all of your hate, then will love remain in your heart? He asked softly. Saber looked stunned at Archer's silky words. The stunned countenance slowly transformed into annoyed fury, and Saber uncharacteristically scowled. Enough with your sappy lines, Archer. Your words won't sway me, not now, not ever. The knight turned away from him, then crossed her arms once more. I will find out your identity by any means without resorting to going with along your impudent and heinous request. As a king and a woman, it's deplorable and unsightly to be in your company. Is it because I'm a vandal? Yes, Saber answered. Fiendish? Yes. Treacherous? Yes. Hazardous? Yes. A devilishly handsome renegade who's captured your heart? Yes. Saber yelled frustratingly at the monotonous questionnaire Archer conducted. It took her five seconds to realize her mistake. When she did, her face lit up like a tomato, and her embarrassment for falling to Archer's trick made her try to cover her face with her hands. Ha ha. Got you. Archer cheered. By all means, do try, Lily. I want to see how flawlessly you attempt to unearth my past. And when you give up, do reconsider my offer, okay? Never. Rin gaped, and Shuru palmed his face. These two knew what Archer was capable of as a fighter, but as a lover. That seemed like another story altogether. Rin could see the charisma skill doing work, and she was absolutely terrified that Saber actually fell for his charms. To Shuru, the act of romancing Rin's Saber was outright foolish and embarrassing to say the least. Come on Saber. Rin commanded. Saber hastily went to her master's side. Her face still had a miniature and imperceptible blush on her face but the instigator saw it despite being several meters away from Saber, who was in the dark. The Tasaka did not say anything to her Saber or to Archer. She waved her hand as a sign of her farewell as both disappeared into the darkness of night. Really? Shuru, at the front door, asked his servant, you'd take your time to flirt with Saber? What can I say? Archer turned and smirked at his master. He gave a dreamy sigh that seemed to fit him. She's a flower able to survive the battlefield and still look pristine and gorgeous to the eyes. The untouchable flower of the battlefield. So this is the extent of your infatuation to my other self, I can't say I'm surprised. Saber, Blue, said from behind Shuru. Lancer has influenced you quite a lot in this aspect. Tell me about it. Archer replied back. If not for him, I'm pretty sure that exchange would have ended it, it's a secret, Shuru had a difficult time believing that fact, Moreover while doubting that, he gave his servant a questioning gaze. He taught me well to appreciate the opposite gender, and I don't regret it. At least you didn't take your godfather's lecherous personality, she sighed before heading inside. Good night, Archer, Master. Good night, good night. Both males answered. A distant shout of, I forgot to ask about Lancer, could be heard in the distance. Midnight struck, and the full moon bathed the earth in a gray glow. Its rays hindered by ashen clouds allowed hot spots of silver to make contact with the ground. The Emiya residence was lucky enough to be given spotlight in this cloudy night. Saber and Shuru slept soundly in their rooms whereas Archer stood on the roof as the vigilant sentry of his master's home. It was quite the silent night, but it certainly did not feel holy at all. He was filled with a sense of danger that he couldn't express with words. This feeling was obscured, and it wasn't anything familiar to him at all. This signature could only originate from a servant, and Archer had only one true answer to this mysterious servant's identity. 
He narrowed his eyes as he muttered, Castor, with disdain written all over his face. He turned around when he had footsteps hitting the roof. Skeleton golems with only animalistic jaws for head cackled with their bone bows and swords in hand. The servant of the bow wondered how Castor slipped through his defenses, but did not fully commit to wondering how she accomplished the feat. He projected Kanshu and Bakuya, and swiftly cut through the mob of Castor's familiars. His attack was as silent as the night, as such, none of the people inside the house was alerted by this altercation. Even the summoner of those familiars did not realize that her minions were being torn apart so cleanly. Anyways, the shinobi trained archer made bones transmute to dust and ash as he navigated his way across the rooftops to reach his master's bedroom. Please let me make it. Shuru felt lonely. He didn't know why, but this feeling seemed to stem from his surroundings he'd never seen before. While the building looked eastern in style, they looked archaic, and none of the buildings looked ridiculously tall compared to modern day skyscrapers. The tallest building looked like a capital building colored in red with the kanji for fire as a sort of identifying emblem in replacement of a name. But moving from that point, the reason why he felt lonely is the fact that he was ridiculously given a wide berth by other people. While he didn't mind it, it was unnatural for people to steer clear of one person. Only then did he realize that he wasn't the one people were avoiding. It was a young archer not even eight years old. The future servant to be looked to be lamenting over something. Shuru, the ever-curious master searched for the answer when voices battered against his head. Demon. Leave us alone. You've no place here, monster. Trash like you should die. The words struck Shuru at the heart. Who could say that to a kid? He asked himself. The inhumane way these adults, full of scorn for Archer, disgusted Shuru to his very core. The offense would have been worse if Archer had been beaten black and blue. Thankfully it looks like it didn't happen in his childhood. However, the lack of social interaction seemed to affect Archer negatively. Shuru could feel the despair in his servant's heart. It was eating away at his every fiber of being, yet he put up a fortified front, growing stronger as each time his heart succumbed to his depression. He saw the boy grow older to a 12 or 13 year old boy, his heart still aching for meaningful interaction in his life with his brave outer persona holding his sanity together. Deeper into his soul, Shuru saw a dark presence form in the cracks of his vulnerable heart. Again, Shuru is bombarded with another set of images, a pink-haired girl, a silent and smug raven-haired boy, and a white-haired teacher with his lower half of his face covered by a mask. The scene altered several times, and each depicted Archer's teamwork with these people as they fought hundreds of foes. Within these scenes, much focus was given to Archer's cooperative and fluid transition from one enemy to the next while aiding his black-haired partner, who did the same as Archer. The two looked like rivals in a sense that there was this spark of challenge between them. That idea came crashing down like a building scheduled for demolition. Archer and this friend of his were at a waterfall away from the other. They were on opposite ends of the waterfall, and positioned themselves at the base of what seems to be the foot of a statue. Archer's friend looked like a monster. The boy grew grew hand like wings, and his skin looked similar to ash. Archer himself emulated a beast. He was wrapped in a red aura taking the form of a fox. Archer's eyes were blood red and slitted like an animal's, and it unnerved Shuru that this may have been the thing that Archer talked about that made him a possible berserker candidate. Both boys created an attack that originated and stayed at their palms. For Archer friend. Black lighting enveloped his left arm in such terrifying fashion that Shuru seemed to feel the stray electric bolts hit his skin. Archer created that strange orb in his right hand, and the blue hue it took merged together with the red aura, combining its menacing power to enhance the attack. It was then and there that Shuru knew the two were trying to kill each other. When they jumped and met at the center of the waterfall, his vision turned to black. Shuru now dreamed of a sewer with a cage at the end of the tunnel. He felt a demonic presence beyond the towering bars, and assumed it to be the Kyubi sealed into his servant. If so, then he realized he might be inside his servant's psyche. Just in front of the pitch black cages and sides, Archer, as a young boy in an orange jumpsuit, stood irritated at the thing behind bars. He was with an old man who floated over the ground. The man motioned his hands, and controlled nine artifacts to place them in specified areas of what Shuru noticed to be a summoning circle. Archer uttered the words for the summoning chant, effectively shocking Shuru. So this is the moment Archer received his title as a master. 
Shuru thought to himself. After the bright light that emerged during the summoning dispersed, Shuru noticed two more servants he hadn't seen before. A woman cloaked in a midnight cloak hid her face underneath her hood, whereas the other could be visibly seen as a knight. The Emiya master noticed this new knight wore the visor archer held so affectionately in that previous vision. Suddenly, images of archer's progress invaded Shuru's mind. The young boy practiced with a shinai then turned into the orange knight wielding Rin's saber's sword. Then the same boy mimicked the red-clad man's pose along with the yin and yang swords. He twirled a red lance at dangerous speeds with lancer's approval. Then the knight became a gunslinger using twin, white, long-barreled pistols with red-handle grips. The scene changed to a crater-filled landscape, where in the middle of it all, Archer held several ceiling tags, and the fox girl Shuru saw jumped ecstatically. Archer swiftly assassinated a large underground crime ring under a minute. Next, Shuru witnessed a live version of chess with Archer's clones as the pieces. Archer commanded his troops against a black knight, and what seemed to be a normal chess game turned into a battle of wits and tactics fitting for a true battlefield littered with terrain and traps set up by each player. Next, he saw Archer launching himself towards the scantily clad soccer look-alike by attacking with a flaming jump kick, which screamed as, dynamic, to Shuru. And finally he saw Archer commanding an army together with a redhead wearing a sandy gourd on his back. But before the visions subsided, he saw Archer and his servants faced a force of a million weapons raining down on them. Before he felt the feeling of waking up, Shuru analyzed a vital thing about Archer's progress. With each change of scene, Archer's bright smile of naivety slowly turned to a somber grin and lacked the brightness and passion in his younger version. Whatever allowed him to return to his younger persona must have been quite effective, Shuru inferred. Damn you, Caster, Archer grumbled as he jumped rooftops together with Saber to reach Ryudo Temple. Damn you to hell. His reason for this bout of anger and hate was because of Caster's almost unending supply of golems halting progress. They were easy to kill, but they came in such numbers that even his clones would take some time to kill them off. Also, if he added his clones, Naruto was sure that the Emiya residence wouldn't be the same, most likely, he would make his master's home a giant, smoking hole in the ground. Enough prattling, Naruto. Saber commanded of her fellow servant, you've tried your best, and it wasn't enough. Stop mulling over an insignificant thing such as this. Naruto would have barked back out of frustration, but they were stopped by Ryder, who stood on a roof fence with elegant balance befitting her beauty. The two stopped immediately to answer this new threat. Good evening, Archer and Saber, she greeted hollowly. She had a frown upon her face that clearly showed her disappointment. Archer didn't express any emotion, and tried to hide his nervousness of being found out. So the rumor about the eighth servant is true, you had me convinced, Archer, you really did. She leapt off the fence, and landed in front of the two night class servants. Archer noticed it before, but Ryder's tasteful tight midnight dress accented the highlights given by the moonlight. Specular highlights curved to her body's alluring shape, and he caught himself ogling at her. Ryder moved her hands to her neck and swung it back to fix her long, gorgeous hair that reminded him of his teammate's hair. What do you want, Ryder? Saber questioned. We've a captured master to retrieve. You may leave if you wish to save your master, Saber. However, she pointed to Archer, I must have a discussion with this ruffian of an archer. Saber readied her sword. She dare insult her surrogate brother like so, but, she had to admit he was a ruffian. However, that didn't mean she would allow this servant to overstep her bounds. Her grip on Excalibur tightened, and invisible air contorted in response to her rising anger. Archer placed his hand on Saber's breastplate, and held her back. That's enough, Saber nay. I can handle this. Besides, you need some alone time with Master. He sneered at Saber, before pushing her off the building. He didn't need to hear her protests at the moment, and so he did it. Saber, incapable of speaking her mind at that moment, just let herself fall, as Archer chucked a three-pronged kanai in the air in the general area of Mount Enzo. When she hit ground, she realized she had to punish her brazen little brother for making fun of her, she jumped up full force. At the apex of her jump she saw Archer waving to her with his cheeky smile. The waving hand showed its back as it snapped its fingers. Her scenery rapidly changed. In a flash of yellow, she lost sight of Archer and Ryder, and saw herself to be positioned at the base of the mountain. 
While she was glad that Archer gave her a great big push to get to their master, she became infuriated at him for sending her to where all hell would break loose. Right where all the golems were stationed, at the base of the mountain. Damn you, Naruto, so? You've something to discuss with me? Archer asked his enemy servant, How about I take you to dinner while I'm at it? My stomach's killing me. Ryder feigned indifference, but she was quite impressed Archer made quick work in diffusing the serious atmosphere she created. It takes incredible skill to simply pass off the hidden, idle threat. Either he's a genius, or a mad moron. You must think I'm a genius or a mad moron, right? Busted. Don't worry. You'd be surprised how the two things come up in the same context. But to answer your question, I'm an insane genius. I've no time for your jokes, Archer. Tell me, why do you know my identity and my true master? Like I said, have dinner with me, and I'll tell you what I can. Do you have the luxury of time to woo me, Archer? Ryder sultrily questioned. Don't you have a master to save? Archer shrugged, but you won't let me pass, Ryder. So why not indulge you in your endeavor to decipher who I am and what I know? Then what of your duplication ability? She asked the overly relaxed Archer. You're quite slow on the uptake, I see. How rude. Ryder monotonously commented. Twas but a simple question. She crossed her arms, so then what, am I talking to the original? She received a curt bow from the eccentric Archer. She raised an eyebrow underneath her mask, but she knew Archer had some form of knowing what she expressed. It would be quite rude to blow off a beauty like you. Archer replied still retaining his bow. After all getting angry or stressed gives you wrinkles. Ryder sighed. So this heroic spirit is an incorrigible flirt. Besides, he needs to get off his training wheels. You want him to die? Heavens no, Archer answered in shock. I want him to learn how to master his new skill. I've been taught that pain, and the threat of death works wonders on the drive and muscle response of a person's body when in preservation mode. He showed off Kanshu and Bakuya, and continued. The act of creating weapons out of prana, his only, most noteworthy skill as of yet, I'll force him to master it. I was planning to get there and wait things out until he can't handle Castor any longer. You're quite the anomaly, Archer. A servant that wants to see his master suffer, you are one strange servant. Archer looked to his right, and leaned on a ledge. His eyes looked ever distant as if his eyes were staring into the past. In a low voice, he said, Ha, huh, it's been a long time since I've been called that. Anomaly. He repeated the words in a trance like state. The words seemed to trigger a memory, and Ryder looked dumbfounded at Archer's blatant change of subject. I've no time for this, Archer. Answer my question, Ryder demanded, how do you know who I am? I am a heroic spirit of the future, summoned by Shuru Emiya, my servant Archer in my lifetime. Archer spoke cheerily. I am a heroic spirit charged with one goal that I won't disclose to you. All you need to know is that my knowledge stems from my current master. Okay. Archer's reminiscing face turned back into his usual grin. A man of my caliber has to have secrets that I can't share without my trust. You continually serenade me, and you say that I'm not trustworthy? What a heartbreaker you are. A strange feeling tugged at Archer's whole body. He adjusted his gaze to the mountain, and felt the tugging sensation grow stronger. The tugging feeling almost resembled a reverse summoning. Hmm. Now what? What is it? It seems our dinner will have to wait, Medusa. Archer said. My master is calling me. It seems he's finally had enough. Naruto. Archer said without facing her, names Naruto Namikaze, or Uzumaki. Pick whichever you prefer. Ryder stepped back, her enemy just revealed his identity on a whim. What, you're thinking I'm foolish and mad again, right? He puffed a bit of air as if he was laughing never mind. Still, am I not of right mind to compliment a woman with beauty like yours? Even if those eyes of yours are hidden by that mask, I will not hesitate to say you're stunning. Ryder kept silent. Your body gives off this appearance of a goddess underneath the moon's gentle rays. And like any treasure hunter, I desire to look at those mysterious eyes even if only for a moment because it is those hidden away that are the greatest of treasures. Ryder furrowed her eyebrows. Foolish ruffian, you know what my ease are capable of. Do you not know the consequences? She rhetorically asked. Are you that confident that you would be able to resist the curse my eyes have? Archer nodded. And you would reveal your identity? You imbecile? Ryder's stoic persona breaks, and replacing it was anger. 
Your identity holds more value than that of your secretive goal that I do not wish to discover or indulge in. I do know the consequences quite well, Ryder. And like any treasure, the greater the danger, the better the treasure at the end. Archer confidently answered. Also, it would be rude to know a woman's name, and her not know mine. Archer argued. He then continued to speak more about identities, ah, right. Knowledge holds power in the war, but riddle me this, Ryder. What strategy can you devise, if I'm not even born? He promptly disappeared, answering his master's call, and left the angered and confused Ryder alone on the roof. He withheld insignificant information from her, and instead revealed his identity instead. She turned to Mount Enzo while clenching her fists, she became determined to break the puzzle that is Archer. To Archer, his motives were confusing, even for him, but he at least knew for certain. The next time they meet, one of them may die, and it left a somber feeling in his heart as he neared his destination. Shuru stirred awake, and felt himself standing rather than lying on his bed. Moreover, he noticed the place he woke up in was far from his actual house. He knew he himself was at the gates of Ryudo Temple. Question is, how did he get here? Good evening, Archer's master. A feminine voice spoke from deep within the temple's courtyard. She appeared in black mist, a woman in a dark violet hooded garb. Her hood covered most of her face, but it didn't hide her indigo locks from Shuru's sight. She the end. Now we will see you in the next video.